Talmud, Mas Nedari may see HAPTERI mission. All the substitutes for the formulas of vows have the validity of vows. Those for Haramim are like Haramim, those for Odes are like Odes, and those for Nezerot are like Nezerot. If one says to his neighbor, I am depart from you by a vow, or I am separated from you, or I am removed from you in respect of that I might eat of yours, or that I might taste of yours, he is prohibited. If he says, I am banned to you, then our Akiba was inclined to. Give a stringent ruling Talmud, Mas Nedarim Bigamara. All the substitutes for the formulas of vows have the validity of vows. Why other clauses not stated in the mission of Nazir, whilst our mission of Nedarim includes them all because oaths and vows are written side by side in the Bible, they are both stated, and since the two are mentioned, the others are stated also. Then let oaths be taught immediately after vows because he states vows in which the article is forbidden to the person he follows it up with Haram, where likewise the article is forbidden to the person oaths, however, are excluded from the category of vows since oaths bind the person to abstain from a thing, hence they cannot immediately follow vows. The mission commences with substitutes, all the substitutes for the formulas of vows, etc., yet proceeds to explain the laws of abbreviations of vows. If one says to his neighbor, I am depart from you by a vow with his vow, moreover, the Tana has altogether. Omitted to state that abbreviations are binding the Tana does speak of them but our text is defective and this is what was really meant all substitutes and abbreviations of vows have the validity of vows then let substitutes be first explained the clause to which the Tana has last referred is generally first explained as we have learned wherewith may the Sabbath lights be kindled and wherewith may they not be kindled they may not be kindled etc wherein may food be put away to be kept hot for the Sabbath and wherein may it not be put away it may not be put away etc wherewith may a woman go out from her house on the Sabbath and wherewith may she not go out she may not go out from etc is it then a universal rule that the first clause is never explained first but we have learned some relations inherit from and transmit their estate to others some inherit but do not transmit now these relations inherit from and transmit to each other etc some women are permitted to their husbands but forbidden to their husbands brothers others are the reverse now these are permitted to their husbands but forbidden to their husbands brothers etc some meal offerings require oil and frankincense others require oil but no frankincense now these require both oil and frankincense etc some meal offerings must be taken by the priest to the southwest corner of the altar but do not need waving others are the reverse now these must be taken to the altar etc some are treated as firstborns in respect of inheritance but not in respect of the priest others are treated as firstborns in respect of the priest but not in respect of inheritance now who is regarded as a firstborn in respect of inheritance but not in respect of the priest etc in these examples the first clause is explained first because it contains numerous instances to which its law applies but wherewith may a beast go out on the sabbath and wherewith may it not go out where the first clause does not Contain numerous instances, yet it is explained first. Viz a camel may go out, etc. Talmud, Mas Nedarim, hence there is no fixed rule. Sometimes the first clause is explained first, and others the last clause is first explained. Alternatively, abbreviations are explained first because they see their validity are deduced by exegesis. Then let these be stated first. He the Tana commences indeed with substitutes, since these are scriptural and proceeds to explain abbreviations which are inferred by interpretation only. This harmonizes with the view that substitutes are merely the foreign equivalents of the word Corban, but what can be said on the view that they are forms expressly invented by the sages for the purpose of making vows. Now are abbreviations mentioned at all? Were you not compelled to assume a defective text? Then indeed place abbreviations first. Thus all abbreviations of vows have the validity of vows, and all substitutes for vows have the validity of vows. These are the Abbreviations if one says to his neighbor and these are the substitutes konam konis konam now where are abbreviations written when either a man or a woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow under of a nazirite nazir eliezer and it has been taught nazir eliezer is to render substitutes and abbreviations of nezerot as nezerot from this I may infer only the law of nezerot whence do we know that it applies to other vows too this is taught by the verse when either a man or a woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a nazirite to the lord here ordinary vows are compared to nezerot and vice versa just as in nezerot abbreviations are equally binding so in the case of other vows and just as in other vows he who does not fulfill them violates the injunctions he shall not break his word and thou shalt not delay to pay it so in nezerot and just as in other vows the father can annul those of his daughter and the husband those of his wife so with nezerot wherein does Nezerot differ because it is written Nazir Lehazir, but in the case of vows too it is written Linder Neder, then what need is there of analogy if the text were Nederlinder just as Nazir Lehazir it would be as you say and the analogy would be unnecessary since however Linder Neder is written the Torah spoke in the language of men this agrees with the view that the Torah spoke in the language of men but he who maintains that the Torah did not speak in the language of men to what purpose does he put this Linder Neder he interprets it to deduce that abbreviations of vows are as vows and then Nezerot is compared to vows and as to Nazir Lehazir he interprets it as teaching Talmud, Mas Nedarim be that one Nazirite vow falls upon another then he who maintains that the Torah spoke in the language of men and interprets Nazir Lehazir as teaching the validity of abbreviations of Nezerot once does he learn that a Nazirite vow can fall upon another if he agrees with it View that a Nazi right vow does not fall upon another it is well, but if he agrees with the view that it does, whence does he know it? Let scripture say Lees or the KAL form Y Eliezer, the cause of it that you may infer both from it in the West. It was said one Tana deduces the validity of abbreviations from Linder Neder, whilst another deduces it from the phrase he shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. The master said, and just as in other vows, he who does not fulfill them violates the injunctions, he shall not break his what, and thou shalt not delay to pay it. So in Nezerot now, as for he shall not break his word as applying to ordinary vows, it is well, it is possible, e.g., if one says I vow to eat this loaf and does not eat it, he violates the injunction, he shall not break his word, but how is he shall not break his word possible in the case of Nezerot? For as soon as one says, Behold, I am a Nazir, he is one, if he eats grapes, he is liable for nor eat moist. Drapes or dried if he drinks wine he violates he shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes Rob answered it is to transgress two injunctions how is thou shalt not delay to pay it referring to Nezero conceivable for as soon as one says behold I am a Nazir he is one if he eats grapes he transgresses neither shall he eat moist grapes or dried when one says what I wish I will be a Nazir but if he says what I wish it injunction thou shalt not delay does not apply said Rob e.g. if he says I must not depart this world before having been a Nazir for he becomes a Nazir from that moment for this is similar to one who says to his wife here is your divorce to take effect one hour before my death where she is immediately forbidden to eat terima thus we see that we fear that he may die at any moment so here too he becomes a Nazir immediately for we say perchance he will die now Talmud, Mas Nedari may Arahabi. Jacob said, e.g., if one takes a Nazi right vow whilst in a cemetery, this agrees with the view that the Nazi rightship is not immediately binding, but on the view that it is immediately valid, is then he shall not delay applicable. Moreover, Marsan of Arashi said the vow is immediately valid, and they differ only on the question of flagellation. Nevertheless, he violates thou shalt not delay because the ritually clean Nazi rightship is delayed. Arashi said, since this is so, it follows that if a Nazir intentionally defile himself, he transgresses thou shalt not delay in respect to the recommencement of the clean Nazi rightship. Araha, the son of Arake, said he might transgress that shalt not delay in respect to shaving. Now, this goes without saying, according to the view that shaving is indispensable, but even on the view that the shaving is not a bar to the sacrifices, nevertheless, he does not observe the precept of shaving Marsa, the son of Armari said he might violate thou shalt not delay. In respect to his sacrifices is this deduced from here surely it is rather inferred from elsewhere when thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thou shalt not slack to pay it for the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee this refers to sin offerings and trespass offerings I might say that the Torah set up an anomaly in the case of Nazir what is the anomaly shall we say the fact that a vow to bring the sin offering of a Nazir is invalid but a sin offering for hell up c
but what need is there of analogy let us infer it from vows by general similarity perhaps he can only in the case of other vows because their duration is unlimited but with respect to Nezirot the duration of which is limited for an unspecified vow of Nezirot is for 30 days I might say that it is not so hence we are informed otherwise if one says to his neighbor I am depart from you by a vow etc Samuel said in all these instances he must say in respect of that I might eat of yours or that I might taste of yours an objection is raised if one says to his neighbor I am depart from you by a vow or I am separated from you or I am removed from you he is forbidden to derive any benefit from him if he says that which I might eat or taste of yours shall be to me prohibited he is forbidden this is what is taught when is this if he adds in respect of that I might eat or taste of yours but the reverse was taught if one says to his neighbor that which I might eat or taste of yours shall be prohibited to me. He is forbidden. I am depart from you by a vow, or I am separated from you, or I am removed from you. He is likewise forbidden. Read thus, providing that he had first said, I am depart from you, etc. If so, it is identical with the first barrier. Moreover, why teach further? He is forbidden twice, but this is what Samuel really said, because he said in respect of that I might eat of yours, or that I might taste of yours. The maker of the vow alone is forbidden, while his neighbor is permitted. Talmud, Mas Nederim. But if he merely says, I am depart from you by a vow, both are forbidden. Just as our Jose, son of Arhanan, said, if one says to his neighbor, I am depart from you by a vow, both are forbidden. We learned if one says to his neighbor, Behold, I am her to you. The matter is forbidden, but the matter is not forbidden. E.g., if he explicitly states, but you are not her to me, but does it not continue? You are. Her to me the matter is forbidden implying but not the mother e.g. if he explicitly states but you are not her to me but what if it is not explicit both are forbidden but since the final clause teaches I am her to you and you are her to me both are forbidden it is only in that case that both are forbidden but in general he is forbidden while his neighbor is permitted but this is how our Jose son of our Hanimus dictum was stated if one says to his neighbor I am under a vow in respect of you both are forbidden I am depart from you by a vow he is forbidden but his neighbor is permitted but our Mishnah teaches from you yet our Mishnah was explained according to Samuel that in all cases he must say in respect of that I might eat of yours or that I might taste of yours only then is he alone forbidden while his neighbor is permitted but in the case of I am depart from you by a vow both are forbidden but this is what was originally stated in Samuel's name is only because he said in respect of that I might eat of yours or that I might taste of yours that he is forbidden only in respect of eating but if he only said I am depart from you by a vow he is forbidden even benefit if so let Samuel state thus but if he did not say in respect of that I might eat of yours or that I might taste of yours even benefit is forbidden to him but this is what was stated only if he says in respect of that I might eat of yours or that I might taste of yours is he forbidden but if he merely says I am depart from you by a vow it does not imply a prohibition at all what is the reason I am depart from you implies I am not to speak to you I am separated from you implies I all to do no business with you I am removed from you implies I am not to stand within four cubits of you Talmud Mas Nedarim B shall we say Samuel holds the opinion that an explicit abbreviations are not abbreviations yes Samuel makes the mission agree with our Judah who maintained an explicit abbreviations are not abbreviations for we learned the essential part of a get is behold thou art free unto all men our Judah said to this must be added and this document shall be unto thee from me a deed of dismissal and a document of release now what forced Samuel to thus interpret the mission so as to make it agree with our Judah let him make it agree with the rabbis that even an explicit abbreviations are binding said Rabbi the mission presents a difficulty to him why state in respect of that I might eat of yours or that I might taste of yours let him teach in respect of that I might eat or that I might taste and no more this proves that we require explicit abbreviations it was stated in explicit abbreviations have they maintained they are valid abbreviations while Rabbi said they are not valid abbreviations Rabbi said already explained the matter to me scripture says when either a man or a woman shall explicitly log out not the right to separate themselves unto the Lord abbreviations of Nezerot are compared to Nezerot just as Nezerot must be explicit in meaning so must their abbreviations be too are we to say that they differ in the dispute of our Judah and the rabbis for we learned the essential part of a get is the words behold thou art free unto all men our Judah said to this must be added and this document shall be unto thee from the deed of dismissal and a document of discharge and a letter of release thus. Abbe rules as the rabbis and rabbis are Judah no Abbe may assert my opinion agrees even with our Judah's only in divorce does our Judah insist that abbreviations shall be explicit because cutting off is necessary and this is lacking but do you know him to require it elsewhere too whilst Rabbi can maintain my view agrees even with that of the rabbis only in the case of divorce do they say that explicit abbreviations are not essential Talmud, Mas Nederim, because no man divorces his neighbors. What but do you know then to rule thus elsewhere an objection is raised if one says that is to me or this is to me he is forbidden because it is an abbreviation of that is as a korban to me thus the reason is that he said unto me but if he did not say unto me it is not so this refutes Abbe Abbe replies thus it is only because he said to me that he is forbidden but if he merely said behold that is without adding to me he might have meant behold that is hefker or that is for charity but is it not stated because it is an abbreviation of a korban but answer thus because he said to me he alone is forbidden but his neighbor is permitted but if he said behold that is both are forbidden because he may have meant behold that is hippish an objection is raised if one says behold this animal is a sin offering this is a trespass offering though he is liable to a sin offering or a trespass offering his words are of no effect but if he says behold this animal is my Sin offering or my trespass offering his declaration is effectual if he was liable now this is a refutation of Abbe Abbe answers this agrees with Arjuna but Abbe said my ruling agrees even with Arjuna Abbe retracted are we to say then that Rabbi's ruling agrees only with Arjuna no Rabbi may maintain my view agrees even with that of the Rabbis only in the case of divorce do they say that explicit abbreviations are not essential because no man divorces his neighbor's wife but elsewhere explicit abbreviations are required Talmud, Mas Nedarim B our Papa inquired are abbreviations valid in the case of Kiddushin or not now how does this problem arise shall we say thus if one said to a woman behold thou art betrothed unto me and said to her companion and thou too it is obvious that this is actual Kiddushin but e.g. if one said to a woman behold thou art betrothed unto me and then to her companion and thou do we assume that he meant and thou too and so the second is betrothed or perhaps he said to her companion and do thou witness it and so she is not betrothed but is our papa really in doubt but since he said to Abbe does Samuel hold that an explicit abbreviations are valid it follows that he or papa holds that abbreviations are valid in the case of Kiddushin our papa's question to Abbe was based on Samuel's opinion our papa inquired are abbreviations binding in respect of P.E.I. or not what are the circumstances shall we say that one said let this for Obi P.E.I. and this one too that is a complete declaration of P.E.I.'s problem arises e.g. if he merely said and this without adding to hence it follows that if one says let the entire field be P.E.I. it is so yes and it was taught likewise whence do we know that if one wishes to render his whole field P.E.I. he can do so from the verse and when you reap the harvest of thy land thou shalt not wholly reap the corner of the field do we say since it is is compared to sacrifices just as Abbreviations are binding in the case of sacrifices so in the case of P.E.I. 2 or perhaps the analogy holds good only in respect of the injunction and shalt not delay now where is the analogy found for it was taught Talmud, Mas Nederime when thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God thou shalt not delay to pay it far the Lord will surely require it of thee this refers to gleanings forgotten sheep and P.E.I. are abbreviations binding in the case of charity or not how does this arise? Shall we say that one said this Zeus is for charity and this one too that is a complete declaration of charity but e.g. if one said and this omitting to what then did he mean and this too is for charity or and this is for my personal expenditure his statement being incomplete do we say since this is likened to sacrifices as it is written that which is gone out of thy lips thou shalt keep and perform even a free will offering according as thou hast vowed unto the Lord thy God which thou hast. Promised with thy mouth which refers to charity hence just as abbreviations are valid for sacrifices
Am isolated net not from you all agree that he is forbidden I am accursed meshmet from you all agree that he is permitted wherein do they differ Talmud, mas nettering be in the case of I am banned to you are akibo maintaining that it is the equivalent of isolated net not whilst the rabbis hold that it means accursed meshmet and now this conflicts with Arhista's view for a certain man who declared I am accursed in respect of the property of the son of our Jeremiah B. Abba went before Arhista. Said he to him none pay regard to this ruling of our Akiba thus he holds that they differ in respect to I am accursed meshmet and said in the name of Rabbi if a rabbi places a person under a ban in his presence the ban can be revoked only in his presence if in his absence it can be revoked both in his presence and in his absence Arhanin said in Rab's name one who hears his neighbor utter God's name in vain must place him under a ban otherwise he himself must be under a ban because the unnecessary utterance of the divine name always leads to poverty and poverty leads to death as it is written and the Lord said unto Moses in Midian go return unto Egypt for all the men are dead which sought thy life and it was taught wherever the sages cast their eyes in disapproval death or poverty has resulted our Abba said I was standing in the presence of Arhuna when he heard a woman utter God's name in vain thereupon he banned her but immediately lifted the ban in her presence this Proves three things i.e. who hears his neighbor utter the divine name unnecessarily must excommunicate him too if a rabbi bans a person in his presence the ban must be lifted in his presence too three no time need elapse between the imposition and the lifting of a ban argidal said in rab's name a scholar may utter a ban against himself and lifted himself but is this not obvious i would think that a prisoner cannot free himself from prison hence we are taught otherwise now how can such a thing occur as in the case of marzitra the pious when a disciple incurred a ban marzitra first excommunicated himself and then the disciple on arriving home he lifted the ban from himself and then from the disciple argidal also said in rab's name talmud mas netarim once do we know that an oath may be taken to fulfill a precept from the verse i have sworn and i will perform it that i will keep thy righteous judgments but is he not under a perpetual oath from mount sinai but what are Gittel teaches us is that one may stimulate himself or Gittel also said in Rab's name he who says I will rise early to study this chapter or this tractate has vowed a great vow to the God of Israel but he is under a perpetual oath from Mount Sinai and an oath cannot fall upon another then again if he informs us that a person may thus stimulate himself it is identical with Argidal's first statement this is what Argidal teaches the oath is binding since one can free i.e. acquit himself by the reading of the Shema morning or evening Argidal said in Rab's name if one says to his neighbor let us rise early and study this chapter it is his the former's duty to rise early as it is written and he said unto me arise go forth into the plain and there I will talk with thee then I rose and went forth into the plain and behold the glory of the Lord stood there are Joseph said if one was placed under a ban in a dream ten persons are necessary for lifting the ban they must have studied Halachah, but if they had only learned Mishnah, they cannot lift the ban. But if such as have studied Halachah are unavailable, then even those who have only learned Mishnah but had not studied Halachah will do. But if even such are unavailable, let him go and sit at the crossroads and extend greetings to ten men until he finds ten men who have studied Halachah. Rabban asked Arashi if he knew in his dream the person who placed him tinder a ban. Can this person lift the ban? He answered, He might have been appointed God's messenger to ban him, but not to revoke it. Arahah asked Arashi what if one was both banned and readmitted in his dream? Said he to him, Just as grain is impossible without straw Talmud, Mas Netarim be so is there no dream without meaningless matter. Rabban his wife was under a vow. He then came before Arashi asking, Can the husband become an agent for his wife's regret? He replied, If they the three scholars are already assembled, he can do so, but not otherwise three things. May be inferred from this incident I a husband can become an agent for his wife's regret too it is not seemly for a scholar to revoke a vow in his teacher's town three if they the necessary scholars are already assembled it is well but a scholar may lift a ban even in the vicinity of his master and even a single ordained scholar may lift a ban our Simeon Bezibit said in the name of our Isaac Betabal in the name of our Hierk of the school of our Aha in the name of our Zerah in the name of our Eliezer in the name of our Hananiah in the name of our Miash on the authority of our Judah B.I.L.A.I. what is the meaning of but unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in its wings this refers to those people who fear to utter the divine name in vain the sin of righteousness with healing in its wings said Abay this proves that the most dancing in the sun's rays have healing power now he differs from our Simeon B. Lakish who said there is no getting him in the world too. Come, but the Holy One, blessed be He, will draw forth the sun from its sheath. The righteous shall be healed, and the wicked shall be judged and punished thereby, as it is written. But unto you that fear My name shall the sun of righteousness arise with healing in its wings. Moreover, they shall be rejuvenated by it, as it is written, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. But the wicked shall be punished thereby, as it is written. Behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up. Saith the Lord of hosts that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Talmud, Mas Netarim Mishnah. If one says as the vows of the wicked, he has vowed in respect of Nezirot a sacrifice and an oath. If he says as the vows of the righteous, his words are of no effect. But if he said as their free will offerings, he has vowed in respect of a Nazi right vow and a sacrifice tomorrow. But perhaps he. Meant thus I do not vow as the vows of the wicked Samuel answered the mission refers to one who said as the vows of the wicked behold I am or I take upon myself or I am debarred from it which means behold I am a Nazir or I take upon myself the obligation to offer a sacrifice or I am debarred by an oath to derive any benefit therefrom behold I am a Nazir but perhaps he meant behold lamb to fast said Samuel that is if a Nazir was passing in front of him I am debarred by an oath to derive any benefit therefrom but perhaps he meant it from or of it means that I am to eat of it said Rabbi it means that he said I am debarred from it not to eat it if so why stated I would argue but he has not explicitly taken an oath hence we are informed otherwise if he says as the vows of the righteous etc which Tana recognizes a distinction between a vow and a free will offering shall we say neither Armeir nor Arjuda for it was taught better it is that thou shoots not Vow then that thou shouldst vow and not pay better than both is not to vow at all. Thus said Armadir Arjuda said better than both is to vow and repay. You may even say that it is Armadir Talmud. Mas Netarim B. Armadir spoke only of a vow but not of a free will offering. But the Mishnah states as their free will offerings he has vowed in respect of Nazir and a sacrifice. Learn he has made a free will offering in respect of Nazir and a sacrifice. Now wherein does a vow differ that he is not approved? Because he may thereby come to a stumbling block. But a free will offering too can become a stumbling block. He does as Hillel the Elder for it was taught it was said of Hillel the Elder that no man ever trespassed through his burnt offering. He would bring it as Hall into the temple court and sanctify it and put his hand upon it and slaughter it. That is well in respect of a free will offering of sacrifices. But what can be said of a free will offering of Nezirot, it is as Simeon the just for it. Was taught Simeon the just said only once in my life have I eaten of the trespass offering brought by a defiled tear on one occasion a Nazir came from the south country and I saw that he had beautiful eyes was of handsome appearance and with thick locks of hair symmetrically arranged said I to him my son what reason didst thou see to destroy this beautiful hair of thine he replied I was a shepherd for my father in my town once I went to draw water from a well gazed upon my reflection in the water whereupon my evil desires rushed upon me and sought to drive me from the world through sin but I said unto it my lust wretch why dost thou vaunt thyself in a world that is not thine with one who is destined to become worms and dust I swear that I will shave thee off his beautiful hair for the sake of heaven El immediately arose and kissed his head saying my son may there be many Nazi rites such as thou in Israel of thee saith the holy writ when either a man or a woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazi right to separate themselves unto the Lord Armani demurred wherein does the trespass offering of an unclean Nazi right differ that he did not eat thereof because it comes on account of sin and he should not have partaken of all trespass offerings since they come on account of sin said Arjuna to him this is the reason when they regret their evil deeds they become
brought it, but they did not take Nezarot upon themselves so as not to be designated sinners as it is written, and the priest shall make atonement for him for that he sinned against his soul. Abbe said Simeon the just are Simeon and our Eliezer Hakapar are all of the same opinion, is that a Nazir is a sinner. Simeon the just and our Simeon, as we have stated, our Eliezer Hakapar as it was taught, and he shall make atonement for him for that he sinned against his soul against which soul then has he sinned, but it is because he afflicted himself through abstention from wine. Now does not this afford an argument from the minor to the major if one who afflicted himself only in respect of wine is called a sinner, how much more so one who ascetically refrains from everything, hence one who fasts is called a sinner, but this verse refers to an unclean Nazir that is because he doubly sinned Mishnah, one who says Konam Konat or Konas, these are the substitutes for Korban Herak Herak or Herapis. Are substitutes for her and not Yapatia, these are substitutes for Nezarot Chabat the Shekhub, or one who bows by Moe, these are substitutes for Shabyagamar, it was stated substitutes are Yohan and said they are foreign equivalents of the Hebrew are Simeon Belakish said they are forms devised by the sages for the purpose of making vows, and thus it is written in the month which he had devised of his own heart, and why did the rabbis institute substitutes that one should not say Korban then? Let him say Korban lest he say Korban Laodon is sacrifice to the Lord, and why not say Korban Laodon lest one say Laodon without Korban and thus utter the divine name in vain, and it was taught our Simeon said Talmud, Mas Nettering be whence do we know that one must not say unto the Lord a burnt offering, unto the Lord a meal offering, unto the Lord a thanks offering, or unto the Lord a peace offering, because it is written if any man of you bring an offering to the Lord and from the minor. We may deduce the major if concerning one who intended uttering the divine name only in connection with the sacrifice the Torah taught an offering to the Lord how much more care must one take against its deliberate utterance in vain shall we say that this conflict is dependent on Tanaim for it was taught Beth Shammai maintained substitutes of substitutes are binding whilst Beth Hillel say they are not surely the ruling that secondary substitutes are valid is based on the view that substitutes are foreign equivalents whilst he who says that they are invalid holds that they are forms devised by the sages no all agree that substitutes are foreign words but Beth Shammai hold that Gentiles speak in these terms too whilst Beth Hillel hold that they do not speak in these terms alternatively Beth Shammai hold secondary substitutes are declared valid as a precautionary measure on account of substitutes themselves but Beth Hillel maintain we do not enact a precautionary measure for Secondary substitutes on account of the substitutes themselves what forms do double modifications of vows take our Joseph recited Mikan Amana Mikan Ahana Mikan Zaino what are the secondary substitutes of Urim Afashat Hot Harikim Harikim Varathim secondary substitutes of Nezarot our Joseph learned Mehazakin Amenazahin Amethod the scholars inquired what of Mipahazan Amethazan Amethazan Rubin asked Arashi what of Kinnaman does it mean Konam or perhaps Kinnaman be some sweet cinnamon Arahavi Son of Arhai asked Arashi what of Kinnaman does it mean Afal Stai or Konam these remain questions what are secondary substitutes of both Shabul Shabathil Shekakil but Shabul may simply mean Shabul the son of Gershon but say the Shabul Bail Shabathil Shekakil Samuel said if one says Ashbitha he says nothing Ashkaka he says nothing Karen Shah he says nothing or one who vows by Moe these are substitutes for Shabia it was taught our Simeon Begamaliel said one who says by Moe Moses Says nothing by Mantha which Moe said these are substitutes for an oath Mishnah if one says to his neighbor that which I might eat of yours be not holland be not kasher be not pure be clean or unclean be not hard or pickle he is forbidden as the lamb as the temple sheds of cattle or wood as the wood on the altar as the fire on the altar as the altar as the temple as Jerusalem or if one vowed by reference to the altar utensils though he did not mention Corban it is as though he had vowed. By Corban our Judah said he who says Jerusalem has said nothing Talmud, Mas Nettering Gemara the scholars presumed what does La mean let it not be as Holland implying but as a sacrifice who is the authority of our Mishnah of our Meir but he does not hold that the positive may be inferred from the negative for we learned our Meir said every stipulation which is not like the stipulation of the children of Gad and Reuben is invalid hence it must be our Judah then consider the conclusion our Judah. Said he who says Jerusalem has said nothing now since the conclusion is our Judah the former clause is not our Judah the whole mission gives our Judah's ruling but this is what is stated for our Judah said he who says Jerusalem has said nothing but if one says as Jerusalem is he forbidden according to our Judah but it was taught our Judah said he who says as Jerusalem has said nothing unless he vows by what is sacrificed in Jerusalem it is all our Judah and two tanaim conflict as to his views Talmud, Mas. Nettering be it was taught if one says that which I might eat of yours or that which I might not eat of yours be Holland or be the Holland or be as Holland he is permitted if he says that which I might eat of yours be not Holland he is forbidden that which I might not eat of yours be not Holland he is permitted now with whom does the first clause agree with our Meir, who does not hold that the positive may be inferred from the negative and consider the latter clause that which I might not eat of. Yours be not Holland, he is permitted, but we learned if one says that which I might not eat of yours be not for Corban, our Meir forbids him. Now we raise the difficulty, but he does not rule that the positive may be inferred from the negative, and our Abba replied, It is as though he said, Let it I eat your food before the Corban, therefore I will not eat of yours. Then here too, perhaps he meant, Let it not be Holland, therefore I may not eat of yours. This Tana agrees with our Meir on one point, but disagrees with him on another. He agrees with him on one point that the positive may not be inferred from the negative, but disagrees with him on another. It is on the interpretation of La Corban, Arashi said, In the one case he said, Eli Holland, in the other he said, La Holland, which might mean, Let it not be Holland, but as a Corban be clean or unclean as not as pickle, he is forbidden. Rami Biham asked, What if one said this be unto me as the flesh of a peace offering after the sprinkling of the blood? But if he vowed thus he related his vow to what is permissible, but the question arises thus, e.g., if there lay flesh of a peace offering before him and permitted food lay beside it, and he said this be like this, what then did he relate it to its original state or to its present permitted condition? Rabbi answered, Come and here we learned if one says as Nathar or as pickle, he is forbidden Talmud, Mas Nedarim and now Nathar and pickle are possible only after the sprinkling of the blood. Arhuna, the son of our Nathan, said to him, This refers to Nathar of the burnt offering, said he to him, If so, let him the Tana teach as the flesh of the burnt offering, he proceeds to a climax, thus it is unnecessary to teach that if one relates his vow to the flesh of the burnt offering, that he is forbidden, since he referred it to a sacrifice, but it is necessary for him to teach the case of Nathar and pickle of the burnt offering, for I would think that he referred it to the prohibitions of Nathar. And pickle so that it counts as a reference to what is inherently forbidden and he is not prohibited hence he informs us otherwise an objection is raised which is the bond mentioned in the Torah if one says behold I am not to eat meat or drink wine as on the day that my father or teacher died or as on the day when Gedaliah the son of Ahikam was slain or as on the day that I saw Jerusalem in ruins now Samuel commented thereon providing that he was under a vow in respect to that very day. What does this mean surely that e.g. he stood thus on a Sunday on which day his father had died and though there were many permitted Sundays it is taught that he is forbidden this proves that the original Sunday is referred to Samuel's dictum was thus stated Samuel said providing that he was under a vow uninterruptedly since that day Robin has said come and here if one says this be unto me as Aaron's dough or as his terimah he is permitted hence if he vowed as the terimah of the loaves of it. Thanksgiving offering he would be forbidden Talmud, Mas Nedarim be but the terima of the thanksgiving loaves is forbidden only after the sprinkling of the blood no one for thus if he vows as the terima of the shekel chamber he is forbidden but what if he said as the terima of the thanksgiving loaves he is permitted then let him the state the terima of the thanksgiving loaves then how much more so his terima he teaches us this the terima of the thanksgiving loaves is his. Terima alternatively the terima of the thanksgiving loaves may also mean before the sprinkling of the blood e.g. if it was separated during the kneading of the dough even as our Toby Bikis has said in Samuel's name if the thanksgiving loaves are baked as four
The sin offering and the guilt offering which one sanctifies by a vow but exclude the firstling which is holy from its mother's womb but he who forbids a firstling to one sanctifies by a vow for it was taught it was said on the authority of rabbi whence do we know that one is bidden to consecrate the firstling born in one's house from the verse all the firstling males that come of thy herd and thy flock thou shalt sanctify unto the Lord but he who permits it argues thus if he does not. Consecrated is it not holy as a lamb as the temple sheds etc. It was taught a lamb for a lamb as a lamb or sheds for sheds as sheds or wood for wood as wood or fire for fire as fire or the altar for the altar as the altar or the temple for the temple as the temple or Jerusalem for Jerusalem as Jerusalem in all these cases if he says what I might eat of yours he is forbidden what I might not eat of yours he is permitted now which tanda do we know draws no distinction between a lamb for a lamb and as a lamb are mayor then consider the second clause and in all these cases if he says that which I might not eat of yours be so he is permitted but we learned if one says to his neighbor that which I might not eat of yours be not for Corban our mayor forbids him now our Abba commented thereon it is as though he said let it I eat your food be for Corban therefore I may not eat of yours this is no difficulty in the one case he said lo Eliamra in the other he said Eliamra. Mishnah if one says to his neighbor that which I might eat of yours be Corban or a burnt offering or a meal offering or a sin offering or a thanksgiving offering or a peace offering he is forbidden our Judah permitted him if he says a Corban or as a Corban or Corban be that which I might eat of yours he is forbidden if he says that which I might not eat of yours be for a Corban our mayor forbids him Gemara now the Mishnah teaches if he says a Corban or as Corban or a Corban be that which I might eat of yours he is forbidden thus it is anonymously taught as our mayor who recognizes no distinction between a sheep and for a sheep but if so then as to what he the Tana teaches the Corban be that which I might eat of yours he is forbidden but it was taught the sages concede to our Judah that if one says O Corban or O burnt offering O meal offering O sin offering what I will eat this of thine he is permitted because he merely bowed by the life of it. Corban Talmud, Mas Nedarim B. This is no difficulty here. He said Hakorban there. He said Hakorban. What is the reason he meant? I swear by the life of the sacrifice he the Tana teaches that which I might not eat of yours be not for Corban. Our Meir forbids him, but our Meir does not rule that the positive may be inferred from the negative. Our Abba answered it is as though he said, Let it be for Corban. Therefore I will not eat of yours. Mishnah. If one says to his neighbor, Konam, be my mouth speaking. With you or my hands working for you or my feet walking with you, he is forbidden. Gemara, but a contradiction is shown. There is greater stringency in oaths than in vows, and greater stringency in vows than in oaths. There is greater stringency in vows for vows apply to obligatory as to optional matters, which is not so in the case of oaths, and there is greater stringency in oaths for oaths are valid with respect to things both abstract and concrete, but vows are not so said. Rab Judah, it means. That he says, let my mouth be forbidden in respect of my speech or my hands in respect of their work or my feet in respect of their walking. This may be inferred too, for he the Tana teaches my mouth speaking with you, not Konam. If I speak with you, C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-I Mishnah. Now these are permitted. He who says what I might eat of yours be hollen as the flesh of the swine, as the object of idolatry's worship, as perforated hides, as nibble, enter foot, as abominations, and reptiles, as errands. Do or his terimah. In all these cases he is permitted. If one says to his wife, Behold, thou art unto me as my mother, he must be given an opening on other grounds in order that he should not act frivolously in such matters. Gemara. Now the reason is because he said what I might eat of yours be hollen, but if he said what I might eat of yours be le it would imply let it not be hollen, but a Corban whose view is taught in our Mishnah, if our Mayors, but he does not hold Talmud, Mas Nedarimay. That the positive may be inferred from the negative, but if our Judas it is identical with the earlier mission because he the Tana teaches as the flesh of the swine as the object of idolatry's worship, he teaches Holland to Rubin and said, This is what he teaches now, these are permitted as if he said what I might eat of yours be Holland, as if one says as the flesh of the swine as the object of idolatry's worship, and if Holland were not stated, I would have thought that absolution is required. But could I possibly think so since the last clause teaches if one says to his wife, Behold, thou art unto me as my mother, he must be given an opening on other grounds. It follows that in the first cause absolution is unnecessary, but it is clear that Holland is mentioned incidentally once do we know it scripture states if a man bow, bow unto the Lord, this teaches that one must bow by what is itself forbidden through a vow, if so even if one bows by a divinely interdicted object two sins. It is written to bind his soul with the bond that is necessary for what was taught, which is the bond referred to in the Torah, etc. He who says to his wife, Behold, thou art unto me as my mother, etc. But a contradiction is shown if one says to his wife, Behold, thou art unto me as the flesh of my mother, as the flesh of my sister, as or as Kilim of the vineyard. His words are of no effect, said Abbe. His words are of no effect by biblical law, yet absolution is required by rabbinical law. Answered one refers to a scholar, the other refers to an Amharas, and it was taught even so if one vows by the Torah, his words are of no effect, yet Aryohan and commented he must retract his vow before a sage while Arnaman observed the scholar does not need absolution. Talmud, Mas Nedarim B. It was taught if one vows by the Torah, his words are of no effect by what is written therein, his vow is binding by it, and by what is written therein, his vow is binding, since he states by what is written. Therein his vow is binding is it necessary to mention by it and by what is written therein our nom and answered there is no difficulty one means that a Torah is lying on the ground the other that the vow holds a Torah in his hand if it is lying on the ground his thoughts are of the parchment if he holds it in his hand his thoughts are of the divine names therein alternatively both clauses mean that it is lying on the ground and we are informed this even when it is lying on the ground since he vows by what is written therein his vow is valid and an anticlimax is taught a further alternative the whole buried indeed means that he holds it in his hand and we are informed this since he holds it in his hand even if he merely says by it it is as though he said by what is written therein mission if one says Konam if I sleep if I speak or if I walk or if one says to his wife Konam if I cohabit with you he is liable to the injunction he shall not break his word Gemara it was Stated if one says Konam be my eye sleeping today if I sleep tomorrow Rab Judah said in Rab's name he must not sleep that day lest he sleep on the morrow but Arnam and said he may sleep on that day and we do not fear that he may sleep on the morrow yet Rab Judah agrees that if one says Konam be my eye sleeping tomorrow if I sleep today he may sleep that day Talmud, Mas Nedarim a person may be lax with respect to a condition but he is observant of an actual prohibition we learned if one says Konam if I sleep if I walk if I speak etc how is it meant if literally if I sleep is such a vow valid but it was taught there is greater stringency in oaths than in vows for oaths are valid with respect to things both abstract and concrete but vows are not so and sleep is an abstract thing but if he said Konam be my eye sleeping then if he states no time limit is he permitted to go on until he violates the injunction he shall not break his word but Aryohan and said if one says I Swear not to sleep for three days he is flagellated and may sleep immediately but if it means that he says Konam be my eye sleeping tomorrow if I sleep today surely you say that a person is observant in respect of an actual prohibition hence it is obvious that he says Konam be my eye sleeping today if I sleep tomorrow now if he did not sleep that first day how can the injunction he shall not break his word apply even if he slept on the second hence it surely means that he did sleep thus. Proving that he is permitted to do so this refutes Rab Judah when is this stated if he happened to sleep on the first day Rabbanah said after all it is as taught yet how can he shall not break his word apply by rabbinical law but can the biblical injunction apply by rabbinical law yes even as it was taught things which are permitted yet some treat them as forbidden you must not permit them in their presence because it is written he shall not break his word we learned if one says to his wife. Konam be that which you benefit from me until Passover if you go to your father's house until the festival if she went before Passover she may not benefit from him until Passover now only if she went before Passover is she forbidden but not otherwise our Abba answered if she went before Passover she is forbidden and is flagellated if she did not go she is merely forbidden and consider the second clause after Passover she is subject to he
Cohabit with you, he is liable to the injunction, he shall not break his word, but he is obligated to her by biblical law as it is written, her food, her rhyme, and her marriage rights, he shall not diminish it means that he vows the pleasure of cohabitation with you be forbidden me, thus he surely denies himself the enjoyment of cohabitation for Arkahana said if a woman says to her husband cohabitation with me be forbidden to you, she is compelled to grant it since she is under an obligation to him, but if she says the pleasure of cohabitation with you be forbidden me, he is forbidden to cohabit since one may not be fed with what is prohibited to him. Mission if he says I swear an oath not to sleep or talk or walk, he is forbidden to do so. If he says a corban be what I might not eat of yours, or a corban if I eat of yours, or what I might not eat of yours, be not a corban unto me, he is permitted to eat of his neighbor's Talmud, Mas Nedarim Gemara, whose view is taught in our mission are mayors for if our Judas he recognizes no distinction between a corban and o corban, then consider the latter clause. If he says what I might not eat of yours, be not a corban unto me, he is permitted, but we learned if one says that which I might not eat of yours, be not for a corban unto me, our mayor forbids him, and our have observed thereon it is as though he said, Let it I eat your food before a corban, therefore I may not eat of yours, there is no difficulty in the latter case. He Said Eli Corbin for a Corbin, but here in our mission he said La Corbin, which means let it not be a Corbin mission. If he says I take an oath that I will not eat of yours, or a oath that I eat of yours, or I take no oath that I will not eat of yours, he is forbidden Gamara. This proves that a oath that I eat of yours implies that I will not eat. Now this contradicts the following oaths are of two categories which are extended to four is I swear that I will eat that I will not eat. That I have eaten that I have not eaten. Now since he enumerates that I will eat that I will not eat, that I have eaten that I have not eaten, it follows that the phrase that I eat of yours implies I will eat. Abe answered that I eat has two meanings if one was being urged to eat and he replied I will eat, I will eat. Moreover, I take an oath that I eat it implies I will eat, but if he said I will not eat, I will not eat, and then added I take an oath that I eat it implies I will not eat Arashi. Answered that I eat in connection with an oath really means that he actually said I will not eat if so it is obvious why stated I might think it is a mispronunciation which caused him to stumble we are therefore taught otherwise Abe does not give Arashi's reason because it is not stated that I will not eat Arashi rejects Abe's interpretation he holds that I will not eat may also bear two meanings thus dash if one was being urged to eat and he said I will not eat I will not eat and then added I swear by an oath whether he concluded that I eat or that I do not eat it implies I will eat while the language an oath that I will not eat may also be explained as meaning I swear indeed that I will not eat but the Tana states a general rule Shiokal always means that I will eat and Shilookal that I will not eat Mishnah in these instances oaths are more rigorous than vows yet there is also greater stringency in vows than in oaths e.g. if one says Konam be the Sukha that I Make or the lalab that I take or the tefillin that I put on when expressed as vows they are binding but as oaths they are not because one cannot swear to transgress the precepts Talmud, Mas Nedarim be Gemara more rigorous that implies that they are valid vows but it is taught he is permitted this is taught in reference to the second clause of the other section because if one says I swear on oath not to sleep or talk or walk he is forbidden to do so in these instances oaths are more rigorous than vows yet there is greater stringency in vows than in oaths etc. Arkahana recited Argidal said in Rab's name and Artabiomi recited Argidal said in Samuel's name once do we know that one cannot swear a valid oath to violate the precepts front of verse when a man swear an oath he shall not break his word this implies he may not break his word but he must break a word i.e. an oath in respect of heavenly matters now why are vows different because it is written when a man Vow vow unto the Lord he shall not break his word, but of oaths to it is written, or swear an oath unto the Lord he shall not break his word. Abe answered in that case vows one says the pleasure of the sukkah be forbidden me, but in this case oaths one says I swear that I shall not benefit from the sukkah. Rabbah objected were the precepts then given for enjoyment, but Rabbah answered there in the case of vows one says the sitting in the sukkah be forbidden me, but here oaths one says I swear not to sit in the sukkah. Now do we learn that one cannot swear to transgress the precepts from this verse? Do we not rather deduce it from elsewhere? For it was taught if one swears to another precept and does not, I might think that he is liable. Talmud, Mas Nedarim, hence the Bible teaches, or if a soul swear pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good, etc., just as doing good refers to something optional, so doing evil refers only to something optional. This excludes one who swears. To annul a precept and did not annul it because it is not optional. One verse is to exempt him from a sacrifice due for violating an oath, and the other is to exempt him from punishment for having violated the injunction concerning an oath. Mission of vow within a vow is valid, but not an oath within an oath. E.g., if one declares, Behold, I will be a Nazir if I eat this loaf, I will be a Nazir if I eat this loaf, and then eats it, he is liable in respect of each vow. But if he says, I swear that I will not eat this loaf, I swear that I will not eat this loaf, and then eats it, he is liable to punishment for one oath. Only Gemara Arhuna said this holds good only if one says, Behold, I will be a Nazir today. If I eat this loaf, I will be a Nazir tomorrow. If I eat this loaf, since an extra day is added, the second Nazareth is binding in addition to the first. But if he says, Behold, I will be a Nazir today, I will be a Nazir today, the second Nazareth is not valid in addition to. The first but Samuel said even if one declares behold I will be a Nazir today I will be a Nazir today the second Nazareth is binding now according to our Hunatha Mishnah instead of teaching but not an oath within an oath should teach sometimes a vow within a vow is valid and sometimes not if one says behold I will be a Nazir today behold I will be a Nazir tomorrow the vow within the vow is binding but if he says behold I will be a Nazir today I will be a Nazir today Talmud, Mas. Nedarim be the second is not binding this is a difficulty we learned a vow within a vow is valid but not an oath within an oath how is this shall we say that one declared behold I will be a Nazir today behold I will be a Nazir tomorrow then an analogous oath is I swear not to eat fix I swear not to eat grapes why should the second oath be invalid but the invalidity of all oath within an oath arises thus I swear not to eat fix I swear not to eat fix then an analogous vow in respect of Nazareth is behold I will be a Nazir today behold I will be a Nazir today and it is stated about within a vow is valid this refutes Arhuna Arhuna answers you the mission applies to one who said behold I will be a Nazir today behold I will be a Nazir tomorrow and an analogous oath is I swear not to eat fix I swear not to eat fix and grapes the second oath being invalid but did not rabbi say if one says I swear not to eat fix and then adds I swear not to eat fix and grapes if he eats fix sets aside an animal for a sacrifice and then eats grapes the grapes constitute only half the extent of his second oath and a sacrifice is not brought for the violation of such front this we see that if one declares I swear not to eat fix and then adds I swear not to eat fix and grapes since the second oath is valid in respect of grapes it is valid in respect of fix two Arhuna does not agree with rabbi an objection is raised if one made two vows of Nazareth observed it. First set aside a sacrifice and then had himself absolved thereof. See the first vow, the second is accounted to him in the observance of the first. How is this? Shall we say that he declared, Behold, I will be a Nazir today, behold, I will be a Nazir tomorrow. Why does the second replace the first? Surely there is an additional day, but it is obvious that he said, Behold, I will be a Nazir today, behold, I will be a Nazir today. Talmud, Mas Nedarim, this contradicts our no, after all it means that. He said, Behold, I will be a Nazir today, behold, I will be a Nazir tomorrow. And how is it accounted to him with the exception of that additional day? Alternatively, it means, e.g., that one undertook two periods of Nazareth simultaneously. Our Hamna objected to vow of vow of a Nazirite declaring themselves a Nazirite into the Lord teaches. Hence we learn that Nazareth falls upon Nazareth, for I would think, does it the reverse not follow a fortiori if an oath which is more stringent is not. Binding upon another oath, how much more so Nazareth, which is less rigorous, therefore it is stated a Nazirite declaring himself a Nazirite to the Lord, from which we learned that Nazareth falls upon Nazareth. Now, how is this? Shall we say that one said, Behold, I will be a Nazir today,
E.g. if one vows behold this be to me as salted meat or as wine of libation now if he vowed by allusion to a peace offering he is forbidden if by an idolatrous sacrifice he is permitted but if it was unspecified he is forbidden if one declares behold this be to me as her if as a her to the Lord he is forbidden if as a her to the priest he is permitted if it is unspecified he is forbidden behold this be to me as tithe if he vowed as cattle tithes he is forbidden if as corn tithes he is permitted if unspecified he is forbidden behold this be to me as terimah if he vowed as the terimah of the temple chamber he is forbidden if as the terimah of the threshing floor i.e. of corn he is permitted if unspecified he is forbidden this is the view of our mayor Arjuna said an unspecified reference to terimah in Judea is binding but not in Galilee because the Galileans are unfamiliar with the terimah of the temple chamber unqualified allusions to Aramah in Judea are not binding but in Galilee there because the Galileans are unfamiliar with priestly Aramah Gemara but we learned a doubt in Nazareth is treated leniently our Zara answered there is no difficulty this our mission agrees with the rabbis the other with our Eliezer for it was taught if one consecrates all his beasts and his cattle the koi is included our Eliezer said he has not consecrated the koi he who maintains that one permits doubt to extend to his chattels maintains likewise that he permits it to extend to himself too but he who holds that one does not permit doubt to extend to his chattels will maintain this all the more of one's own person Talmud, Mas Nedarim Abbe said to him how have you explained the mission of doubt in Nazareth is ruled leniently as being our Eliezer's view and consider the latter clause doubtful firstborns whether of man or beast whether clean or unclean the claimant must furnish proof that they are firstborns and it was taught thereon they may neither be sheared nor put to service he replied why do you compare innate sanctity with man-made sanctity but if there is a difficulty it is the stoutful fluids in respect of becoming unclean themselves are unclean in respect of defiling others they are clean this is our mayor's view and our Eliezer agreed with him but is it our Eliezer's opinion that in respect of becoming unclean themselves they are unclean but it was taught our Eliezer said liquids have no uncleanness at all by scriptural law the proof is that Jose B. Joseph Zira to testify that the stag locust is clean i.e. fit for food and that the fluids in the temple slaughterhouse are clean now there is no difficulty according to Samuel's interpretation that they are clean only insofar that they cannot defile other liquids but that nevertheless they are unclean in themselves but according to Rab who maintain that they are literally clean even in respect of themselves what can be said but answer thus one the Mishnah in Toharoth. Teaches our Judah's view the other our Mishnah gives our Simeons for it was taught if one says behold I will be a Nazir if the stack contains a hundred core and he goes and finds it stolen or destroyed our Judah ruled that he is not a Nazir our Simeon that he is now our Judah is self-contradictory did he say that one does not place himself in a doubtful position and a contradiction is shown our Judah said an unspecified reference to Terima in Judea is binding but not in Galilee because the Galileans are unfamiliar with the Terima of the temple chamber thus the reason is that they are unfamiliar Talmud, Mas Nedarim B but if they were familiar there with it would be binding Rob answered in the case of the stack he holds that since doubt is graver than certainty one will not put himself into that doubtful position for if he is a certain Nazir he may shave and offer his sacrifice which may be eaten but if he is a doubtful Nazir he may never shave or who not be Judah asked Rabba, but what if he said behold I will be a lifelong Nazir he replied even then a lifelong Nazir his doubt is greater than his certainty for a certain Nazir lightens the burden of his hair and offers three animals but not so a doubtful Nazir but what if he said behold I will be a Samson Nazirite he replied a Samson Nazirite was not included said he to him but our Adabi Ahabah said a Samson Nazirite was taught he replied if it was taught it was taught our Ashi said that the Mishnah in Toharoth gives the view of Arjuda quoting Artarfan for it was taught Arjuda said on the authority of Artarfan neither is a Nazir because Nazirot must be expressed with certainty if so why particularly if the stack was stolen or destroyed to show how far reaching is our Simeon's view that even if it was stolen or destroyed he still maintains that one places himself in a doubtful position Arjuda said an unspecified reference to Terima in Judea etc but if they were familiar there with it would be binding which Choose that the doubt is ruled stringently then consider the last clause unqualified allusions to Haramim in Judea are not binding but in Galilee they are because the Galileans are unfamiliar with priestly Haramim but if they were familiar they would be invalid thus in doubt we are lenient Abay answered the last clauses of you of our Eliezer B. Arzadik for it was taught our Judah said an unspecified reference to Terima in Judah is binding our Eliezer son of Arzadik said unspecified. References to Haramim in Galilee are binding Talmud, Mas Nedarim Mishnah if one views by Haram and then says I vowed only by a fishing net by Corbin and then says I vowed only by royal gifts if he says behold I myself is me be a Corbin and then states I vowed only by the Zembone which I keep for the purpose of vowing if one says Konam be any benefit my wife has of me and then declares I spoke only of my first wife whom I have divorced if none of these vows do they require to seek. Absolution, but if a request for absolution is preferred, they are punished and treated strictly. This is the view of our mayor, but the sages say they are given an opening for regret in other grounds and they are admonished so that they do not treat vows with levity. Gemara, this is self contradictory. You say of none of these vows do they require to seek absolution, and then you continue. If a request for absolution is preferred, they are punished and treated strictly, said Rab Judah. This is its meaning. Of none of these vows do they require to seek absolution. This applies, however, only to a scholar, and when Amhiras applies for absolution, he is punished and treated strictly. Now, treated strictly as well, it means that we do not suggest an opening for regret, but how are they punished as it was taught if one vowed Nezirot and then violated his vow? His case is not examined unless he observes his vow for the full period that he had violated it. This is the view of our Judah. Our Jose said this applies. Only to short Nezirot, i.e., 30 days, but in the case of a long period of Nezirot, 30 days are sufficient. Our Joseph said, since the rabbis have decreed his case is not to be examined if a Beth Din does attend to it before time, it does not act right and must be reprimanded. Our Ahabi Jacob said it is banned, but the sages say they are given an opening for regret, etc. It was taught never make a practice of vowing, for ultimately you will trespass in the matter of oaths and do not frequent an Amhiras, for eventually he will give you Tibalim and do not associate with the priest and Amhiras, for ultimately he will give you Terimaju and do not converse much with women as this will ultimately lead you to unjustity. Our Ahab, the school of our Josiah said, he who gazes at a woman eventually comes to sin and he who looks even at a woman's heel will be get degenerate children. Our Joseph said this applies even to one's own wife when she is in it. Our Simeon Belaker said, heel that is stated. Means the unclean part which is directly opposite the heel it was taught and Moses said unto the people fear not for God is come to prove you that his fear may be before your faces by this is meant shamefacedness that yes and not this teaches that shamefacedness leads to fear of sin hence it was said that it is a good sign if a man is shamefaced others say no man who experiences shame will easily sin and he who is not shamefaced it is certain that his ancestors were not present at Mount Sinai are you had and be I said the ministering angels told me four things people are born lame because they see their parents overturned their table i.e. practiced unnatural cohabitation dumb because they kiss that place deaf because they converse during cohabitation blind because they look at that place but this contradicts the following Imishalom was asked why are Talmud Mas Nedarim be thy children so exceedingly beautiful she replied because he my husband converses with me neither at the beginning nor at the end of the night but only at midnight and when he converses he uncovers a handbreadth and covers a handbreadth and is as though he were compelled by a demon and when I asked him what is the reason for this for choosing midnight he replied so that I may not think of another woman lest my children be as bastards there is no difficulty this refers to conjugal matters the other refers to other matters are Yohanan said the above is the view of our Yohanan be but are Sages said the halajah is not as our Yohanan be but a man may do whatever he pleases with his wife at intercourse a parable meat which comes from the abattoir may be eaten salted roasted cooked or seated so with fish from the fishmonger Amimar said who are the ministering angels the rabbis for should you maintain it literally why did our
Did not our Samuel be Namani say in the name of our Jonathan one who is summoned to his marital duty by his wife will beget children such as were not to be found even in the generation of Moses for it is said take you wise men and understanding and known among your tribes and I will make them rulers over you and it is written so I took the chiefs of your tribes wise men and known but understanding is not mentioned but it is also written Issachar is a large bone as whilst elsewhere it is written. And of the children of Issachar which were men that had understanding of the titles it is virtuous only when the wife ingratiates herself with her husband C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-I mission four types of vows have the sages invalidated this vows incentive vows of exaggeration vows in error and vows broken under pressure vows incentive e.g. if one was selling an article and said conum that I do not let you have it for less than a seller and the other replied conum that I do not give you more than a. Shekel Talmud, Mas Nedarim, both are agreed upon three denarii Gemara, four vows have the rabbis invalidated, etc. Our Abba B. Memel said to our MI, you have told us in the name of our Jude Nisiyah, which Tana holds this view, our Judah, who said on the authority of our Tarfan, neither is a Nazir, because Nezirot must be expressed with certainty. Rabbi said, you may even say the rabbis does the mission to teach both subsequently agreed to teach both are agreed. Rabbi asked our Ashi if he demanded more than a. Essia and the other offered less than a shekel is it a valid vow or still a matter of incitement he replied we have learned this if one was urging his neighbor to eat in his house and he answered Konum if I enter your house or if I drink a drop of cold water he may enter his house and drink cold water because he only meant eating and drinking in general but why did he not state a drop of cold water hence this is the usual manner of speech thus here too this is the usual manner of speech he said to him Talmud, Mas Nedarim be how compare in the case of cold water the righteous promise little and perform much but here it is really doubtful whether he the vendor implied that he would take less than a seller and the buyer that he would give more than a shekel and it is a vow of incitement or perhaps each spoke literally and it is a valid vow this problem remains unsolved Rab Judah said in R.C.'s name for these four vows formal absolution must be sought from a sage when I Stated this before Samuel, he observed the Tana teaches four vows have the sages invalidated, yet you say absolution must be sought from a sage. Our Joseph reported this discussion in the following version. Rab Judah said in R.C.'s name, a sage may remit only such vows as are similar to these four. Thus, in his view, mere regret is not given as an opening for absolution. A man once came before Arhuna for absolution. He asked him, Are you still of the same mind? And he replied, No, thereupon he absolved him. A man once came before Rab, son of Arhuna, who asked him, Had ten men been present to appease you just then? Would you have doubt on his reply? No, he absolved him. It was taught. Our Judah said, We asked him, Are you still of the same mind? If he answers, No, he is absolved. Our Ishmael, son of Arhuna, said on his father's authority, We say to him, Had ten men been present to appease you just then? Would you have doubt if he replies in the negative? Absolution is granted. Nemonica C and Eliezer. Yohanan and Jenna, a man once came before R.C. He asked him, Do you now regret that you ever vowed? And he replied, Do I not thereupon he absolved him? A man once came before Eliezer. He said to him, Do you desire your vow? He replied, Had I not been provoked, I certainly would not have desired. I'll let it be as you wish. Answered he, a woman who had subjected her daughter to a vow came before Yohanan and said he to her, Had you known that your neighbors would say of your daughter Talmud, Mas. Nedarim, if her mother had not seen something shameful in her behavior, she would not have put her under a vow without cause. Would you have vowed under replying in the negative? He absolved her. The grandson of Arjana, the elder, came before him, said he to him, Had you known that when you vow your ledger is opened in heaven and your deeds examined, would you have vowed on his giving a negative reply? He absolved him, or Abba said, which verse teaches this after vows come at examination, but Though Arjani proposed this as a ground for absolution, we may not do so, nor do we suggest the following which Rabbi Barhana related in Aryohanan's name. What opening did Argamaliel give to a certain old man? These that speak like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is healthy. Who speak the vow is worthy of being pierced by the sword, but that the tongue of the wise, i.e., absolution health, nor do we suggest the following. This what was taught our Nathan said, one who vows is as though he built a high place and he who fulfills it is as though he sacrificed thereon. Now the first half may be given as an opening, but as for the second, Abbe maintained, we suggested Rabbi said, we do not suggest it. This is the version of the discussion as recited by Arkahana Artabiomi reported it. Thus we may not suggest the latter half, but as for the first, Abbe maintained, we suggested Rabbi said, we do not. The law is that neither the first half nor the second may be proposed. Nor do we suggest the following dictum of Samuel, because even when one fulfills his vow, he is called wicked. Our Abba said, which verse teaches this, but if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in the end. The meaning of forbearance is learned from forbearance as expressed elsewhere. Here it is written, but if thou shalt forbear to vow, and there it is written, there the wicked forbear from insolence. Our Joseph said, we too have learned so if one says as the vows of the righteous, his words are of no effect. But if he says as the vows of the wicked, he has vowed in respect of a Nazi right vow and a sacrifice. Our Samuel will be He said in the name of our Jonathan, he who loses his temper is exposed to all the torments of Gehenna, for it is written, therefore remove anger from thy heart, thus wilt thou put away evil from thy flesh. Now evil can only mean Gehenna, as it is written, the Lord hath made all things for himself, yet even the wicked for the day of evil. Moreover, he is made to suffer from abdominal. Troubles as it is written, but the Lord shall give thee their trembling heart and failing of eyes and sorrow of mind. Now what causes failing eyes and a sorrowful mind abdominal troubles? When Lo went up to Palestine, he was joined by two inhabitants of Hosea, one of whom arose and slew the other. The murderer asked of Ola, did I do well? Yes, he replied. Moreover, cut his throat clean across when he came before Aryohan, and he asked him, Maybe God forbid I have strengthened the hands of transgressors. He replied, You have saved your life. Then Aryohan wondered, The Lord shall give them there an infuriated heart. Refers to Babylon. Ola replied, We had not yet Talmud. Mas Nedarim be crossed the Jordan into Palestine. Rabbi son of Arhuna said, He who loses his temper, even the divine presence is unimportant in his eyes. As it is written, The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek God. God is not in all his thoughts. Our Jeremiah of Dipti said, He forgets his learning and maxes evermore. Stupid as it is written, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools, and it is written, but the fool layeth open his folly. Our nom and be Isaac said, It is certain that his sins outnumber his merits, as it is written, and the furious man aboundeth in transgressions. Our son of our Hananah said, Had not Israel sinned, only the Pentateuch and the book of Joshua would have been given them the latter, because it records the disposition of Palestine among the tribes, whence is this known for much wisdom proceedeth. From much anger, R.C. said, Absolution is not granted for a vow in the name of the God of Israel, except the following conum be any benefit by the God of Israel. My wife has of me because she stole my purse or beat my child, and it was subsequently learned that she had done neither. A woman once came before R.C. He asked her, How did you vow? She replied, By the God of Israel, said he to her, Had you vowed by Moe, which is a mere substitute, I would absolve you now that you did not vow by Moe, but by the God of Israel, I will not absolve you. Or Kahana visited our Joseph's home. The latter said to him, Eat something to which he replied, No, by the master of all, I will not taste anything. Our Joseph answered, No, by the master of all, you may not eat now. Our Kahana rightly said, No, by the master of all, etc. To strengthen his vow. But why did our Joseph repeat this? This is what he said, Since you have said, No, by the master of all, you may not eat. Rabbah said, In our Naman's name, the law's regret may be made. An opening for absolution, and absolution is granted for a vow made in the name of the God of Israel. Rabbah was praising our Sirah to our Naman as a great man thereupon. And Naman said, When he comes to you, bring him to me now. He our Sirah had a vow for absolution. So he went before our Naman who asked him, Did you vow bearing this in mind? Yes, he replied, Or this, yes, this being repeated a number of times. Our Naman became angry and exclaimed, Go to your room. Our Sirah departed and found an opening for himself rabbi said which is the right course that man should choose for himself that which he feels to be honorable to himself and brings him honor from
wish and did go he went to Arhose for absolution who said to him had you known that she would disregard your wish and make the journey would you have imposed a vow on her he answered no and Arhose absolved him mission our Eliza B. Jacob said also he who wishes to subject his friend to a vow to eat with him should declare every vow which I may make in the future shall be null his vows are then invalid providing that he remembers this at the time of the vow tomorrow but since he says every vow which I may make in the future shall be null he will surely not listen to him and not come to eat with him Talmud, Moss Nettering B the text is defective and this is what was taught he who desires his friend to eat with him and after urging him imposes a vow upon him it is a vow of incitement and hence invalid and he who desires that none of his vows made during the year shall be valid let him stand at the beginning of the year and declare every vow which I may make in the future shall be Null his vows are then invalid providing that he remembers this at the time of the vow but if he remembers he has cancelled the declaration and confirmed the vow Abbe answered red providing that it is not remembered at the time of the vow Rabbi said after all it is as we said originally here the circumstances are e.g. that one stipulated at the beginning of the year but does not know in reference to what now he vows hence if he remembers the stipulation and he declares I vow in accordance with my original intention his vow has no reality but if he does not declare thus he has cancelled his stipulation and confirmed his vow are who not behind in a wish to lecture thereon sc anticipatory cancellation at the public session but Rob remonstrated with him the tana has intentionally obscured the law in order that vows should not be lightly treated whilst you desire to teach it publicly the scholars propounded do the rabbis disagree with our Eliza B. Jacob or not and should you say that they differ is the halach like him or not come and here for we learned if one says to his neighbor Talmud, Mas Nettering Makonim that I do not benefit from your if you do not accept for your son a core of wheat and two barrels of wine his neighbor may handle his vow without recourse to a sage by saying did you vow for any other purpose but to honor me this not acceptance is my honor thus it is only because he asserts this is my honor but otherwise it is a binding vow whose view is. This if our Eliza B. Jacobs it is a vow of incitement hence it must be the rabbis thus proving that they disagree with our Eliza no after all it may be our Eliza B. Jacobs view he admits that this is a real vow for he who makes it says in effect I am not a dog that I should benefit from you without your benefiting from me come and here if one says to his neighbor Konim that you benefit not from me if you do not give my son a core of wheat and two barrels of wine are your rules he is. So forbidden until he gives but the rabbis maintain he too can annul his vow without a sage by declaring I regard it as though I have received it thus it is only because he says I regard it as though I have received it but otherwise it is a valid vow whose view is this if our Eliza B. Jacobs but it is a vow of incitement hence it must be the rabbis thus proving that they disagree with him no verily it may be our Eliza B. Jacobs view he admits that this is a real vow for he who makes. It says I am not a king to benefit you without your benefiting me Markashi son of Arhis Da said to Arashi come and here vows broken under pressure if one subjected his neighbor to a vow to dine with him and then he or his son fell sick or a river prevented him from coming to him but otherwise the vow is binding whose view is this if our Eliza B. Jacobs but it is a vow of incitement hence it must be the rabbis which proves that they disagree with him no this may be our Eliza B. Jacob's view, do you think that the inviter imposed a vow upon the invited? On the contrary, the invited imposed a vow upon the inviter. Thus he said to his neighbor, Do you invite me to your banquet? Yes, replied he, then make a vow to that effect. So he vowed, and then he, the person invited, or his son fell sick or was kept back by a river. Such are vows broken under pressure. Come and hear our Eliza B. Jacob went even further in his definition of vows of incitement. If one says to his neighbor, Conum, that I do not benefit from you if you will not be my guest and partake of fresh bread and a hot drink with me, and the latter remonstrated in his turn, such two are vows of incitement. But the sages did not admit this. Now to what does this disagreement refer? Surely Talmud, Moss Nettering B. Even to the first illustration given by our Eliza B. Jacob, this proves that the rabbis dispute his ruling in its entirety. This proves it. What is our final conclusion on the matter? Come and hear for our. Una said the Halacha is like our Eliza B. Jacob mission of vows of exaggeration when one says Konam if I did not see on this road as many as departed from Egypt or if I did not see a serpent like the beam of an olive press Gemara it was taught vows of exaggeration are invalid but oaths of such a nature are binding how are such oaths possible shall we say that one said I swear so and so if I have not seen etc he said nothing of a answered when one declares I swear that I did see etc Rabba. Objective so why teach it moreover it is taught parallel to vows but said Rabba when one says may all the fruit in the world be forbidden me on oath if I did not see on this road as many as departed from Egypt Rabbanah said to Arashi perhaps this man saw an ant nest and designated them those who left Egypt his oath thus being genuine Talmud, Mas Nettering he replied one who swears swears in our sense and we do not think of an ant nest now does one never swear in his own sense but it was. Taught when an oath is administered, he the man swearing is admonished, know that we do not adjure you according to your own mind, but according to our mind and the mind of the court. Now, what does this exclude? Surely the case of one who gave his creditor checkers tokens in game and mentally dubbed them coins, and since he is admonished according to our intention, it follows that otherwise one may swear in his own sense. No, it excludes such an incident as Robbus came a man with a monetary claim upon his neighbor once came before Robbus demanding of the debtor come and pay me, I have repaid you, pleaded he. If so, said Robbus to him, go and swear to him that you have repaid thereupon. He went and brought a hollow cane, placed the money therein, and came before the court walking and leaning on it before swearing. He said to the plaintiff, hold the cane in your hand. He then took a scroll of the law and swore that he had repaid him all that he the creditor held in his hand. The creditor. Thereupon broke the cane in his rage and the money poured out on the ground it was thus seen that he had literally sworn to the truth but even so does one never swear in his own sense but it was taught thus we find that when Moses adjured the children of Israel in the plains of Moab he said unto them know that I do not adjure you in your sense but in mine and in that of the omnipresent as it is written neither with you only etc. Now what did Moses say to Israel surely this lest you transgress my words and then say we swore in our own sense therefore he exhorted them swear in my sense what does this exclude surely the naming of idols God this proves that one does sometimes swear in his own sense no idols too are called God as it is written and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment then let him adjure then to fulfill the commands that might imply the commands of the king then let him adjure then to fulfill all the commands that might imply the precept of fringes. For a master said the precept of fringes is equal to all the other precepts of the Torah but why did not Moses simply adjure the Israelites to fulfill the Torah because that would imply one Torah only then why not adjure then to fulfill the Torah that might mean the Torah of the meal offering the Torah of the sin offering the Torah of the trespass offering then why not impose an oath to fulfill the whole Torah the whole Torah might mean merely to refrain from idolatry as it was taught. Idolatry is so grave a sin that the rejection thereof is as the fulfillment of the whole Torah then why not impose an oath to observe the prohibition against idolatry and the whole Torah or to fulfill the 613 precepts Moses used a general expression without troubling to enumerate details or if I did not see a serpent like the beams of an olive press is this impossible was there not a serpent in the days of kingship or before which 13 stables of straw were laced Swallowed then all Samuel answered he meant as smooth as a bean etc but are not all serpents smooth we speak of one who declared that its back was smooth not on why the neck then let him the tannis state smooth he thereby informs us in passing that the beams of the olive press must be smooth how does this affect the law in respect of buying and selling to tell you that if one sells the beams of an olive press the sale is valid only if they are smooth but not otherwise Talmud, Moss. Nettering be mission of vows in error if one says conum if I ate or drank and then remembered that he had or if I eat or drink and then forgot his vow and ate or drank or conum be any benefit which my wife has of me because she stole my purse or beat my child and it was subsequently learned that she had not beaten him nor stolen all these are vows in error if a man saw people eating his figs and said to them let the figs be a corbin to you and then discovered them to be his father or his Brothers while others were with them too Beth Shammai maintained his father and brothers are permitted but the r
Be reckoned with and Bethel agree with our Jose who said once last words count our Papa objected to Rabba in what instance did our Akiba rule that a vow which is partially annulled is entirely annulled e.g. if one said Konam that I do not benefit from any of you if one was subsequently permitted to afford him benefit they are all permitted but if he said Konam that I do not benefit from ABC etc if the first was subsequently permitted all are permitted but if the last named was permitted he alone is permitted but the rest are forbidden as for Rabba it is well for he can apply the first clause to one who in the first instance enumerated ABC etc while the second clause refers to one who in the first instance declared to any of you but as for yourself granted that you can apply the first clause to one who in his second statement declared to any of you Talmud, Mas Netarim B but as for the second clause where one enumerated ABC is this our Akiba's view only. Why do the rabbis disagree there with but you say that all agree that the vow is entirely annulled? Rabbi answered even according to Rabbi is our Akiva's ruling satisfactory how have you explained it that he said any of you who then is the first and who is the last but explained it thus the first clause means that he said any of you but the second refers e.g. to one who made each dependent on the preceding vow BBS A C B S B etc. This may be proved too for it is taught if the middle person was permitted those mentioned after him are also permitted but not those named before our Adabi Ahab objected to Rabbi Konam if I taste onions because they are injurious to the heart and one said to him but the wild onion is good for the heart he is permitted to partake of wild onions and not only of these but of all onions such a case happened before our mayor who gave absolution in respect of all onions does it not mean that he declared had I known that wild onions are good for the heart I would have vowed all onions be forbidden me but wild onions be permitted no this refers to one who declared had I known that wild onions are good for the heart I would have vowed such and such onions be forbidden me but wild onions be permitted and therefore our mayor's ruling agrees with both our Akiba and the rabbis Rabban objected to Rabba our Nathan said a vow may be partly permitted and partly binding e.g. if one vowed not to eat a basket of fixed Talmud, Mas Netarim among which were Shua fix and then declared had I known that Shuali fix were among them I would not have vowed the basket of fixes forbidden but the Shuha fix are permitted then our Akiba came and taught a vow which is partially annulled is entirely annulled does it not mean that he declared had I known that Shuha fix were among them I would have vowed the black fix and white fix be forbidden but the Shuha fix be permitted yet it is our Akiba's view only but the rabbis disputed no this refers to one who Declared had I known that you a fix were among them I would have vowed let the whole basket of fix be forbidden but the Shua fix permitted which Tana is the authority for the following dictum of the rabbis if one vowed simultaneously not to benefit from five men if he is absolved in respect of one of them he is absolved in respect of all but if he stated except one of them that one is permitted but the others are forbidden to him according to rabbi the first clause agrees with R. Akiba only and the second clause with all according to rabbi the second clause agrees with the rabbis only and the first clause with all mission of vows broken under pressure if one subjected his neighbor to a vow to dine with him and then he or his son fell sick or a river prevented him from coming to him such as a vow broken under pressure Gemara a man once deposited his rights at Beth Din and declared if I do not appear within thirty days these rights shall be void subsequently he was unavoidably prevented from appearing thereupon our who ruled his rights are void but Rabbi said to him he was unavoidably prevented and the divine law exempts such for it is written but unto the damsel shalt thou do nothing and should you answer the death penalty is different but we learned thou's broken under pressure if one subjected his neighbor to a vow to dine with him and then he or his son fell sick or a river prevented him from coming to him such is a vow broken under pressure now according to Rabbi wherein does this differ from what we learned if one said to his wife behold this is a divorce to be effective from now if I do not come back within twelve months and he died within the twelve months the divorce is valid yet why so was he not forcibly prevented I will tell you there it may be different Talmud Mas Netarim B because had he known that he would die he would have decided and given the divorce so as to take effect immediately and how does it Differ from the case of the man who declared if I do not come within thirty days from now let it be a divorce he came on the last day but was cut off through the lack of a fairy yet though he cried out see I have come see I have come Samuel ruled that is not called coming but why surely he was unavoidably prevented perhaps an accident that can be foreseen is different and the lack of a fairy could be foreseen now according to our humalata see it is an ismakta and an ismakta gives no title here it is different because he had deposited his rights and where they are deposited is it not an ismakta but we learned if one repaid a portion of his debt and then placed the bond in the hands of a third party and declared if I do not repay the balance within thirty days return the bill to the creditor and the time came and he did not repay our Jose maintained he the third party must surrender the bond to the creditor our Judah maintained he must not surrender it and our said in the name of Rabbi Abba in Rab's name the Halachah is not as our Jose who ruled that an Ismakta gives a legal claim here it is different because he had declared these rights shall be void now the law is an Ismakta does give a legal claim providing that no unavoidable accident supervened and that a formal acquisition was made at an authoritative Beth Din Mishnah one may vow to murderers robbers and publicans that it the produce which they demand is terima even if it is not or that it belongs to the royal house even if it does not Beth Shammai maintain one may make any form of vow Talmud Mas Netarim accepting that sustained by an oath but Beth Hillel maintain even such are permissible Beth Shammai rule he must not volunteer to vow Beth Hillel rule he may do so Beth Shammai say he may vow only as far as he the murderer etc makes him vow Beth Hillel say even in respect of what he does not make him vow e.g. if he the robber said to him say Konam be any benefit my wife. Has of me and he declared Konam be any benefit my wife and children have of me Beth Shammai rule his wife is permitted but his children are forbidden Beth Hillel rule both are permitted Gemara but Samuel said the law of the country is law our highness said in the name of Arkahana in the name of Samuel the mission refers to a publican who is not limited to a legal due the school of Arjana answered this refers to an unauthorized collector or that it belongs to the royal house even if it does not. How does he vow Aram said in Rab's name by saying may all the fruits of the world be forbidden me if this does not belong to the royal house but if he said may they be forbidden all the fruits of the world are forbidden to him he adds today but if so the publican will not accept it he mentally stipulates today but makes no explicit reservation and though we normally rule that an unexpressed stipulation is invalid it is different when made under duress Beth Shammai maintain one may. Make any form of vow but Beth Hillel rule that even such are permissible Beth Shammai rule the owner must not volunteer to vow Beth Hillel rule he may do so Beth Shammai say he may vow only as far as he the murderer makes him vow Beth Hillel say even in respect of what he does not make him vow e.g. if he the robber said to him say Konam be any benefit my wife has of me and the owner declared Konam be any benefit my wife and children have of me Beth Shammai rule his wife is permitted but his children are forbidden Beth Hillel rule both are permitted Arhuna said Atana taught Beth Shammai maintain he must not volunteer with an oath Beth Hillel say he may volunteer even with an oath now in the view of Beth Shammai only with an oath may he not volunteer but he may volunteer a vow but we learned Beth Shammai rule the owner must not volunteer to vow moreover he may merely not volunteer an oath but he may vow with an oath if requested but we learned Beth Shammai maintain one may Make any form of vow accepting that sustained by an oath the Mishnah deals with a vow to shoe how far reaching is Beth Shammai's ruling whilst the bury the treats of an oath to shoe the full extent of Beth Hillel's view are as she answered this is what is taught Beth Shammai say there is no absolution for an oath and Beth Hillel say there is absolution for an oath Mishnah if one says let these saplings be korban i.e. consecrated if they are not cut down or let this garment be korban if it is not burnt they can be redeemed if he says let these saplings be korban until they are cut down or let this garment be korban until it is burnt Talmud, Mas Netarim B they cannot be redeemed tomorrow let the Mishnah teach they are consecrated because the second clause must state they cannot be redeemed the first clause also states they can be redeemed how was a vow made Amimar answered by saying if they are not cut down today and the day passed without their being cut down if so what Teach it is it not obvious the need for teaching it arises e.g. when a strong wind is blowing
The second clause if he says let it be a burnt offering after 30 days but a peace offering from now it is so now if you agree that one clause refers to bodily sanctity and the other to monetary sanctity Talmud, Mas Nedarim hence the Tana must teach both clauses because I would think that monetary consecration can automatically cease but not so bodily sanctity hence both are rightly taught but if you maintain that the two refer to monetary consecration why teach them both if a higher sanctity can automatically give way to a lower sanctity surely it is superfluous to state that a lower sanctity can be replaced by a higher one shall we say that this is a refutation of Barpada who maintained that sanctity cannot cease automatically said our Papa Barpada can answer thus the text is defective and this is its meaning if he did not say let this be a peace offering from now it remains a burnt offering after 30 days this may be compared to the case of one who says to a Woman be thou betrothed unto me after thirty days she becomes betrothed then even though the money of betrothal has been consumed in the meanwhile but is this not obvious this is necessary only to teach that where he supplemented his first declaration it is still ineffective now that is well on the view that she the woman cannot retract but on the view that she can retract what can be said even according to that view this case is different because a verbal promise to God is as actual delivery and secular transactions are Robin and our Isaac B. Rabbi were sitting before our Jeremiah who was dozing now they sat and stated according to Barpada who maintained that they revert to their sanctity Talmud Mas Nedarim you may solve the problem of our Hashiv is what if one gives two perutas to a woman saying to her be thou betrothed unto me for one of these today and for the other be thou betrothed unto me after I divorce thee now from Barpada's ruling you may deduce that the Second is indeed valid kitchen this the first the former is duly effective I would think that it is so even if this concurrent sanctity was imposed only in a supplementary statement hence the need for the second clause is that if the second sanctity was not at the very outset imposed concurrently with the first it cannot come into effect roused our Jeremiah and he said to them why do you compare redemption by the owner to redemption by others thus did our Yohanan say if he himself redeems then they revert to their sanctity but if others redeem them they do not now a divorced woman may be compared to the case of redemption by others it was stated likewise RMI said in our Yohanan's name only if he himself redeems them was this taught that they revert to their sanctity but when others redeem them they do not revert to their sanctity Mishnah he who vows not to benefit from seafarers may benefit from land dwellers from land dwellers he is forbidden to benefit even from Seafarers because seafarers are included in the term land dwellers not those who merely travel from Akko to Jaffa but those who sail away great distances from land Gemara our Papa and Araha son of Araka one reverted the last statement to the first clause and the other to the second now he who reverted it to the first clause learned thus he who vows not to benefit from seafarers may benefit from land dwellers hence he may not benefit from seafarers not those who merely Talmud, Moss. Nedarim be travel from Akko to Jaffa as these are land dwellers but those who sail away great distances from land he who reverted it to the second clause learned thus if one vows not to benefit from land dwellers he may not benefit from seafarers this applies not only to those who travel merely from Akko to Jaffa but even to those who travel great distances since they eventually land Mishnah he who vows not to benefit from the seers of the sun is forbidden from the blind too because he Meant those whom the sun sees tomorrow. What is the reason? Since he did not say from those who see, he meant to exclude only fish and embryos. Mishnah he who vows not to benefit from the black-haired may not benefit from the bald and the gray-haired, but may benefit from women and children because only men are called black-haired. Tomorrow, what is the reason? Since he did not say from those who possess hair, but may benefit from women and children because only men are called black-haired. What is the reason? Men sometimes cover their heads and sometimes not, but women's hair is always covered and children are always bareheaded. Mishnah one who vows not to benefit from Yolodim, those born may benefit from Yolodim, those to be born from Yolodim, he may not benefit from Yolodim. Our Meir permitted him to benefit even from Yolodim, but the sages say he meant all whose nature it is to be born tomorrow. Now according to our Meir, let him go without saying who then is forbidden to him. The text. Is defective and thus to be reconstructed. One who vows not to benefit from Yolodim may benefit from Yolodim. From Yolodim, Yolodim are forbidden to him. Our Meir said also, he who vows not to benefit from Yolodim may benefit from Yolodim. Just as he who vows not to benefit from Yolodim may benefit from Yolodim. Our Papa said to Abay, are we to conclude that Yolodim implies those about to be born? If so, does the verse thy two sons which Yolodim unto thee in the land of Egypt mean who are to be born? What then will you say that it implies who were born? If so, what of the verse behold a child Yolodim unto the house of David Josiah by name? Will you say that he was already born? But even Manasseh Josiah's grandfather was not yet born. But Yolodim implies both and in vows we follow general usage. But the sages say he meant all whose nature it is to be born, excluding what it excludes fish and foul Talmud. Mas Nedarim Mishnah he who vows not to benefit from those who rest on it. Sabbath is forbidden to benefit both from Israelites and Kutians. If he vows not to benefit from garlic eaters, he may not benefit from Israelites and Kutians. From those who go up to Jerusalem, he is forbidden to benefit from Israelites, but from Kutians he is permitted tomorrow. What is meant by those who rest on the Sabbath? Shall we say those who observe the Sabbath? Why, particularly Kutians, even heathens, if they observe the Sabbath too, hence it must mean those who are commanded to observe the Sabbath. If so, consider the last clause from those who go up to Jerusalem, he is forbidden to benefit from Israelites, but from Kutians he is permitted. But why so are they not commanded to stand obey in both clauses? The reference is to those who are commanded and fulfill their obligations. Hence, in the first clause, both Israelites and Kutians are commanded and observe the Sabbath, but those heathens who rest on the Sabbath do so without being obliged to us for making pilgrimages. To Jerusalem Jews are commanded and observe it, but Kutians though commanded do not mishnah if one says Konim that I do not benefit from the children of Noah he may benefit from Israelites but not from heathens tomorrow but are then Israelites excluded from the children of Noah since Abraham was sanctified they are called by his name mishnah if one says Konim that I do not benefit from the seed of Abraham he is forbidden to benefit from Israelites but permitted to benefit from heathens tomorrow but there is Ishmael it is written for in Isaac shall thy seed be called but there is Esau in Isaac but not all the descendants of Isaac mishnah if one says Konim that I do not benefit from Israelites he must buy things from them for more than their worth and sell them for less if he says Konim if Israelites benefit from me he must buy from them for less and sell for more than their worth but none need consent to this that I may not benefit from them nor they from me he may. Benefit only from heathens. Tomorrow Samuel said, If one takes an article from an artisan on approval and whilst in his possession it is accidentally damaged, he is liable for it. Hence we see that in his view the benefit is on the side of the buyer. We learned if one says Konam that I do not benefit from Israelites, he must sell them for less. Hence he may not sell at its actual worth. But if the purchaser benefits not the vendor, why not sell at its actual worth? The mission refers to an unsaleable article. If so, consider the first statement, he must buy for more than their worth. Moreover, consider the second clause. If he says Konam, if Israelites benefit from me, he must buy from them for less and sell for more than their worth. But if this refers to unsaleable merchandise, even to sell at its actual worth should be permitted. The second clause refers to keen merchandise. If so, why must he purchase at a lesser price? He may even pay the full value. Talmud, Mas Nedarim, but. The mission refers to average merchandise whilst Samuel refers to an article that is eagerly sought it was taught in agreement with Samuel if one takes articles from a tradesman on approval to send them as a gift to his father-in-law's house and stipulates if they are accepted I will pay you their value but if not I will pay you for their good will benefit if they were accidentally damaged on the outward journey he is liable if on their return journey he is not liable because he is regarded as a paid trustee a middleman once took an ass to sell but could not sell it on his way back it was accidentally injured whereupon Arnaman held him liable to make it good Rob objected if they were damaged on the outward journey he is liable if on their return journey he is not sent he to him the return journey of a middleman counts as an outward journey for if he finds a purchaser even at his doorstep will he not sell it to him mission if one says Conan that I do not benefit from it Uncircumcised he may benefit from uncircumcised Israelites but not from circumcised
would not have created the universe as it is written but for my covenant by day and night I would not have appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth Gemara it was taught our Joshua B. Karha said great is circumcision for all the meritorious deeds performed by Moses our teacher did not stand him instead when he displayed apathy towards circumcision as it is written and the Lord met him and sought to kill him our Jose sand God forbid that Moses should have been apathetic towards circumcision but he reasoned us if I circumcise my son and straightway go forth on my mission to Pharaoh I will endanger his life as it is written and it came to pass on the third day when they were sore if I circumcise him and tarry three days but the Holy One blessed be he has commanded go return unto Egypt why then was Moses punished Talmud, Mos Nederim because he busied himself first with the end as it is written and it came to pass by the way in the end our Simeon B. Gamaliel sand Satan did not seek to slay Moses but the child for it is written and over took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and cast it as his feet and sand surely bloody hat hand art thou to me go forth and see who is called a hat hand surely the infant to be circumcised are Judah be busy lectured when Moses was lax in the performance of circumcision af and he became and swallowed him up leaving not but his legs thereupon immediately it over took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her Son straightway he let him alone in that moment Moses desired to slay them as it is written cease from Af and forsake Hema some say that he did slay Hema as it is written I have not Hema but is it not written for I was afraid of Af and Hema there were two angels named Hema an alternative answer is this he slew the true commanded by Hema but not Hema himself it was taught Rabbi Sand great is circumcision for none so ardently busied himself with God's precepts as our father. Abraham yet he was called perfect only in virtue of circumcision as it is written walk before me and be thou perfect and it is written and I will make my covenant between me and the another version of Rabbi's teaching is this great is circumcision for it counterbalances all the other precepts of the Torah as it is written for after the tenor of these words I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel another version is great is circumcision since but for it heaven and earth would not. Endure as it is written, thus saith the Lord, but for my covenant by day and night I would not have appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth. Now the statement conflicts with our Eliezer's, for our Eliezer said, Great is the Torah, since but for it heaven and earth could not endure as it is written, but for my covenant by day and night I would not have appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth. Rab Judah sent in Rab's name when the Holy One blessed be, he said to our father Abraham, Walk before me and be thou perfect. He was seized with trembling, perhaps he said, There is still aught shameful in me, but when he added, And I will make my covenant between me and thee, his mind was appeased, he brought him forth abroad. Now Abraham had said unto him, Sovereign of the universe, I have gazed at the constellation which rules my destiny, and seen that I am not fated to be a children to which God replied, Go forth from thy astrological speculations, Israel is not subject to planetary influences, are. Isaac said he who perfects himself the Holy One blessed be he deals uprightly with him as it is written with the merciful thou will chew thyself merciful and with the upright thou will chew thyself upright our Hashai said if one perfects himself good fortune will be his as it is written walk before me and be thou perfect and it is further written and thou shalt be a father of many nations Rabbi said he who practices enchantment will be harassed by witchcraft as it is written for against him of the seed of Jacob there is enchantment but surely it is written with lame Allah but he is thus punished as measure for measure Ahab the son of our learned he who does not practice enchantment is brought within a barrier i.e. in proximity to God which not even the ministering angels may enter as it is written for there is no enchantment in Jacob neither is there any divination in Israel now it shall be asked by the angels of Jacob and Israel what hath God wrought our said in our Eliezer's name why was our father Abraham punished and his children doomed to Egyptian servitude for 210 years because he pressed scholars into his service as it is written he armed his dedicated servants born in his own house Samuel said because he went too far in testing the attributes i.e. the promises of the Lord as it is written and he said Lord God whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it or you had and said because he prevented men from entering beneath the wings of it. Sheshana as it is written and the king of Sodom said it to Abraham give me the persons and take the goods to thyself and he armed his trained servants born in his own house Rab said he equipped them by teaching them the Torah Samuel said he made them bright with gold i.e. rewarded them for accompanying him 318 RMIB Abba sent Eliezer outweighed them all others say it was Eliezer for this is the numerical value of his name RMIB Abba also said Abraham was three. Years old when he acknowledged the Creator for it is written because Hebekeb that Abraham obeyed my voice the numerical value of Ekeb is 172 RMIB Abba also said Talmud, Mos Nederim be the numerical value of Hasid and Satan is 364 RMIB Abba also said first Abram is written then Abraham at first God gave him mastery over 243 limbs and later over 248 the additional ones being the two eyes two ears and the member Mar MIB Abba also said what is the meaning of there is a little city etc a little city refers to the body and a few men within to the limbs and there came a great king against it and besieged it to the evil urge and built great bulwarks against it to sin now there was found in it a poor wise man to the good urge and he by his wisdom delivered the city to repentance and good deeds yet no man remembered that same poor man for when the evil urge gains dominion none remember the good. Urge wisdom strengtheneth the wise more than ten mighty ones which are in the city wisdom strengtheneth the wise refers to repentance and good deeds more than ten mighty ones is the two eyes two ears two hands two feet member and mouth are Zechariah said on our Ishmael's authority the Holy One blessed be he intended to bring forth the priesthood from Shem as it is written and he S.C. Melchizedek was the priest of the Most High God but because he gave precedence in his blessing to Abraham over God. He brought it forth from Abraham as it is written and he blessed him and said blessed be Abram of the Most High God possessor of heaven and earth and blessed be the Most High God said Abraham to him is the blessing of a servant to be given precedence over that of his master straightway the priesthood was given to Abraham as it is written the Lord said unto my Lord sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool which is followed by the Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, meaning because of the words of Melchizedek, hence it is written, and he was a priest of the Most High God, implying that he was a priest but not his seed. Chapter 4 Mishnah The only difference between one who is under a vow not to benefit from his neighbor and one who is forbidden to eat of his food is in respect of walking over his property and the use of utensils not employed in the preparation of food if a man is under a vow not to eat of his neighbor's food. The latter may not lend him a sifter seed millstone or oven, but he may lend him a shirt ring cloak and earrings. Tomorrow, which Tana is the authority of the Mishnah, our Adabi Ahabah said it is our Eliezer, for it was taught our Eliezer said even the extra given by a vendor to his customer is forbidden to him who is under a vow not to benefit by his neighbor if a man is under a vow not to eat of his neighbor's food. The latter may not lend him, etc. Talmud, Mos Nederim, Talmud, Mos Nederim, but he vowed in respect of food said our Simeon Belakish this refers to one who said the benefit of your food be forbidden me but may it not mean that he is not to chew wheat to a pulp and apply it to his wound robber replied the mission refers to one who said any benefit from you leading to the enjoyment of food be forbidden me or Papa said a sack for bringing fruit and ask for bringing fruit and even a mere basket all lead to the enjoyment of food are. Papa propounded what of a horse for traveling to a banquet or a ring to appear in or what of passing over his land come and here but he may lend him a shirt ring cloak and earrings how is this to be understood shall I say it is not to appear in them need this be stated hence it must mean to be seen in them and it is taught that he may lend them to him no after all it does not mean to appear in them but because the first clause teaches the latter may not lend him the second clause teaches. He may lend him mission and whatever is not employed in the preparation of food where such are hired out it is forbidden Gemara hence the first clause applies even where such things are not hired which Tanner rules thus said our Adabi Agabit is our Eliezer mission if one is under a vow not to benefit from his neighbor the latter may pay his shekel settle his debts and return the lost article to him where payment is taken for this the benefit must accrue to it Ishimara thus we see that it is merely driving away a lion from his neighbor's property and permitted which Tanner rules thus
Talmud, Mas Nedarim, we learned where payment is taken for this, the benefit must accrue to it. Now that is well on the view that even if the finder must not benefit from a loser's property, he may also return it. Hence it is taught where payment is made for this, the benefit must accrue to it. But on the view that if the finder may not benefit from a loser, he must not return it. Why should the benefit accrue to it? This law refers to one case only others reported in the following. Version RMI and RSC differ thereon. One said this was taught only if the finder may not benefit from a loser's property are Joseph's parata being rare, but if the loser may not benefit from the finder's property, he may not return it because he the finder benefits him while the other maintained even if the loser may not benefit from the finder's property, he may return it for he is only returning his own. We learned where payment is taken for this, the benefit must accrue to it. Dish now that is well on the view that even if the loser may not benefit from the finder, he may also return it, thus he justifies where etc. But on the view that if the loser may not benefit from the finder, he may not return it, how is where etc. Explain this is a difficulty Talmud. Mas Nedarim Biraba said if a hacker loaf lies before a man and he declares this loaf be and he takes it to eat, it trespasses in respect of its entire value if to leave it to his children, he trespasses in respect of. Its goodwill value only are high. Bob and ask Rabba what if one says to his neighbor, My loaf be forbidden to you, and then gives it to him. Now he said, My loaf, meaning only so long as it is in his own possession, or perhaps having said, Be forbidden to you, he has rendered it to him. Hitish, he replied, It is obvious that even if he gifted it to him, it is forbidden for what was it is vowed to exclude. Surely not the case where it would be stolen from him. He replied, No, it excludes the case where he invites him for a Talmud. Mas Nedarim, he objected, If it says to be lend me your cow, and be replies, Conum, be this cow, if I possess another for you, or my property be forbidden you, if I possess any cow but this, or lend me your spade, and he replies, The spade be forbidden me, if I possess another, or my property be forbidden me, if I possess any spade but this, and it is discovered that he possesses another during his bee's lifetime, it is forbidden him, but if he dies, or it is given to him it is permitted said Araha son of Rik that is if it was given to him through another Arashi said this may be proved too for it is stated it is given to him not he gives it to him Rabba asked Arnam and does the law of trespass apply to Konamoth he replied we have learned this where payment is taken for this the benefit must accrue to Hittish this teaches that it is as Hittish just as the law of trespass applies to Hittish so it applies to Konamoth this is dependent on Tanaim if one says Konam this loaf is Hittish then whosoever eats it whether he or his neighbor commits trespass therefore the law of redemption applies to it but if he says this loaf is Hittish to me by eating it he commits trespass but his neighbor does not commit a trespass therefore the law of redemption does not apply this is the view of Armair but the sages maintain in both cases no trespass is involved because the law of trespass does not apply to Konamoth Araha son of Rabbi asked Arashi if it says to be my loaf be forbidden to you and then makes a gift of it to him who is liable for trespass shall the giver incur it but it is not forbidden to him is the receiver to incur it but he can say I desire to accept what is permitted not what is forbidden he replied the receiver incurs the liability when he uses it for whoever converts money of Hittish into Hull and thinks that it is Hull and yet he is involved in trespass so this one too is liable for trespass Talmud, Mas Nedarim be Mishnah and he may separate his terima and his tithes with his consent he may offer up for him the bird sacrifices of Zabu and Zaboth and the bird sacrifices of women after childbirths and offerings and guild offerings he may teach him Midrash Halashah and Agadoth but not scripture yet he may teach scripture to his sons and daughters Gemara the scholars propounded are the priests in sacrificing our agents or agents of the Almerciful what is the practical difference in respect of one who is Forbidden to benefit from a priest if you say that they are our agents, surely he the priest benefits him by offering up his sacrifices, hence it is prohibited. But if you say that they are the agents of the all merciful, it is permitted. What then is the ruling come and here we learned he may offer up for him the bird sacrifices, etc. Now if you say that they are our agents, does he not benefit him? Then on your view, let him the tana teach he may offer up sacrifices for him. But those who lack atonement are different for our Yohanan said all sacrifices require the owner's consent, save for those lacking atonement, since a man brings a sacrifice for his sons and daughters when minors, for it is said this is the law of him that hath issue implying both for a minor or an adult. If so, according to our Yohanan, does this is the law for her that hath born a male or a female imply both an adult or a minor is a minor capable of childbirth, but our BB recited in our Naman's presence three. Women use a reservant to prevent conception a minor a pregnant woman and a woman giving suck a minor lest she conceive and die that verse this is the law for her that hath born teaches that it is a one whether the woman be sane or an imbecile since one must offer a sacrifice for his wife if an imbecile in accordance with our Judas dictum for it was taught our Judas said a man must offer a rich man's sacrifice for his wife and all other sacrifices which are incumbent upon her since he writes thus for her in her marriage settlement I shall pay every claim you may have against me from before up to now Talmud, Mas Nedarim may Arsimi be ab objected if he the matter is a priest he may sprinkle for him the blood of his sin offering and his guilt offering this refers to the blood of a leper sin offering and of a leper's guilt offering who lack atonement as it is written this shall be the law of a leper both an adult and a minor we learned if priests render a sacrifice Pickle in the temple and do so intentionally they are liable this implies that if they do so unwittingly they are exempt though it was taught thereon yet their pickle stands now it is well if you say that they are the agents of the all merciful hence their pickle stands but if you say that they are our agents why is it so let him say to him I appointed you an agent for my advantage not for my hurt I will tell you pickle is different because the writ saith neither shall it be imputed unto him. Implying that it is pickle in spite of everything the above text states are Yohan and said all require the owner's consent save for those lacking atonement since one brings a sacrifice for his sons and daughters when minors if so let one offer a sin offering on behalf of his neighbor for eating hellab since one brings a sin offering for his insane wife why then did our Eliezer say if a man set aside a sin offering for hellab on his neighbor's behalf his action is invalid now consider. In respect to his insane wife, what are the circumstances if she ate hellab whilst insane? She is not liable to a sacrifice while if she ate it when sane subsequently becoming insane. There is the ruling of our Jeremiah who said in the name of our Abba in our Yohanan's name if a man ate hellab set aside an offering became insane and then regained his sanity if the sacrifice is unfit having been once rejected it remains so yet if so a man should be able to offer the Passover sacrifice for his neighbor since he brings it for his sons and daughters who are minors why then did our Eliezer say if a man sets aside a Passover sacrifice for his neighbor his action is null set our the law and they shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers a lamb for a house is not biblically incumbent upon minors and how do we know this because we learned if a man says to his sons who are not of age I will slaughter the Passover sacrifice for whomever of you. First enters Jerusalem, then as soon as the first of them enters with his head and the greater part of his body, he acquires his portion and assigns a part thereof to his brothers with him. Now, if you maintain that a lamb according to the house of their fathers is biblically applicable to minors, then standing over the flesh can he transfer a portion to his brethren? If so, why did their fathers speak thus to them in order to stimulate them in the performance of precepts? It was taught likewise. It once happened after their father had spoken thus that the daughters entered the city before the sons, so that the daughters chewed themselves zealous and the sons indolent. He may separate his terima, etc. Talmud, Mas Nedarim be the scholars propounded. If one gives terima of his own for his neighbor's produce, does he require his consent or not? Do we say since it is a benefit for him, his consent is unnecessary, or perhaps the privilege of performing the precept is his and he prefers to? Perform it himself, come and here he may separate his terima and his tithes with his consent. How is this meant? Shall we say his own corn is used then with whose consent if with his own who appointed him an agent? But if it means with the owner's consent, does he not benefit him by acting as his agent? Hence it must mean that he separates his own, i.e., the matters produced for the owner's now with whose consent if with the owner's does he not benefit him? Hence it must mean with his own knowledge. Without informing the owner now, if you say that he requires his consent, does he not
Where the teaching of scripture is remunerated but not that of Midrash how state this definitely Talmud, Mas Nedarim he Tana informs us this that even where a fee is taken it may be accepted only for scripture but not for Midrash now why does Midrash differ that remuneration is forbidden because it is written and the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you and it is also written behold I have taught you statutes and judgments even as the Lord my God commanded me just as I taught. You gratuitously so you must teach gratuitously then should not scripture to be unremunerated Rav said the fee is for guarding the children are you and maintain the fee is for the teaching of accentuation we learned he may not teach him scripture now that is well on the view that remuneration is for the teaching of accentuation but on the view that payment is for acting as guardian does an adult need one it refers to a child if so consider the last clause but he may teach scripture to his sons can a child have children it is defective and teaches us he may not teach him scripture in the case of a minor but if he is an adult he may teach scripture both to him and his sons an objection is raised children are not to study a new portion of bible on the sabbath but they may make a first revision on the sabbath this is well on the view that remuneration is for the teaching of accentuation hence a passage may not be read for the first time on the sabbath but on the view that payment is for acting as guardian why is it forbidden to teach a passage for the first time on the sabbath yet permitted to give a first revision on the sabbath surely there is pay for guardianship while the sabbath now even according to your reasoning is remuneration for teaching the accentuation on the sabbath forbidden is it not included in the weekly or monthly fee which is permitted for it was taught if one engages a day laborer to look after a child or the heifer or to watch over the crops he may not pay him for the sabbath therefore talmud mas nettering b if they are lost or harmed on the sabbath he is not responsible but if he was engaged by the week month year or septenna he is paid for the sabbath consequently if they are lost he is responsible but in the matter of the sabbath a new passage may not be studied for the first time for this reason that the parents of the children may be free for the observance of the sabbath an alternative answer is this because on the sabbath they eat and drink more than on weekdays and feel sluggish as Samuel said the change in one's regular diet is the beginning of digestive trouble now he who maintains that remuneration is for the teaching of accentuation why does he reject the view that it is for acting as guardian he reasons two daughters then need guarding and he who maintains that the fee is for guardianship why does he reject the view that it is for teaching accents he holds that accents are also biblical for R.I.K.A.B. Abin said in the name of our handle in Rab's name what is the meaning of and they read in the book in the law of God distinctly and they gave the sense so that they understood the reading they read in the book at the law of God refers to scripture distinctly to Targum and they gave the sense to the division of sentences so that they understood the reading to the accentuation others say to the Maso Roth or Isaac said the textual reading is transmitted by the sofa in their stylistic embellishments. Words read in the text but not written and words written but omitted in the reading are all halacha from Moses at Sinai by textual reading is meant words as Eres Shami Mizraim stylistic embellishments e.g. and comfort ye your hearts after that ye shall pass on let the damsel abide with it a few days at least ten after that she shall go avenge the children of Israel of the Midianites afterwards shalt thou be gathered unto thy people the singers went before the players on. Instruments followed after thy righteousness is like the great mountains words read in the text but not written the word Euphrates in the verse as he went to recover his border at the river Euphrates the word man in the verse and the council of Ahitophel was as if a man had inquired of the oracle of God the word come in the verse behold the days come set the Lord the city shall be built etc for it in the verse let there be no escape for it unto me in the verse. All that thou sayest unto me I will do to me in the verse and she went down unto the floor to me in the verse and she said these six measures of barley gave he unto me for he said to me all these words are read but not written the following are written but not read the word pray and forgive Talmud, Mas Nedarim of these and now these are the commandments let him bend in against him that bendeth let him bend above five and end on the south side four thousand and five five hundred. If in it is time that if I am then your kinsman the foregoing are written but not read Arahabi Ahabi said in the west i.e. Palestine the following verses divided into three verses viz and the Lord said unto Moses lo I come unto thee in a thick cloud etc. Arhamab Arhanana said Moses became wealthy but from the chippings of the tablets for it is written hew the two tablets of stone like unto the first their chips be thine Arhose son of Arhanana said the Torah was given only to Moses and his. See for it is written rightly these words and hew thee just as the chips are thine so is the writing thine but Moses in his generosity gave it to Israel and concerning him it is said he that hath a bountiful I shall be blessed etc. Are his dog objected and the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments he commanded me and I passed it unto you a further objection behold I have taught you statutes and judgments even as the Lord my God commanded me he commanded me. And I taught you now therefore write the song for you this refers to the song alone that the song be a witness for thee against the children of Israel but only the scripture dialectics were given to Moses alone are Yohan and said the Holy One blessed be he causes his divine presence to rest only upon him who is strong wealthy wise and meek and all these qualifications are deduced from Moses strong for it is written and he spread abroad the tent over the tabernacle and the master said Moses. Our teacher spread it and it is also written ten cubits shall be the length of the board yet perhaps it was long and thin but it is derived from this verse and I took the two tables and cast them out of my two hands and broke them now it was taught the tables were six hand breadths in length six in breadth and three in thickness wealthy as it is written he interpreted the ships be thine wise for Rab and Samuel both said fifty gates of understanding were created in the world and all but one were given to Moses for it is said for thou hast made him as see Moses a little lower than God meek for it is written now the man Moses was very meek are you and said all the prophets were wealthy once do we derive this from Moses Samuel Amos and Jonah Moses because it is written I have not taken one ass from them now if he meant without a hiring fee did he then merely claim not to be one of those who take without a fee he must hence have meant even with a fee but perhaps it was because of his poverty but it is derived from the verse Hugh the etc the ships be thine Samuel because it is written behold here I am witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed whose ox have I taken or whose ass have I taken now if he meant for nothing did he then merely claim not to be one of those who take without payment hence he must have meant even for payment but perhaps it was due to poverty rather from this verse and his return was to Ramah for there was his house. Whereupon Rabbah observed wherever he went his house went with him Rabbah said a greater thing is said of Samuel than of Moses for in the case of Moses it is stated I have not taken one ass from them implying even for a fee but in the case of Samuel he did not hire it even with their consent for it is written and they said thou hast not defrauded us nor taken advantage of our willingness Amos because it is written then answered Amos and said to Amaziah I was no prophet neither was I a prophet's son. But I was a herdman and a gatherer of sycamore fruit which are Joseph translated behold I am the owner of flocks and possess sycamore trees in the valley Jonah as it is written and he found a ship going to Tarshish so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it and Aryohanan observed he paid for the hire of the whole ship our Roman said the hire of the ship was four thousand gold denarii Aryohanan also said at first Moses used to study the Torah and forget it until it was given to him as a gift for it is said and he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him two tables of testimony mission and he may support his wife and children though he the mother is liable for their maintenance but he may not feed his beast whether clean or unclean our Eliezer said he may feed an unclean beast of his but not a clean one day the sages said to him what is the difference between an unclean and a clean beast he replied to them the life of a clean beast belongs to Heaven but the body is his own but an unclean animal Talmud, Mas Nedarim be belongs body and life to heaven said they to him the life of an unclean beast too belongs to heaven and the body is his for if he wishes he can sell it to a heathen or feed dogs with it. Gemara Isaac Behan and I said in Arhunah's name he who is under a vow not to benefit from his neighbor may give him his daughter in marriage. Arzera pondered thereon what are the circumstances if the property of the bride's father is forbidden to the bridegroom is he not giving him a servant to serve him if again the bridegroom's property is forbidden to the father of the bride but even a greater thing was said he may support his wife and children though he the mother is liable for their maintenance then you say he may give him his daughter in
Forbidden to benefit from his neighbor and he pays him a visit in sickness he must stand but not sit he may afford him a cure of life but not a cure of money Talmud, Mas Nedarim Gemara What are the circumstances if the visitor's property is forbidden to the invalid he may even sit whilst if the invalid's property is forbidden to the visitor he may not even stand said Samuel in truth it means that the visitor's property is forbidden to the invalid and applies to a place where a fee is received for sitting with an invalid but not for standing how state this definitely he the Tana teaches us thus that even where it is customary to take a fee for visiting one may receive it only for sitting but not for standing an alternative answer is this just as our Simeon maintained elsewhere that it is feared that he may tarry a long time whilst standing so here too it is feared that he may stay a long time if he sits Allah said after all it means that the invalid's property is Forbidden to the visitor for he did not vow where it affects his health if so he may sit too because he can stand an objection is raised if he fell sick he may enter to visit him if his son became ill he may inquire after his health in the street now this is well according to Allah who maintains that it means that the invalid's property is forbidden to the visitor for he did not vow where it affects his own health but on Samuel's explanation that the visitor's property is forbidden to the invalid what is the difference between himself and his son he can answer you our mission means that the invalid may not benefit from the visitor in the burial of the case is reversed how state this definitely said Rabbi Talmud, Mas Nedarim B our mission presents a difficulty to Samuel why particularly teach that he may stand but not sit hence it must refer to a case where the invalid is forbidden to benefit from his visitor Rush Lakish said where is visiting the sick indicated in the Torah in the verse if these men die the common death of all men or if they be visited after the visitation of all men etc. How is it implied? Rabbah answered the verse means this if these men die the common death of all men who lie sick a bed and men come in and visit them what will people say the Lord hath not sent me for this task Rabbah expounded but if the Lord make a new thing if the Gehenna is already created tis well if not let the Lord create it but that is not so for it was taught seven things. Were created before the world is the Torah repentance the garden of Eden Gehenna the throne of glory the temple and the name of the Messiah the Torah for it is written the Lord possessed me as see the Torah in the beginning of his way before his works of old repentance for it is written before the mountains were brought forth or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world thou turnest man to destruction and sayest repent yes sons of men the garden of Eden as it is written and the Lord God. Planted a garden in Eden from aforetime again as it is written for Tophet is ordained of old the throne of glory as it is written thy throne is established from of old the temple as it is written the glorious high throne from the beginning is the place of our sanctuary the name of the Messiah as it is written his name S.C. of Messiah shall endure forever and has existed before the sun but Moses said thus if a mouth has already been created for it S.C. again it is well if not let the Lord create one but is it not written there is no new thing under the sun he said thus if the mouth is not near to the spot let it draw near Rabbah or as others say our eyes lectured what is meant by the sun and the moon stood still in their zebel what were they doing in the zebel seeing that they were set in the Rakiyah this teaches that the sun and the moon ascended from the Rakiyah to the zebel and exclaimed before him sovereign of the universe if thou wilt execute judgment for a room sun we will Give forth our light if not we will not shine in that moment he shot spears and arrows at them every day he rebuked them and worship you and yet you give your life for my honor you do not protest yet you protest for the honor of flesh and blood since then spears and arrows are shot at them every day before they consent to shine as it is written and at the light of thy arrows they go etc it was taught there is no measure for visiting the sick what is meant by there is no measure for visiting the sick our joseph thought to explain it its reward is unlimited said abay to him is there a definite measure of reward for any precept but we learn be as heedful of a light precept as of a serious one for thou knowest not the grant of reward for precepts but abay explained it even a great person must visit a humble one rabbi said one must visit even a hundred times a day our abba son of our hand said he who visits an invalid takes away a sixtieth of his pain said they to him if so let sixty people visit him and restore him to health. He replied, The sixtieth is as the tenth spoken of in the school of Rabbi, and providing further that he the visitor is of his affinity. For it was taught, Rabbi said, A daughter who enjoys maintenance from her brother's estate receives a tenth of the estate. Said they to Rabbi, If so, if a man leaves ten daughters and one son, the latter receives nothing. He replied, The first to marry receives a tenth of the estate, the second a tenth of it. Residue, the third a tenth of what remains now. If they all married at the same time, they redivide equally. Our helbo fell ill thereupon. Our Kahana went and proclaimed Talmud. Mas Nedarim, our helbo is sick, but none visited him. He rebuked the Messiah, the scholar, saying, Did it not once happen that one of our Akiba's disciples fell sick and the sages did not visit him? So our Akiba himself entered his house to visit him, and because they swept and sprinkled the ground before him, he recovered. My master said, he who have revived me straightway our Akiba went forth and lectured he who does not visit the sick is like a shedder of blood when Ardimi came he said he who visits the sick causes him to live whilst he who does not causes him to die how does he cause this shall we say that he who visits the sick prays that he may live whilst he who does not praise that he should die that he should die can you really think so but say thus he who does not visit the sick prays neither that he may live nor die whenever Rabba fell sick on the first day he would ask that his sickness should not be made known to anyone lest his fortune be impaired but after that he said to them his servants go proclaim my illness in the marketplace so that whoever is my enemy may rejoice and it is written rejoice not when thine enemy falleth lest the Lord see it and it displeases him and he turned away his wrath from him whilst he who loves me will pray for me Rab said he who visits the sick will be delivered from the punishments of Gehenna for it is written blessed is he that considereth the poor the Lord will deliver him in the day of evil the poor Dal means none but the sick as it is written he will cut me off from pining sickness me Dal or from this verse why art thou so poorly Dal thou son of the king whilst evil refers to Gehenna for it is written the Lord hath made all things for himself yet even the wicked for the day of evil now if one does visit what is his reward you ask what is his reward even as hath been said he will be delivered from the punishment of Gehenna but what is his reward in this world the Lord will preserve him and keep him alive and he shall be blessed upon the earth and thou wilt not deliver him unto the will of his enemies the Lord will preserve him from the evil urge and keep him alive saving him from sufferings and he shall be blessed upon the earth that all will take pride in him and the will not deliver him unto the will of his enemies that he may procure friends like Naaman's who healed his leprosy and not chance upon friends like Rehoboam's who divided his kingdom and was taught our Simeon B. Eliezer said if the young tell you to build and the old to destroy hearken to the elders but hearken not to the young for the building of youth is destruction whilst the destruction of the old is building and a sign for the matter is Rehoboam the son of Solomon Arshish son of Aridi said one should not visit the sick during the first three or the last three hours of the day lest either by omit to pray for him during the first three hours of the day as the invalid's illness is alleviated in the last three hours his sickness is most virulent Rabin said in Rab's name whence do we know that the Almighty sustains the sick from the verse the Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing Rabin also said in Rab's name whence do we know that the divine presence rests above an invalid's bed from the verse the Lord doth said himself upon the bed of languishing it was taught likewise he who visits the sick must not sit upon the bed or on a stool or a chair but must reverently robe himself and sit upon the ground because the divine presence rests above an invalid's bed as it is written the Lord doth set himself upon the bed of languishing Rabin also said in Rab's name the swelling of the Euphrates testifies abundantly to rain in the west now he disagrees with Samuel who said a river increases in volume from its bed now Samuel is self-contradictory for Samuel said running water does not purify Talmud Mas Nedarim be except the Euphrates in Tishri Samuel's father made me quail for his daughters in Nisan and had met set for them in the days of Tishri RM I said in Rab's name what is meant by the verse therefore thou son of man prepare thee stuff for removing this is a lamp plate and Talmud Mas Nedarim a rug and thou shalt serve thine enemies in want of all things RM I said in Rab's name this means without a lamp or table are his said without a wife are she's hate said without an attendant are nom and said without knowledge attended taught without salt or fat
them himself so Arhai went and learned them from the fuller and then repeated these before Rabbi when Rabbi met him he said to him thou hast taught both Arhai and myself others say that he spoke thus to him thou hast taught Arhai and he has taught me our Alexandria also said in the name of Arhai be Abba greater is the miracle wrought for the sick than for Hanani missile and Ezra for that of Hanani missile and Ezra concerned a fire kindled by man which all can extinguish whilst that of a sick person is in connection with the heavenly fire and who can extinguish that our Alexandria also said in the name of Arhai be Abba others state our Joshua Belie by said when a man's end has come all have dominion over him for it is written and it will be that whosoever findeth me will slay me Rab deduced it from this verse they stand forth the stage receive thy judgments for all are thy servants Rabbi Bishila was told that a tall man had died now it happened thus this man was Riding on a little mule, and when he came to a bridge, the mule shied and threw the man, and he was killed thereupon. Rabbi applied to him the verse, They stand forth the stage to receive thy judgments, etc. Samuel saw a scorpion born by a frog across a river, and then stung a man so that he died thereupon. Samuel quoted, They stand forth the stage to receive thy judgments, etc. Samuel said, Only a sick person who is feverish may be visited. What does this exclude? It excludes those concerning whom it has been taught by our Jose. Be part in our Eliezer's name, is one must not visit those suffering with bowel trouble or with eye disease or from headaches. Now the first is well the reason being through embarrassment, but what is the reason of the other two on account of Rab Judas dictum? This speech is injurious to the eyes and to people suffering from headaches. Rabbi said, Feverishness were it not a forerunner of the angel of death, it would be a salutary Talmud. Moss nettering be once in thirty days as Thorns which surround and protect the palm tree and as theriac to the body are nomin b. Isaac said I want neither it nor its theriac. Rabbi B. Jonathan said in R. G. Hiles name arson is beneficial for healing the sick. What is arson said R. Jonathan old peeled barley which sticks to the seed. Abbe observed they require boiling as the flesh of an ox. R. Joseph said it is fine barley flour which sticks to the seed. Whereupon Abbe remarked it needs as much boiling as the flesh of an ox. R. Yohanan said we must not visit one afflicted with Burdam nor mention its real name. What is the reason R. Eliezer said because it is like a gushing well. R. Eliezer also said why is it called Burdam because it is a gushing well. The latter may afford him a cure of life but not a cure of money. What does this mean? Shall we say that a cure of life means without payment and a cure of money is for a fee? Then let him the tent estate he may heal him without payment but not for a fee but by a cure of life is own person is meant whilst the cure of money refers to his cattle. Arzitra Bitopia said in Rab's name, nevertheless, he may tell him this drug is beneficial for it, that drug is injurious for it. Mishnah, he may bathe together with him in a large bath, but not in a small one. He may sleep in a bed with him. Or Judah said, only in summer, but not in winter, because he thereby benefits him. He may recline on a couch or eat at the same table with him, but not out of the same dish, but he may dine with him out of a bowl which returns him. Or it was taught he may not bathe together with him in a bath or sleep in a bed with him, whether large or small. This is our Meir's ruling. Or Judah said, a large one in winter and a small one in summer are permitted. He may bathe with him in a large bath and may take a higher bath with him, even in a small one. He may recline on a couch with him and eat at the same table, but not out of the same dish, yet he may eat out of the same bowl that returns. Or Jose B. Hanana said. That means the bowl that returns to the host Mishnah he may not eat with him out of the bowl put before workmen nor may he work with him on the same furrow this is Armeir's view but the sages say he may work provided he is at a distance Amara there is no dispute at all that they may not work near each other they differ only in reference to working at a distance Armeir maintains we forbid at a distance as a preventive measure on account of nearby for he the matter softens the ground. Before him while the rabbis hold we do not enact a preventive measure Talmud, Mas Netarim Mishnah he who is forbidden by vow to benefit from his neighbor if the vow was imposed before the seventh year may not enter his field in the seventh year nor take of the overhanging fruit but if the vow was imposed in the seventh year he may not enter his field but may eat of the overhanging branches if he was merely forbidden in respect of food but not all benefit and the vow was imposed. Before the seventh year he may enter his field but may not eat of its fruits but if it was imposed in the seventh year he may enter his field and eat of its fruits. Imara Rab and Samuel both ruled if one says to his neighbor this my property be forbidden to you if he vowed before the seventh year he may not enter his field or take of the overhanging fruits even when the seventh year arrives but if he vowed in the seventh year he may not enter his field yet may enjoy the overhanging fruits are Yohanan and Reshlehish both maintained if one says to his neighbor this my property be forbidden to you if he vowed before the seventh year he may neither enter his field nor eat of the overhanging fruits when the seventh year arrives he may not enter his field yet may eat of the overhanging fruits shall we say that they differ in this Rab and Samuel hold that a man can prohibit unto others that which is in his ownership for the prohibition to be effective. Even after it passes out of his ownership, whilst our Yohanan and Reshlehish maintain one cannot prohibit unto others that which is in his ownership for the prohibition to continue even after it leaves his ownership. Now can you reason so? Does anyone rule that a person cannot declare prohibited that which is his even after it passes out of his ownership? If so, let them differ with reference to this property be forbidden, etc. And how much more so would it apply to this my property? Moreover, we have learned that a person can declare prohibited that which is in his ownership for even after it leaves his ownership. For we learned if one says to his son Konam, if you benefit from me, if he dies, he inherits him. But if he explicitly stipulates during his lifetime and after his death, Talmud, Mas Netarim B, if he dies, he does not succeed him. Here it is different because he explicitly stated during his lifetime and after his death, yet at all events there is a difficulty, but explain it. Dispute thus there is no dispute at all in respect of this property etc. They differ only in respect of my property etc. Rab and Samuel maintain there is no difference between this property or my property one can prohibit for all time but are Yohanan and Reshlehish maintain by saying this property he can prohibit my property he cannot prohibit but does anyone maintain that there is no difference between this property and my property but we learned if one says to his neighbor Konam if I enter your house or if I purchase your field and then the owner dies or sells it he is permitted to enter or buy it but if he says Konam if I enter this house or if I purchase this field and the owner dies or sells it he is forbidden but explain thus are Yohanan and Reshlehish refer to my property Rab and Samuel to this property and they do not differ but if the vow was imposed in the seventh year he may not enter his field etc. Why may he eat of the overhanging fruits because they are now ownerless, but the land too is ownerless. Edula, this refers to trees standing on the border. Our Simeon Beliakim said it is forbidden lest he stand and linger there. Mishnah, he who is forbidden by vow to benefit from his neighbor may neither lend to him nor borrow from him nor advance him or receive from him alone. He may neither sell to nor purchase from him. Talmud, Mas Netarim Gemara, as for he must not lend to him that is well since he thereby benefits him, but he must not borrow from him. How does he benefit him? Further, even he must not receive a loan from him and he must not purchase from him or well since he the Madar may benefit, but he must not borrow from him. How does he the Madar benefit? Said our Jose, son of Arhanan, it means e.g. that they made a vow not to benefit from one another. Abbe answered, he is forbidden to borrow lest he also lend, and the same applies to the other clauses. Mishnah, if one says to another, lend me your cow to which the other. Replies it is not free whereupon he exclaims Konam if I ever plow my field with it if he generally plowed himself he is forbidden but others are permitted but if he did not generally plow himself he and all men are forbidden if one is forbidden by vow to benefit from his neighbor and he has not to eat he the matter can go to the shopkeeper and say so and so is forbidden by vow to benefit from me and I do not know what to do the shopkeeper may then supply him and come and receive payment from him the matter if he had his mother's house to build or his fence to erect or his field to repeat the matter may go to laborers and say so and so is forbidden by vow to benefit from me and I do not know what to do thereupon they work for him the mother and come and receive wages from him the matter if they are walking together on the road and he the mother has nothing to eat he the matter can make a gift to a third person and he the mother is Permitted
thereof whether by himself or by a stranger he can retract but if it has already been acquired by himself or by a stranger he cannot retract must we assume that the first clause agrees with the rabbis and the second with our Jose said well the second clause too agrees with the rabbis if so why before possession has been taken thereof whether by himself or by a stranger he can retract after for a year or a septenate is different being unusual Rush Lakish said since the second clause agrees with our Jose the first two must agree with him but this is the reason of the first clause that the law of Hefker may not be forgotten if so let it be Hefker even from the first day said rabbi this is on account of evaders who may declare their property Hefker and then reacquire it will you maintain that by biblical law it is not Hefker Talmud Mas Netarim B but perhaps he will come to tithe from produce that is liable for produce that is exempt or vice versa he is told when you tithe tithe for it out of itself an objection is raised if a man declares his vineyard Hefker and rises early on the following morning and vintages it he is liable to parrot all the forgotten sheep and P.E.O. but he is exempt from tithe now as for all it is well it states the rabbinic law and states the biblical law but on the view of Rush Lakish why is he free from tithe he answers you thus my statement is based on our Jose whilst this accords with the rabbis Talmud Mas Netarim A Alternatively, one case refers to Hefker declared in the presence of two, the other if declared before three, for our Yohan and said in the name of our Simeon Bij Jose that Hefker declared in the presence of three is valid but not in the presence of two, our Joshua B. Levi said by the Torah it is Hefker even if declared in the presence of one, why then are three required so that one can take possession and the other two attested Talmud, Mas Netarim B. C. H. A. P. T. E. R. B. Mishnah if two joint owners made a vow. Not to benefit from one another they may not enter the courtyard, our Eliza B. Jacob said each enters into his own Talmud, Mas Netarim A. and both are forbidden to set up a millstone or an oven or breed fowls therein if only one was forbidden by vow to benefit from the other he may not enter the court, our Eliza B. Jacob said he can maintain I am entering into my own not into yours he who thus vowed is forced to sell his share of the court if a man from the street was forbidden by vow to benefit from one of them he may not enter the court our Eliza B. Jacob said he can maintain I enter your neighbor's portion and I do not enter into yours if one is forbidden by vow to benefit from his neighbor and the latter possesses a bathhouse or an olive press leased to someone in the town and he has an interest therein he the mother is forbidden to make use of them if not he is permitted if a man says to his neighbor Konam if I enter your house or if I purchase your field and then the owner dies or sells it to another he is permitted to enter or buy it but if he says Konam if I enter this house or if I purchase this field and the owner dies or sells it to another he is forbidden Gamar the scholars propounded they differ when they interdicted themselves by vow but what if each imposed a vow upon the other do we say they differ only in the former case but that in the latter the rabbis agree with our Eliza B. Jacob since they are involuntarily prohibited or perhaps the rabbis dispute even in the latter case come and here if only one was forbidden by vow to benefit from the other and the rabbis dispute it learn forbade himself from his neighbor this is logical too for the second clause states now he who thus vowed is forced to sell his share of the court now this is reasonable if the vow was self-imposed hence he is compelled but if you say that a vow was imposed against him why is he compelled seeing that the position is not of his making rabbi said in tiri's name talmud mas netarim be the dispute is only if the court is large enough to be divided but if not all agree that they are permitted said our joseph to him but what of a synagogue which is as a thing which cannot be divided yet we learn both are forbidden the use of the common property of the town but said our joseph in tiri's name the controversy is only when it is not large enough to divide but if it is all agree that both are forbidden Arhuna said the halacha. Is as our Eliza B. Jacob and our Eliezer said likewise the Halachah is as our Eliza B. Jacob if one is forbidden by vow to benefit from his neighbor and the latter possesses a bathhouse etc. How much is meant by an interest therein our Naman said a half or a quarter but not less Abbe said even for less he is forbidden under what conditions is he permitted if he the less he rents it in return for the payment of the land tax Talmud, Mas Netarim if one says to his neighbor etc. Abami. Propounded what if one says to his neighbor Konam if you enter this house and then he sells it or dies can one prohibit that which he owns for the prohibition to be effective even when it leaves his ownership or not said Rabbi come and here if one says to his son Konam that you benefit not from me and he dies he is his heir but if he explicitly stipulates during his lifetime and he dies he does not succeed him this proves that one can prohibit that which he owns for the prohibition to. Hold good when it leaves his ownership the proof is conclusive we learned elsewhere if one says Konam be these fruits to me or be they Konam from my mouth or be they Konam to my mouth he is forbidden to benefit from what has been exchanged for them or grown from them Rami Bihama propounded if he vows Konam be these fruits to so and so what of their exchange do we say with respect to oneself since he can forbid to himself even his neighbor's property he can likewise forbid to himself what is not yet in existence but as for his neighbor since one cannot prohibit another's produce to his neighbor he likewise cannot prohibit what is not existent Talmud, Mas Netarim B or perhaps since what is taken in exchange is the same as what grows from its seed there is no difference between oneself and his neighbor said Arahabi Menumi come and here if a man says to his wife Konam if I benefit thee she may borrow money and the creditors come and exact it from him why can the creditors Collected from him surely because what is taken in exchange is not the same as what grows from them said Rabba possibly it is forbidden to make an exchange in the first place only but if it has been done it is valid but come and here if a man betrothes a woman with Orla she is not betrothed but if he sells it and betrothes her with the money thereof she is betrothed no here too it may be forbidden in the first place only but if done it is valid mission if a man says to his neighbor I am her to you the mother is forbidden to derive benefit you are her to me the matter is forbidden I am her to you and you are her to me both are prohibited both are permitted to enjoy the use of those things which belong to those who came up from Babylon to Palestine but are forbidden the use of things that belong to that town Talmud Mas Netarim and now what are the things that belong to them that came up from Babylon e.g. the temple mount the courts of the temple and the well on the mid road, what are the things that belong to that town? E.g., the public square, the bathhouse, the synagogue, the ark in which the sacred scrolls were kept, and the books of the law, and the estate of him who assigns his portion to the Nasai. Our Judah said it is the same whether he assigns it to the Nasai or to a private individual. But what is the difference if he assigns it to the Nasai? He need not formally confer title, whilst in the case of an individual, it is necessary to confer title. But the sages maintain formal grant of title is necessary in both cases. They mention the Nasai in particular, as this is usual. Our Judah said the Galileans need not assign their portion because their ancestors have already done so for them. Why is it forbidden? Said Arshis, hate the Mishnah teaches us how can they repair their position? Let them assign their portion to the Nasai. Our Judah said the Galileans need not assign their portion because their ancestors have already done so for them. It was taught our Judah said the Galileans were quarrelsome and want to make vows not to benefit from each other so their fathers arose and assigned their portions to the Nasai Mishnah if one is forbidden by vow to benefit from his neighbor and has nothing to eat the latter can give it food to a third party and the former is permitted to use it it happened to one in Beth Haran that his father was forbidden to benefit from him now he the son was giving his son in marriage so he said to his neighbor the courtyard and the banquet be a gift to you but they are yours only that my father may come and feast with us at the banquet thereupon he answered if they are mine let them be consecrated to heaven but I did not give you my property to consecrate it to heaven he protested you gave me your so that you and your father might eat and drink together and become reconciled to one another whilst the sin of a broken vow should devolve upon his head he retorted when the matter came before the sages they ruled every gift which is not so given that if he the recipient consecrates it it is consecrated is no gift at all Gemara does the mission a story to contradict its ruling the text is defective and was thus taught but if the end proves his intention at the beginning it is forbidden and so it happened in Beth Haran in the case of one whose last action demonstrated his first as a mere evasion Rabbah said that the sages taught that it is forbidden only if he said they are yours only in order that my father may come etc but if he said they are yours so that my father may
Haran was a case of acquire in order to give possession yet it was invalid sometimes he answered because his banquet proves his intention sometimes he answered this is taught in accordance with our Eliezer who maintained that even the extra given by the vendor to a customer is forbidden to one who is interdicted by vow to benefit we learned the sages ruled every gift which is not so given that if he the beneficiary consecrates it it is consecrated it is not a gift at all now what does every include surely it includes such as this case of stealing flax no it includes the case of the second version of Rabba's ruling Talmud Mas Nedari may see HAPTERV I Mishnah he who vows not to eat what is cooked Mabushal is permitted what is roasted or seated if he says Konam that I taste any cooked dish Tabshil he is forbidden to eat food loosely cooked in a pot but is permitted to partake of what is solidly prepared he may also eat hard boiled egg and remuse and cucumbers he who vows abstinence from food prepared in a pot is forbidden only boiled dishes but if he says Konam that I taste not whatever descends into a pot he is forbidden everything prepared in a pot Gemara it was taught our Josiah forbids them and though there is no proof of this there is some indication for it is said and they boiled the Passover in fire according to the law shall we say that they differ in this that our Josiah holds follow biblical usage whilst Artana maintains in vows follow it. Popular usage No all agree that in vows we must follow popular usage but each rules according to the usage in his district in the district of Artana roast is called roast and cooked cooked but in our Josiah's even roast is called cooked but he adduces a verse that is a mere support if he says Konam that I taste not any cooked dish tabjil but he vowed abstinence from a tabjil said Abathus Tana designates everything with which bread is eaten a tabjil and it was taught. Likewise he who vows abstinence from a tabjil is forbidden all cooked food tabjil and whatsoever is roasted seated or boiled he is also forbidden soft preserves of gourds with which the sick eat their bread but this is not so for our Jeremiah felsic when the doctor called to heal him he saw a pumpkin lying in the house thereupon he left the house saying the angel of death is in that house yet I am to cure him that is no difficulty the former refers to soft preserves the latter to heart. Rabbi Biola said the latter refers to the pumpkin itself, the former to its inner contents. For Rabbi Judah said the soft part of a pumpkin should be eaten with beet, the soft part of linseed is good with kutah, but this may not be told to the ignorant. Rabbi said by the six scholars are meant this agrees with another dictum of his. For Rabbi said Talmud, Mas Nedarim B, in accordance with whom is it that we pray for the invalid and the sick in accordance with our Jose, since he said the invalid and the sick. It follows that invalid is literal and the sick metaphorically means the rabbis, but is permitted to partake of a dish solidly prepared. Our Mishnah does not agree with the Babylonians. For our Zara said the Babylonians are fools eating bread with bread. Our Hisda said there is none to make inquiries of the Epicureans of Fusil how porridge is best eaten, whether we porridge with wheat and bread and the barley porridge with barley bread, or perhaps they are best reverse wheat with barley and Barley with wheat, Rabbi ate it with stunted parched grains. Rabbi son of Arhuna found Arhuna eating porridge with his fingers, so he said to him, Why do you eat with your hands? He replied, Thus did Rabbi say to eat porridge with one finger as well. How much more so with two or three? Rabbi said to his son, Hi, and Arhuna said the same to his son, Rabbi. If you are invited to eat porridge, you may even go a parasang for it to eat beef. Even three parasangs, Rabbi said to his son, Hi, and Arhuna said. Likewise to his son, Rabbi, you must never expect or eat before your teacher save after eating a pumpkin or porridge because they are likely pellets. Expect or eat this even in the presence of King Shippur, Arhuse, and Arjuna. One ate porridge with his fingers and one with the prick. He who was eating with the prick said to him, Who was eating with the fingers? How long will you make me eat your filth? The other replied, How long will you feed me with your saliva? Lesbian fix were placed before Arjuna. And Arsimi and Arjuda ate Arsimi and did not whereupon Arjuda asked him why are you sir not eating he replied these never pass out at all from the stomach but Arjuda retorted all the more reason or eating them as they will sustain us tomorrow Arjuda was sitting before Artarfan who remarked to him your face shines today he replied your servants went out to the fields yesterday and brought us beets which we ate unsalted had we salted them my face would have shown even more a certain matron. Said to Arjuda a teacher and drunkard he replied you may well believe me that I taste no wine but that of Kiddush and Havdalah and the four cups of Passover on account of which I have to bind my temples from Passover until Pentecost but a man's wisdom make this face shine a minute said to Arjuda your face is like that of a moneylender or pig breeder he replied both of these are forbidden to Jews but there are twenty four conveniences between my house and the school and every hour I visit one. Of them when Arjuda went to the Beth Hamidrash he used to take a pitcher on his shoulders to sit on saying great is labor for it honors the worker our Simeon used to carry a basket upon his shoulders saying likewise great is labor for it honors the worker our Judah's wife went out broad wool and made an embroidered cloak on going to market she used to put it on whilst when Arjuda went to synagogue to pray he used to wear it when he donned it he uttered the benediction blessed be he who hath robed me with a robe now it happened once that our Simeon Begamaliel proclaimed the fast but Arjuda did not attend the fast service being informed that he had nothing to wear he our Simeon Begamaliel sent him a robe which he did not accept Talmud Mas Nedarim lifting up the mat upon which he was sitting he exclaimed to the messenger see what I have here but I do not wish to benefit from this world the daughter of Cal Bishop he betrothed herself to our Akiba when her father heard thereof. He vowed that she was not to benefit from out of his property then she went and married him in winter they slept on straw and he had to pick out the straw from his hair if only I could afford it said he to her I would present you with a golden Jerusalem later Elijah came to them in the guise of a mortal and cried out at the door give us some straw for my wife is in confinement and I have nothing for her to lie on see our Akiba observed to his wife there is a man who lacks even straw. Subsequently she counseled him go and become a scholar so he left her and spent twelve years studying under our Elijah and our Joshua at the end of this period he was returning home when from the back of the house he heard a wicked man jeering at his wife your father did well to you firstly because he is your inferior and secondly he has abandoned you to living widowhood all these years she replied yet were he to hear my desires he would be absent another twelve years seeing that she has us. Given me permission, he said, I will go back. So he went back and was absent for another twelve years, at the end of which he returned with twenty four thousand disciples. Everyone flocked to welcome him, including her, his wife, too. But that wicked man said to her, And whither art thou going? A righteous man knoweth the life of his beast. She retorted, So she went to see him, but the disciples wished to repulse her, make way for her. He told them, For my learning and yours are hers when Calbishab gay. Heard thereof, he came before Arakiba and asked for the remission of his vow, and he annulled it for him from six incidents. Did Arakiba become rich? I from Calbishab gay, too, from a ship's ram, for every ship is provided with the figurehead of an animal. Once this a wooden ram was forgotten on the seashore, and Arakiba found it three from a hollowed out trunk, for he once gave for it to sailors and told them to bring him something that he needed, but they found only a hollow log on the sea. Sure, which they brought to him, saying, Sit on this and wait. It was found to be full of denarii, for it once happened that a ship sunk and all the treasures thereof were placed in that log, and it was found at that time four from a Syracuse to be from a matron, six Talmud, Mas Nedarim be the wife of Turnus, Rufus, six from Ketai B. Shalom, Argamid, gave four Zeus to sailors to bring him something, but as they could not obtain it, they brought him a monkey for it. The monkey escaped and made his way into a hole in searching for it. They found it lying on precious stones and brought them all to him. The emperor's daughter said to our Joshua, Behan and I such comely wisdom in an ugly vessel. He replied, Learn from thy father's palace in what is the wine stored in earthen jars. She answered, But all common people store wine in earthen vessels, and thou too likewise thou shouldst keep it in jars of gold and silver. So she went and had the wine replaced in vessels of gold and silver, and it turned sour. Thus said he to her, the Torah is likewise, but are there not handsome people who are learned to worthy ugly? They would be even more learned. He retorted, A certain woman of Nihartia came before Rab Judah for a lawsuit and was declared guilty by the court. Would your teacher Samuel have judged? Thus she said, Do you know him? And he asked, Yes, he is
Punishment would come upon the world so he said to Barkabra who was a humorist do not make me laugh and I will give you forty measures of wheat he replied but let the master see Talmud, Mas Netarim that I may take whatever measure I desire so he took a large basket pitched it over placed it on his head went to Rabbi and said to him fill me the forty measures of wheat which I may demand front you thereupon Rabbi burst into laughter and said to him did I not warn you not to jest eat? Replied I wish but to take the wheat which I may justly demand Barkabra once said to Rabbi's daughter tomorrow I will drink wine to your father's dancing and your mother singing Ben Elias a very wealthy man was Rabbi's son-in-law and he was invited to the wedding of Arsimian be Rabbi at the wedding Barkabra asked Rabbi what is meant by to have been now every explanation offered by Rabbi was refuted by him so he said to him explain it yourself he replied let your housewife come and fill me a cup she came and did so upon which he said to Rabbi rise and dance for me that I may tell it to you thus said the divine law to Abba to add Abba his second cup he asked him what is meant by Tebal he replied in the same manner as before until he remarked do something for me and I will tell you on his complying he said Tebal who means is there table and perfume in it the animal is intimacy there with sweeter than all other intimacies then he further questioned and what is meant by Simba do as before and I will tell you when he did so he said Simba means Zimaha now Ben Eliza could not endure all this so he and his wife left what is known of Ben Eliza it was taught Ben Eliza did not disperse his money for nothing but that he might achieve thereby the high priest's style of hairdressing as it is written they shall only pull their heads it was taught that means in the Lulian fashion what was the Lulian style Rab Judah said a unique style of hairdressing how is that Rabbah said the end of one row of hair reaching the roots of the other and such was the hairdressing fashion of the high priest and Ramusian cucumbers Del Adh Haramusa what is Del Adh Haramusa Samuel said carcass pumpkins are ashy said cucumbers baked in ashes Rabbah objected to our ashy Arniamai said Syrian cucumbers i.e. Egyptian cucumbers are kilim in respect of Greek and Ramusian cucumbers this refutation is unanswerable Mishnah he who vows abstinence from food prepared in a pot is forbidden only boiled dishes but if one says konam if I taste pot that descends into a pot he is forbidden everything prepared in a pot Amara it was taught he who vows abstinence from what goes into a boiling pot may not eat of what goes into a stew pot because it has already entered the boiling pot before going into the stew pot from what goes into a stew pot he may eat of what goes into a boiling pot from what is wholly prepared in a boiling pot he may eat of what is prepared in a stew pot from what is wholly prepared in a boiling pot he may eat what is partially prepared in a stew pot if he vows abstinence from what goes into an oven only bread is forbidden him but if he declares everything made in an oven be forbidden me he is forbidden everything that is made in an oven Talmud, Mas Netarim Bimishna if he vows abstinence from the preserve he is forbidden only preserved vegetables if he says konam if I taste preserve he is forbidden all preserves from the seed if he is forbidden only seeded meat konam if I taste seed if he is forbidden everything seeded Gemara Araha the son of Ara we ask Arashi if one said that which is preserved that which is roasted that which is salted what do these terms imply this remains a problem Mishnah if one vows abstinence from the roast he is forbidden only roast meat this is Arjuna's opinion konam if I taste roast he is forbidden to partake of all forms of roast from the salted he is Forbidden only salted fish conum if I tasted salted food he is forbidden to partake of everything preserved in salt conum if I taste fish or fishes he is forbidden to eat them both large and small salted and unsalted raw and cooked yet he may eat hashtarit brine and fish pickle he who vows abstinence from zahinat is forbidden hashtarit but may partake of brine and fish pickle he who vows abstinence from hashtarit may not partake of brine and fish pickle Gemara it was taught our Simeon B. Eliezer said if he vows conum if I taste fish day he is forbidden large ones but permitted small ones conum if I taste dagah he is forbidden small ones but permitted large ones conum if I taste dag and dagah he is forbidden both large and small ones are Papa said to Abbe how do we know that conum if I taste dag implies large ones only because it is written now the Lord had prepared a great fish dag to swallow up Jonah but is it not written and Jonah prayed Unto the Lord his God out of the fishes to God belly this is no difficulty perhaps he was vomited forth by the large fish and swallowed again by a smaller one but what of the verse and the fish to God that was in the river died did only the small fish die not the urge hence to God implies both large and small but in vows human speech is followed he who vows abstinence from Zion etc. Rabban asked Arashi what if one says Zion be forbidden me the problem remains Mishnah he who vows abstinence from milk may partake of curd but our Jose forbids it from curd he is permitted milk Abbas all said he who vows to abstain from cheese is interdicted therefrom whether salted or unsalted from meat Talmud, Mas Netarim he may partake of broth and the sediments of boiled meat but Arjuna forbids them Arjuna said it once happened that in such a case Arjarfan forbade us even eggs boiled therewith they replied that is so but only if he vows this meat be forbidden me for if he Vows to abstain from something and it is mixed up with another if it the forbidden food is sufficient to impart its taste to the other it is forbidden if he vows to abstain from wine he is permitted to fat food which contains the taste of wine but if he says konam if I taste this wine and it falls into food if it is sufficient to impart its taste to the food it is forbidden Talmud, Mas Netarim Bigamara but the following contradicts this if one vows abstinence from lentils lentil. Cakes are forbidden him our Jose permits then there is no difficulty each master rules according to the usage of his locality in that of the rabbi's milk is called milk and curd curd but in that of our Jose curd too is called curd of milk it was taught he who vows abstinence from milk is permitted curd from curd is permitted milk from milk is permitted cheese from cheese is permitted milk from broth is permitted meat sediment from meat sediment is permitted broth if he says this meat be. Forbidden me the meat itself, its broth and its sediment are forbidden him. If he vows to abstain from wine, he may partake of food which contains the taste of wine. But if he says conum that I taste not this wine and it falls into food, if the taste of wine is perceptible therein, it is forbidden. Mishnah he who vows abstinence from grapes is permitted wine from olives is permitted oil. If he says conum that I taste not these olives and grapes, both they and their juice are forbidden. Gemara Rambi. Hammer propounded is these essential or that I taste not essential. But if you can think that these is essential, why add that I taste not? He the Tana may teach this by the addition. Even if he says that I taste not yet, only if he declares these is he prohibited. But not otherwise. Rabbi said, come and here. If one says conum be these fruits to me, be they conum to my mouth. He is forbidden to benefit from what is exchanged for them or what grows of their seeds. This implies that he may benefit. From their juice in truth even their juice is forbidden but he the tanner prefers to teach that what is exchanged for them is the same as what grows from their seeds come and hear that I eat not or taste not of them he is permitted to benefit from what is exchanged for them or what grows of their seeds this implies that their juice is forbidden because the first clause does not mention their juice the second clause omits it to come and hear Arjuna said it once happened that in such a case our tarfan forbade us even eggs boiled therewith they replied that is so by only if he vows this meat be forbidden me for if he vows to abstain from something and it is mixed up with another if it the forbidden food is sufficient to impart its taste to the other it is forbidden there is no question about these that is certainly essential the problem is with respect to that I taste not is that essential or not come and hear conum that I taste not fish or fishes he is forbidden to eat them both large and small salted and unsalted raw and cooked yet he may eat hashtarit and brine Rabbah said providing it the brine had already issued from them before the vow Talmud, Mas Netarim Amishnah he who vows abstinence from dates is permitted date honey from winter grapes he is permitted vinegar made from winter grapes Arjuna be but there is said if it bears the name of its origin and he vows to abstain from it he is forbidden to benefit from what comes from it but the sages permit it Gemara but the sages are identical with the first tana they differ in respect of the following which was taught our Simeon B. Eliezer laid down this general rule whatever is eaten itself and what comes from it too is eaten e.g. dates and the honey of dates and he vowed abstinence from the substance itself he is forbidden that which comes from it but if he vows abstinence from what comes from it he is also forbidden the substance
Palestine Arhanim Abigam Eliel said we may import them what is the reason of him who prohibits it or Jeremiah said on account of the clods of earth Mishnah he who vows to abstain from cabbages forbidden asparagus from asparagus he is permitted cabbage from pounded beans he is forbidden my pay our Jose permits it if one vows to abstain from my pay he is forbidden garlic our Jose permits it from garlic he is permitted my pay from lentils lentil cakes are forbidden him our Jose permits them from Lentil cakes lentils are permitted him if one says conum if I taste hita hidden both the flour thereof and the baked bread are forbidden to him if I taste jerry's jerry's and he is forbidden to partake of them whether raw or cooked our Judah said if one declares conum if I taste hita or jerry's he may chew the raw gemara it was taught our Simeon be Gamaliel said if one vows conum if I taste hita we baked we i.e. flour is forbidden him but he may chew it raw conum if I taste hidden he may not chew them raw but if baked they are permitted if I taste hita hidden he may neither eat them baked nor chew them raw if he says conum if I taste jerry's it is forbidden cooked but maybe chew raw conum if I taste jerry's and he is forbidden either to cook them or chew them raw Talmud Moss Nettery may see HAPTERVII Mishnah he who vows to abstain from vegetables is permitted gourds are acable forbids them the sages said to him but when a man says to his agent fetch me vegetables he replies I could obtain only gourds he answered exactly but would he say I could obtain only pulse but that gourds are included in vegetables whilst pulse is definitely not he is also forbidden fresh Egyptian beans but permitted the dry species gamari he who vows to abstain from vegetables etc but he vowed to abstain from vegetables said well this refers to one who vows the vegetables of the poppy forbidden to me but perhaps he meant vegetables which are eaten with food cooked in the pot he said vegetables that are cooked in the pot he forbidden to me wherein do they differ the rabbis maintain whatever an agent must inquire about does not belong to the same species but our akiba maintains whatever the agent needs inquire about is of the same species Abbe said our akiba admits in respect to punishment that he is not flagellated we learned elsewhere if the agent carried out his commission the principal is guilty of a trespass if he did not carry out his Commission he himself is guilty of a trespass with which Tana does disagree. Our said our mission does not agree with our Akiba for we learned thus if he said to him give a guest meat and he gave them liver give them liver and he gave them meat the agent is guilty of a trespass but if disagrees with our Akiba did he not say whatever an agent must inquire about belongs to that species in that case the principal and not the agent should be liable to a trespass dash offering Abe said this. May agree even with our Akiba Talmud, Moss Nettering B does not our Akiba admit that he must consult his principal when this discussion was repeated before Rabbah he remarked Namani has said well which Tana disagrees with our Akiba our Simeon B Gamaliel for it was taught he who vows to abstain from meat is forbidden every kind of meat he is also forbidden the head feet wind pipe liver heart and fowl but he is permitted the flesh of fish and locusts our Simeon B Gamaliel said he who vows to abstain. From meat is forbidden every kind of meat but permitted the head feet wind pipe liver heart and fowl and it is superfluous to mention the flesh of fish and locusts and thus our Simeon B. Gamaliel used to say the entrails are not meat and he who eats them is no man in respect of what is the said to teach that he who eats them as meat is no man in respect of purchase why does the first tana declare fowl forbidden because the agent is wont to inquire about it but the same applies to flesh of fish. In regard to which the agent too if he can obtain no meat consults his master saying if I cannot obtain meat shall I bring fish hence it should be forbidden said obey this refers to one who was bled just before his vow who consequently would not eat fish if so he would not eat fowl either for Samuel said if one is bled and then eats fowl his heart will palpitate like a fowl's and it was taught one must not be bled and eat fish fowl or pickled meat and it was taught if one is bled he must not eat milk cheese eggs cress owl or pickled meat fowl is different because it may be eaten after being thoroughly boiled Abbe also said it refers to one whose eyes ache fish being injurious to the eyes if so he should eat fish for Samuel said none samak I and read nuna fish sama are a healing law name to the eyes that is at the end of the illness Talmud Moss Nederim Amishnah he who vows to abstain from dagon grain is forbidden dry Egyptian beans this is Armeyer's view but the sages say only the five pieces are forbidden him Armeyer said if he vows to abstain from tibua he is forbidden only the five species but one who vows abstinence from dagon is forbidden all yet he is permitted the fruits of the tree and vegetables Gemara shall we say that dagon implies anything that can he eat up to this are Joseph objected and as soon as the commandment came brought the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of corn dagon wine and oil and honey. And of all the increase of the field and the tithe of all things brought they in abundantly, but should you say that Dagon implies everything that can be heaped up what is meant by and as soon as the commandment came brought they brought in abundance, have they answered it is to include the fruits of the tree and vegetables. Our mayor said if one vows to abstain from Tibua, etc. Our Yohan and said all agree that if one vows to abstain from Tibua, the five species only are forbidden to him and was taught. Likewise, and both agree that if one vows abstinence from Tibua, only the five species are forbidden, but that is obvious tonight. Our Tibua implies everything, therefore he teaches that it does not imply everything. Our Joseph objected, and as soon as the commandment came brought they brought in abundance, etc. Rabba answered Tibua is one thing Tibua Sade is another the son of Mar Samuel ordered that thirteen thousand sous worth of Al from Niharpania should be given to Rabba so Rabba. Sent an inquiry to our Joseph what is meant by Al-Altar. Our Joseph replied, It is taught in the Beritha, and all agree that if he vows abstinence from Tibua, the five species only are forbidden him. Said Abbe to him, How compare Tibua implies only the five species, whereas al Alta implies everything. When this was repeated before Rabbi, he observed, I am in no doubt that al Alta means everything. My problem is this what of the rent of houses and the hire of ships shall we say since they depreciate? They are not included in al Alta, or perhaps since the depreciation is imperceptible, they too are termed al Alta. The scholars narrated this to our Joseph since he does not need us. He exclaimed, Why did he send to us? And so our Joseph was annoyed when Rabbi learned this. He went before him on the eve of the day of atonement and found his attendant mixing him a cup of wine. Let me prepare it for him, said he. So he gave it to him, and he mixed the cup of wine on drinking it. He observed, This mixture is like. That of Rabbah the son of our Joseph Behama it is indeed he was his reply he then said to him do not take your seat until you have explained this verse to me this is what is meant by and from the wilderness Matana and from Matana Nahalil and from Nahalil but he replied when one makes himself as the wilderness which is free to all the Torah is presented to him from the field is wider in scope and applies to everything brought in from the field even fruit and vegetables him as a gift. Matana as it is written and from the wilderness Matana and once he has it as a gift God gives it to him as an inheritance Nahalil as it is written and from Matana Nahalil and when God gives it him as an inheritance he ascends to greatness as it is written and from Nahalil Bumath heights but if he exalts himself the Holy One blessed be he cast him down as it is written and from Bumath the valley moreover he is made to sink into the earth as it is written which is pressed down into. The desolate soil, but should he repent, the Holy One blessed be he will raise him again. Talmud, Moss Nettering B, as it is written, every valley shall be exalted. It was taught he who vows to abstain from Dagon is also forbidden. Dry Egyptian beans, yet moist ones are permitted. He is also permitted rice, crisp, groats, and pearl barley. He who vows to abstain from the fruits of that year is forbidden. All the fruit of that year, but is permitted goats, lambs, milk, eggs, and fledglings of that year. But if he vows the growths of this year be forbidden to me, all these are forbidden. He who vows abstinence from the fruits of the earth is forbidden. All the fruits of the earth, yet is permitted mushrooms and truffles. But if he vows that which grows from the earth be forbidden to me, all these are forbidden him. But this contradicts the following for that which does not grow from the earth, one must recite the benediction by whose word all things exist, and it was taught for salt, brine, mushrooms, and Truffles by whose word all things exist is said of a answer they do indeed grow out of the earth but draw their sustenance from the air and not from the earth but he the tana states for that which does not grow out of the earth read for that which does not draw its sustenance from the earth mission
permitted the use of the house Gemara which Tana taught and I put a plague of leprosy in the house of the land of your possession this includes the side chambers in the house this includes the upper story Arhista said it is Armeyer's teaching for if the rabbis why require in the house to include the upper story since they say that an upper story is an integral part of the house Abbe said it may agree even with the rabbis yet a verse is necessary for you might think since it is written in a house of the land of your possession that which is directly attached to the land is called house but the upper story not being attached to the land is not called house with whom does the following dictum of Arhuna Bihai and Ola's name agree as if one says I sell you a house within my house he can offer him an upper story hence it is only because he says I sell you a house within my house but in the case of house without definition he cannot offer him the upper story shall we say it agrees with Armeyer you may even say it agrees with the rabbis by Allah the best of his houses is meant Mishnah one who vows abstinence from a bed is permitted Darjish this is Armeyer's view but the sages say Darjish is included in bed if he vows abstinence from a Darjish he is allowed the use of a bed tomorrow what is Darjish Ullah said a bed reserved for the domestic genius said the rabbis to Ola, but we learned when he sc the high priest was given the mourner's meal all the people sat on the ground whilst he reclined on the Darjish now in normal times he does not sit upon it yet on that day he does rub and demur to this let it be analogous to meat and wine of which at other times he partakes or not as he pleases whereas on that day we give them to him but this is the difficulty for it was taught the Darjish was not lowered but stood up on its legs now if you say that it is a bed of a domestic genius has it not been taught he who lowers his bed lowers not merely his own bed is mourner but all the beds of the house this is no difficulty Talmud, Moss nettering for it may be similar to the trestle reserved for utensils for it was taught if there was a trestle reserved for utensils in the house he need not lower it but if there is a difficulty it is this for it was taught our Simeon B. Gamaliel said as for the Darjish its thongs are untied and it automatically collapses but if the Darjish is the bed of the domestic genius has it then thongs when Rabin came he said I consulted one of the scholars named Artalafa B. Talafa of the West who frequented the leather workers market and he told me what is Darjish a leather bed it has been stated what is a mitta and what a Darjish our Jeremiah said in a mitta bedstead the strap work is drawn on top of Darjish has the strap work inside an objection is raised from when our wooden articles ready to receive uncleanliness a mitta and a cradle from when they are smoothed by being rubbed with fish. Skin now if the mitta has its strap work drawn up on top why must it be smoothed with fish skin but both the mitta and the darjish have their strappings drawn inside a mitta has its straps drawn in and on through slits in the boards those of a darjish go in and on through loops our jacob b said in rabbi's name a mitta whose poles protrude downwards is set up on its side and that is sufficient our jacob b e said in our joshua b levi's name the halachah is as our simeon b gamaliel mission one who vows not to benefit from a town may enter the town to him but may not enter its outskirts but one who vows abstinence from a house is forbidden from the doorstop and within gamara whence do we know that the outskirts of a town are as the town itself or yohanan said because it is written and it came to pass when joshua was in jericho etc now what is meant by in jericho shall we say actually in jericho but is it not written now jericho was straightly shut up because of it Children of Israel hence it must mean in its outskirts then say that it means even in the Tihum but with respect to the Tihum it is written and ye shall measure without the city in the east side two thousand cubits etc but one who vows abstinence from a house is forbidden from the doorstop and within but not from the doorstop and without Armari objected then the priest shall go out of the house I might think that he goes home and then has it probably of the width to these across piece. Was attached the whole forming a frame over which a network curtain was slung shut up therefore it is taught to the door of the house if I had only to go by to the door of the house I might think that he stands under the lintel and closes it therefore it is written then the priest shall go out of the house implying that he must go right out of it how so he must stand at the side of the lintel and close it yet how do we know that if he goes home and has it closed or stands under the lintel? And shuts it that it is validly shut from the verse and shut up the house implying no matter how it be done in the case of the leper's house it is different because it is written out of the house implying that he must go right out of the house Talmud, Mas Nettering Mishnah if a man says Konam be these fruits to me be they Konam from my mouth or be they Konam to my mouth he is forbidden to benefit from what is exchanged for them or what grows from them if he says Konam if I eat or taste of them he is permitted to benefit from what is exchanged for them or what grows of them that is in a thing of which the seed itself perishes but if the seed does not perish even that which grows out of that which first grew from it is forbidden if he says to his wife Konam be the work of your hands to me Konam be they from my mouth or Konam be they to my mouth he is forbidden that which is exchanged for them or grown from them if he said Konam if I eat or taste thereof he is permitted. What is exchanged for them or what is grown from them that is in a thing of which perishes the seed itself but if the seed does perish even that which grows out of that which first grew from it is forbidden if he says to his wife Konam that what you will produce I will not eat thereof until Passover or that what you will produce I will not wear until Passover he may eat or wear after Passover of what she produces before Passover that what you produce until Passover I will not eat or that what you produce until Passover I will not wear he may not eat or wear after Passover what she produces before Passover if he says Konam be any benefit you have from me until Passover if you go to your father's house until the festival if she goes before Passover she may not benefit from him until Passover Talmud, Moss Nettering B if she goes after Passover she is subject to he shall not break his word Konam be any benefit you have from me until the festival if you go to your father's house. Before Passover, if she goes before Passover, she may not benefit from him until the festival, but is permitted to go after Passover. Gemara, if a man says to his wife, Konam, be the work of your hands to me for my mouth or to my mouth, etc. Ishmael of Kfar Yom, others say, Kfar propounded the case of an onion that has been pulled up in the seventh year and planted in the eighth, and its growth exceeds the stock, and this is what he asked. The growth is permitted whilst the stock is forbidden, but since the growth exceeds the stock, the permitted growth comes and annuls what is forbidden, or is it not so? He came before our MI and he could not solve it. He then went before our Isaac the Smith, who solved it from the following dictum of our Hanan of Torah in our Jenna's name. If one plants an onion of Terima and its increase exceeds the stock, it is all permitted, said our Jeremiah, others state our Zerika to him, do you abandon two and follow one now who are the two Ayurabah who said in our Yohanan's name if a young tree already with fruit is grafted on an old one even if it multiplies two hundredfold if the original fruit is forbidden to our Samuel son of our Naman he said in our Jonathan's name if an onion is planted in a vineyard and the vineyard is subsequently removed if the onion is forbidden then he Ishmael again went before our MI who solved it from the following for our Isaac said in our Yohanan's name if a litter of onions was tithed and then planted the whole of it must be retithed this proves that the yield nullifies the stock perhaps however this is different being in the direction of greater stringency but it can be solved from the following for it was taught our Simeon said Talmud, Mas Nederim for everything forbidden which can become permitted e.g. Tibble second tithe Hittish and Hittish the sages declared no limit but for everything which cannot become permitted e.g. Terima the Terima of the tithe Hala and Kilaim of the vineyard the sages Declared a limit said they to him but seventh year produce cannot become permitted yet the sages set no limit to it for we learn seventh year produce of no matter what quality renders its own kind forbidden he replied my ruling too is only in respect of removal but as for eating it renders it forbidden only if sufficient to impart its taste thereto but perhaps this too is different since the nullification is in the direction of greater stringency but solve it from the following we learned. Onions of the sixth year upon which rain fell and which grew in the seventh if the leaves are blackish they are forbidden if greenish they are permitted our hand of the antagonist said if they can be pulled up by their leaves they are forbidden conversely on the termination of the seventh year they are permitted this proves that the increase which is permitted nullifies that which is forbidden but perhaps it refers to crushed onions but it may be solved from the following for it was taught. Talmud, Moss Nettering B. If a workman is engaged in weeding leek plants for a kuti and he may make a light meal of them and must separate the tithes from them as certain Arsimian B. Eliezer said if the laborer is
and is the equivalent of 10 litres at SC. The whole is liable to tithe and is subject to the laws of the sabbatical year. Whilst as for the original litre, the tithe thereof must be separated from elsewhere according to calculation Talmud. Mas netarime, I will tell you the tithe obligation is caused by the storing up of the grain. Rami Biham objected if a man says konum be these fruits to me, be they konum from my mouth or be they konum to my mouth, he is forbidden to benefit from what? Is exchanged for them or what grows from them. If he says konum, if I eat or taste of them, he is permitted to benefit from what is exchanged for them or what grows of them. That is in a thing of which the seed itself perishes. But if the seed does not perish, even that which grows of that which first grew from it is forbidden. Said our Abu are different. Since if he wishes, he can demand absolution from tithes. There are as forbidden things that may become permitted and hence are not nullified by excess. But with terima, likewise, he may if he wishes demand absolution from it, and yet it can be nullified. For we learned if sea of unclean terima falls into less than a hundred of pollen, it must all rot. This implies, but if it falls into a hundred seahs of pollen, it is nullified. I will tell you this refers to terima in the priest's hands in regard to which he can demand no absolution. If so, consider the second clause. If it was undefiled, it should all be sold to it. Priest, but this refers to Terima in the hands of an Israelite who inherited it from his maternal grandfather's a priest, but the second clause teaches it must be sold to a priest save for the value of that Seah, but answer thus as for vows it is well since it is meritorious to seek absolution from them on account of our Nathan's dictum this he who vows is as though he built a high place and he who fulfills it is as though he burned incense thereon, but what merit is there in seeking absolution? From Terima the text above states are Yohanan said if a litter of onions was tithed and then planted the whole of it must be retithed. Now Rabba was sitting and stating this law whereupon our said to him who will obey you and our Yohanan your teacher whither has the permitted portion in them departed, he replied, But did we not learn something similar of his onions of the sixth year upon which rain fell and which grew in the seventh Talmud, Mas Netarim B if the leaves are blackish they are. Forbidden if greenish they are permitted, but even if blackish, why are they forbidden? Let us say whether has the permitted portion in them departed. He replied, Do you think that it refers to the original stock only with respect to the increase? Is it taught they are forbidden? If so, what does our Simeon B. Gamaliel come to teach? For it was taught thereon. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel said that which grew under the obligation of removal is under that obligation that which grew in a state of exemption is. Exempt surely the first Tana 2 says thus the whole mission is stated by our Simeon H. Gamaliel. Yet you learn our Simeon B. Gamaliel's view to be thus only where he took no trouble, but where one takes trouble if the stock is nullified by the excess of the increase. Now where one takes trouble is it nullified by the excess, but what of the case of the litter of tithe itself? Able where he took trouble, yet it is taught whilst as for the original litter of tithe thereof must be separated from. Elsewhere, according to calculation, the tithe is different because Scripture saith, "Thou shalt surely tithe all the increase of thy sowing and people sow what is permitted, but do not sow what is forbidden." The text above states, "Our Hanan of Torah said in our Jannah's name, if one plants an onion of terima and its increase exceeds the stock, it is all permitted." Shall we say that the permitted increase Talmud Mas Netarim nullifies the forbidden stock? But we learned what grows from terima is. Likewise, terima here Hanan refers to the second growth, but we learned this too. The second growth of terima is Holland. He teaches us this. This is so even where the stock does not perish in the earth, but we learned the growth of tebel is permitted in the case where the seed thereof which is tebel perishes in the earth. But if it does not perish, even its second growth is forbidden. He teaches us that the second growth is permitted when it exceeds the original chaptervii. Mishnah if one vows konum if I taste wine today he is forbidden only until it gets dark if he says the Sabbath he is forbidden the whole week and the Sabbath belongs to the past this month he is forbidden the whole of that month but the beginning of the following month belongs to the future this year he is forbidden the whole year whilst the beginning of the following year belongs to the future this September he is forbidden the whole of that September and the following sabbatical year belongs to the past but if he says one day one Sabbath one month one year or one September he is forbidden from day to day if one vows until Passover he is forbidden until it arrives until it be Passover he is forbidden until it goes until being Passover our Meir said he is forbidden until it arrives our Jose said until it goes Gemara konum if I taste wine etc our Jeremiah said at nightfall he must obtain absolution iron a sage what is the reason our Joseph said today is forbidden as a Precautionary measure on account of one day Talmud, Mas Netarim B said Abbe to him if so let one day be forbidden on account of today he replied today may be mistaken for one day but one day cannot be mistaken for today Robin said Mirmar told me thus said your father in our Joseph's name with whom does the statement of our Jeremiah B Abba agree with our Nathan for it was taught our Nathan said whoever vows is as though he built a high place and who fulfills it is as though he burnt incense. Thereon and sabbatical year are forbidden in the middle of the month or year the following new moon or new year's day are permitted Ran Ashri and Tosaf prefer the former interpretation Rashi the latter the Sabbath he is forbidden the whole week and the Sabbath belongs to the past this is obvious I might think that he meant the weekdays of the Sabbath we are therefore taught otherwise this month he is forbidden the whole of that month but the beginning of the following month belongs. To the future, this is obvious. It is necessary only when the following month is defective. I might think that the new moon belongs to the past and is forbidden. It is therefore intimated that people call it new moon this year. He is forbidden the whole year. The scholars propounded what if one vows konum if I taste wine a day is its law is today or one day come and hear a solution from our Mishnah konum if I taste wine today he is forbidden wine only until it gets dark hence a day is as one day. Then consider the second clause if he says one day he is forbidden from day to day hence a day is as today thus nothing can be deduced from this. Our Ashi said come and hear konum if I taste wine this year if the year was intercalated he is forbidden for the year and the extra month how is this meant Talmud? Mas Netarim shall we say literally as taught and why stated hence it must surely mean that he vowed a year this proves that a year is as this year and consequently a day is too. They know in truth it means that he vowed this year yet I might think that the majority of years should be followed which have no intercalated months therefore we are taught otherwise the scholars propounded what if one vows konum if I taste wine a jubilee is the fiftieth year counted as before the fiftieth or as after come and here for a conflict of our Judah and the rabbis has been taught and ye shall hallow the fiftieth year you must count it as the fiftieth year but not as the fiftieth end. As the first year of the following jubilee hence they the sages said the jubilee is not part of the following septenate our Judah maintained the jubilee is counted as part of the septenate said they to our Judah but scripture said six years shalt thou sow thy field whereas here there are only five you replied but on your view surely it is said and it shall bring forth fruit for three years whereas here there are four but it can be referred to other sabbatical years hence mine too must be. Thus explained until Passover he is forbidden etc. Shall we say that our Meir holds that a man does not place himself Talmud, Mas Netarim be in a doubtful position whilst our Jose maintains that he does place himself in a doubtful position but the following contradicts it if a man has two groups of daughters by two wives and he declares I have given one of my elder daughters in betrothal but do not know whether it was the eldest of the senior group or of the junior group or the youngest of the senior group who is older than the eldest of the junior group they are all forbidden except the youngest of the junior group this is our Meir's view our Jose said they are all permitted except the eldest of the senior group said our Hanabi of Dimi and Rav's name the passage must be reversed and it was taught even so this is a general principle that which has a fixed time and one vows until the turn being thereof our Meir said it means until it goes our Jose maintained until it arrives Mishnah if he Vows until the harvest until the vintage or until the olive harvest he is forbidden only until it arrives this is a general rule whatever has a fixed time and one vows until it arrives he is forbidden until it arrives if he declares until it be he is forbidden until it goes but whatever has no fixed time whether one vows until it be or until it arrives he is forbidden only until it arrives if he says until the summer harvest or until the summer harvest shall be he is forbidden until people begin to bring the fix home in baskets until the summer harvest is past it means until
Most of the knives have been folded. The remaining figs are permitted to strangers as far as theft is concerned and are exempt from tithes. Our Tarfan was found by a man eating of the figs when most of the knives had been folded. Whereupon he threw him into a sack and carried him to cast him in the river. Woe to Tarfan! He cried out, Whom this man is about to murder? When the man heard this, he abandoned him and fled. Arabab said, On the authority of Arhan and I be Gamaliel all his lifetime. That pious man grieved over the saying, Woe is me that I made profane use of the crown of the Torah for Rabbi Barhana said in Ar Yohanan's name, Whoever puts the crown of the Torah to profane use is uprooted from the world. This follows a foreshiori of Belshazzar who used the holy vessels which had become profaned as it is written for the robbers shall enter into it and profane a teaching since they had broken and they were profaned yet he was uprooted from the world as it is written in. That night was Belshazzar slain, how much more so he who makes profane use of the crown of the Torah which endureth forever now since Artarfan ate when most of the knives were folded. Why did that man ill-treat him because someone had been stealing his grapes all the year round and when he found Artarfan he thought that it was he if so why was he grieved at revealing his identity because Artarfan being very wealthy should have pacified him with money it was taught that thou mayest love it. Lord thy God and that thou mayest obey his voice and that thou mayest cleave unto him this means that one should not say I will read scripture that I may be called a sage I will study that I may be called rabbi I will study to be an elder and sit in the assembly of elders but learn out of love and honor will come in the end as it is written bind them upon thy fingers write them upon the table of thine heart and it is also said her ways are ways of pleasantness also she is a tree of life too. The men lay hold upon her and happy is everyone that retaineth her. Our Eliezer son of Arzadok said do good deeds for the sake of their maker and speak of them for their own sake make not of them a crown wherewith to magnify thyself nor a spade to dig with and this follows a foreshiori of Belshazzar who merely used the holy vessels which had been profaned was driven from the world how much more so one who makes use of the crown of the Torah Rabbah said a man may reveal his identity where he is. Unknown as it is said but I thy servant fear the Lord from my youth but as for the difficulty of our Tarfan he was very wealthy and should have pacified him with money Rabbah opposed two verses it is written but I thy servant fear the Lord for in my mouth whilst it is also written let another man praise thee and not thine own mouth one refers to a place where he is known the other to where he is unknown Rabbah said a rabbinical scholar may assert I am a rabbinical scholar let my business receive. First attention as it is written and David's sons were priests just as a priest receives his portion first so does the scholar too and whence do we know this of a priest because it is written thou shalt sanctify him therefore for he offered the bread of thy God whereon the school of our Ishmael taught thou shalt sanctify him in all matters pertaining to holiness Talmud, Mos Nettering be to be the first to commence the reading of the law the first to pronounce the blessing and first to receive a good portion Rabbah said a rabbinical scholar may declare I will not pay poll tax for it is written also we certify to you that touching any of the priests or ministers of this house of God it shall not be lawful to impose mine tribute Balo custom or Halak toll upon them whereon Rab Judah said mine dot is the king's portion of the crops Balo is a capitation tax and Halak is our known Rabbah also said a rabbinical scholar may assert I am a servant of fire and will not pay poll. Tax what is the reason because it is only said in order to drive away a lion our ashi owned the forest which he sold to a fire temple said Rabbanah to our ashi but there is the injunction thou shalt not put a tumbling block before the blind he replied most wood is used for ordinary heating mission if he vows until the harvest it means until the people begin reaping the wheat harvest but not the barley harvest it all depends on the place where he vowed if in a hill country the hill country harvest if in the plain the harvest of the plain is meant if he vows until the rains or until the rains shall be it means until the second rainfall descends our Simeon Begamaliel said until the normal time for the first rainfall is reached if he vows until the rain cease it means until the end of Nisan this is our Meir's view our Judah said until Passover is past Gemara it was taught he who vows in Galilee until the fruit harvest and then descends to the valleys of the fruit Harvest has begun in the valley, he is forbidden by his vow until the fruit harvest in Galilee. If he vows until the rains or until the rains shall be, it means until the second rainfall descends. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel said, etc. Our Zara said the dispute is only if he said until the rains, but if he declared until the rain, he certainly meant until the time of the first rain. Talmud, Moss Nedarim, an objection is raised. What is the time of the rainfall? The earliest is on the third of Marswan, the middle, i.e., the second on the seventh, and the last on the twenty third. This is our Mayor's view. Our Judah said the seventh, the seventeenth, and the twenty third. Our Jose said the seventeenth, the twenty third, and the new moon of Kislu. And our Jose used likewise to rule that individuals must not fast for rain until Kislu has commenced. Now we observe thereon as for the first rainfall, it is well they differ in respect of petitioning, the third likewise is in respect of fasting, but as for the second, in respect of what is the controversy, and our Zara answered in respect of one who vows whereon we observe with whom does the following very agree. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel said, If the rain descends for seven days in succession, it is counted as the first and second rainfall. With whom does this agree with our Jose that refers to one who vows until the rain's mission? If he vows conum that I taste not wine for a year, if the year is intercalated, he is forbidden during the year and its extension. If he says until the beginning of Adar, it means until the beginning of the first Adar, until the end of Adar, until the end of the first Adar Gemara. Thus we see that by stating Adar without qualification, the first is meant, shall we say that our mission reflects our Judah's views, for it was taught for the first Adar, one writes the first Adar for the second, simply Adar. This is our Mayor's view, our Judah said for the first Adar, one writes Adar for the second, one writes the second Adar Abbe. Said you may say that it agrees even with our mayor the latter is where he knew that it was a leap year the former i.e. the Mishnah if he did not know Talmud, Mos Nedarim B and it was taught even so if one writes until the new moon of Adar it means until the new moon of the first Adar but if it was a leap year until the new moon of the second Adar now this proves that the first clause does not refer to leap year hence the latter clause means if he knew that it was a leap year the former if he did not know Mishnah our Judah said if one vows conum that I taste no wine until Passover shall be he is forbidden only until the Passover night for he merely meant until the evening of Passover until the hour when men are wont to drink wine if he vows conum that I taste no meat until the fast i.e. the day of atonement shall be he is forbidden only until the eve of the fast for he merely meant until people usually eat meat our Jose his son said if he vows conum if I taste garlic until the Sabbath he is forbidden only until Sabbath i.e. Friday night for he meant until it is customary for people to eat garlic if he says to his neighbor Konam if I benefit from you if you do not come and accept for your sons a core of wheat and two barrels of wine the latter may and all his vow without recourse to a sage by declaring did you vow for any other purpose but to honor me this non-acceptance is my honor likewise if he says to his neighbor Konam if you benefit from me if you do not give my son a core of wheat and two barrels of wine our mayor rules he is forbidden until he gives but the sages maintain he too can annul his vow without a sage by declaring I regard it as though I have received it if he was urging his neighbor to marry his sister's daughter and he exclaimed Konam if she ever benefits from me likewise if he is divorcing his wife and vows Konam if my wife has ever benefit from me they are permitted to benefit from him because he meant only marriage if he was Urging his neighbor to eat in his house, and he replied, Konam, if I enter or the drop of water that I drink, he may enter his house and drink cold water because he only meant eating and drinking in general Talmud. Mos Nedari may see HAPTERIX mission. Our Eliezer said, One may suggest to a man as an opening for absolution the honor of his father and mother, but the sages forbid said Arzadik instead of giving the honor of his father and mother, let us suggest the honor of the Almighty as an opening. If so, there are no vows, but the sages admit to our Eliezer that in a matter concerning himself and his father and mother, their honor is suggested as an opening. Our Eliezer also ruled a new fact may be given as an opening, but the sages forbid it, e.g., if a man said, Konam, that I benefit not from so and so, and he the latter then became a scribe or was about to give his son in marriage, and he declared, Had I known that he would become a scribe or was about to give his son
But said Resh Lakish they had become poor. Our Joshua Bili by said a man who is childless is accounted as dead for it is written give me children or else I am dead and it was taught for our accounted as dead a poor man a leper a blind person and one who is childless a poor man as it is written for all the men are dead which sought thy life a leper as it is written and Aaron looked upon Miriam and behold she was leprous and Aaron said unto Moses let her not he is one dead the blind as it is written he hath set me in dark places as they that be dead of old and he who is childless as it is written give me children or else I am dead Talmud Mos Nedarim it was taught he who is forbidden to benefit from his neighbor can have the vow absolved only in his neighbor's presence whence do we know this Arnaman said because it is written and the Lord said unto Moses in Midian go return into Egypt for all the men are dead which sought thy life he said thus to him in Midian thou didst Thou go and annul thy vow in Midian. How do we know that he vowed in Midian? Because it is written, and Moses was content w -A -O -L, to dwell with the man. Now Allah can only mean an oath as it is written, and hath taken an oath of him, and also against King Nebuchadnezzar he rebelled, who had adjured him by the living God. What was the nature of his rebellion? Zedekiel found Nebuchadnezzar eating a live rabbit. Swear to me, exclaimed he not to reveal this, that it may not leak out. He swore. Subsequently he grieved thereat and had his vow absolved and disclosed it. When Nebuchadnezzar learned that they were deriding him, he had the Sanhedrin and Zedekiel brought before him and said to them, Have you seen what Zedekiel has done? Did he not swear by the name of heaven not to reveal it? They answered him, He was absolved of his oath. Can then one be absolved of an oath? He asked them, Yes, they returned in his presence, or even not in his presence, only in his presence was their reply. How then? Did Yaak said he to them why did you not say this to Zedekiah immediately the elders of the daughter of Zion sit upon the ground and keep silence our Isaac said this teaches that they remove the cushions from under the mission our Meir said some things appear as new facts and yet are not treated as new but the sages do not agree with him e.g. if one says Konam that I do not marry so and so because her father is wicked and he is then told he is dead or he has repented Konam if I enter this house because it contains a wild dog or because it contains a serpent and he is then informed the dog is dead or the serpent has been killed these are as new facts yet actually not treated as new facts but the sages do not agree with him Gamara Konam if I enter this house because it contains a wild dog etc but if it died it really is a new fact said Arhunad it is as though he conditioned his vow by this fact Arhunad and said he was told he has already died or already repented Talmud Moss. Netherim B. Arab objected if one vows Konam that I do not marry that ugly woman whereas she is beautiful, that black skinned woman whereas she is fair, that short woman who in fact is tall, he is permitted to marry her not because she was ugly and became beautiful after the vow black and turned fair short and grew tall but because the vow was made in error. Now as for Arhuna who explained it, it is as though he conditioned his vow by this fact, it is well he the Tana teaches the case of one who makes his vow dependent upon the fact and the case of an erroneous vow, but according to Aryohanan who explained this mission as meaning that he had already died or repented, why teach two instances of erroneous vows? This is a difficulty mission. Our mayor also said an opening for absolution may be given from what is written in the Torah, and we say to him, Had you known that you were violating the injunctions, thou shalt not avenge, thou shalt not bear a grudge against the children of thy People thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, or that thy brother may lie with thee, or that he might become poor, and you would not be able to provide for him. Would you have vowed? Should he reply, Had I known that it is so, I would not have vowed. He is absolved. Gemara Arhuna, son of Arkatna, said to the rabbis, But he can reply, Not all who become poor fall upon me for support, and as for my share of the general obligations, I can provide for him together with everyone else. He replied, I maintain he who falls upon the community does not fall at the beginning into the hands of the charity overseer. Mission a wife's kathuba may be given as an opening for absolution, and thus it once happened that a man vowed not to benefit from his wife and her kitab amounted to 400 denarii. He went before our Akiba who ordered him to pay her the kathuba in full, said he to him, Rabbi, my father left 800 denarii, of which my brother took 400, and I took 400 is. It not enough that she should receive two hundred and I two hundred are Akiba replied even if you sell the hair of your head you must pay her her Ketubah had I known that it is so he answered I would not have vowed thereupon our Akiba permitted her to him Gemara is then movable property under a lien for the Ketubah they said it refers to real estate worth eight hundred denarii but the hair of his head is mentioned which is movable property it means thus even if you must sell the hair of your head for your keep this proves that the debtor's means are not assessed said Arnaman son of our Isaac no Talmud Mos Nedarim it means that the Ketubah deed is not torn up mission of the Sabbaths and festivals are given as an opening the earlier ruling was that for these days the vow is cancelled but for others it is binding until our Akiba came and taught about which is partially annulled is entirely annulled e.g. if one said Konam that I do not benefit from any of you if one was Subsequently permitted to benefit him, they are all permitted. But if he said Konam that I do not benefit from A, B, C, etc., if the first was permitted, all are permitted. But if the last named was permitted, he alone is permitted. But the rest are forbidden. If the middle person was permitted, those mentioned after him are also permitted. But those mentioned before him are forbidden. If one vows Corbin, be what I benefit from this man. Corbin, be what I benefit from that man. An opening for absolution is needed for each one individually. If one vows Konam, if I taste wine because it is injurious to the stomach, whereupon he was told, but well matured wine is beneficial to the stomach. He is absolved in respect of well matured wine, and not only in respect of well matured wine, but of all wine. Konam, if I taste onions because they are injurious to the heart, then he was told, but the wild onion is good for the heart. He is permitted to partake of wild onions, and not only of wild onions. But of all onions, such a case happened before our mayor, and he gave absolution in respect of all onions. Gemara, if the last named was permitted, he alone is permitted, but the rest are forbidden. Which Tanner ruled thus. Rabbi said, It is our Simeon who maintained, unless he declared, I swear to each one separately, Konam, if I taste wine, etc., but let it follow from the fact that it is not injurious. Our Abba said, It means moreover, it is beneficial, Konam, if I taste onions, etc., but let it follow from the fact that they are not injurious, said our Abba, it means moreover, they are beneficial. Mission of man's own honor and the honor of his children may be given as an opening. Thus we say to him, Had you known that tomorrow it will be said of you that it is his regular habit to divorce his wife and of your daughters, they will say they are the daughters of a divorced woman. What fault did he find in this woman to divorce her? If he replies, Had I known that it is so, I would not have vowed he is absolved if one vows Konam if I marry that ugly woman whereas she is beautiful that black-skinned woman whereas she is fair that short woman who in fact is tall he is permitted to marry her not because she was ugly and became beautiful or black and turned fair short and grew tall but because the vow was made in error and thus it happened with one who vowed not to benefit from his sister's daughter and she was taken into our Ishmael's house and made beautiful my son exclaimed our Ishmael to him did you vow not to benefit from this one no he replied whereupon our Ishmael permitted her to him in that hour our Ishmael wept and said the daughters of Israel are beautiful but poverty disfigures them and when our Ishmael died the daughters of Israel raised a lament saying ye daughters of Israel weep for our Ishmael and thus it is said to of Saul ye daughters of Israel weep over Saul Gemara's story is quoted contradicting the ruling the text is defective and was thus taught our Ishmael said even if she was ugly and became beautiful black and turned fair or short and grew tall and thus it happened with one who cowed not to benefit from his sister's daughter she was taken into our Ishmael's house and made beautiful etc. Talmud, Mos Nedarim B.A. Tana taught she had a false tooth and our Ishmael made her a gold tooth at his own cost when our Ishmael died a professional mourner commenced the funeral eulogy thus ye daughters of Israel weep over our Ishmael who clothed you etc. A man once said to his wife, Konam that you benefit not from me until you make our Judah and our Simeon taste of your cooking our Judah tasted thereof observing it is but logical if in order to make peace between husband and wife the Torah commanded let my name written to sanctity be dissolved in the utters that curse though tis but doubtful how much more so I our Simeon did not taste thereof exclaiming let all the wid
Lawsuit, so she went and broke them on his head, said lie to her, What is the meaning of this that thou hast done? She replied, Thus my husband did order me, thou hast performed thy husband's will. He rejoined, May the Almighty bring forth from thee two sons like Baba Bibuta C H A P T E R X mission in the case of a betrothed maiden, her father and her betrothed husband and all her vows Talmud. Mas Netarim, if her father annulled her vow, but not the husband, or if the husband annulled it, but not the father, it is not annulled, and it goes without saying if one of them confirmed it tomorrow, but that is the same as the first clause, her father and husband annulled her vows. I might think that either her father or her husband is meant, therefore we are taught otherwise, and it goes without saying if one of them confirmed it, then why teach it if we say that annulment by one without the other is invalid? What need is there to state if one of them confirmed it, it is necessary in the case where one of them annulled it and the other confirmed it and then the latter sought absolution of his confirmation I might think that which he confirmed he has surely overthrown therefore we are taught that they must both annul simultaneously in the case of a betrothed maiden her father and her husband and all her vows whence do we know this rabbi said the and if she be to an husband when she vowed then he shall make her vow of no effect hence it follows that a betrothed maiden her father and her husband and all her vows but perhaps this verse refers to Anisua in respect to Anisua there is a different verse and if she vowed in her husband's house etc but perhaps both refer to Anisua and should you object what need of two verses relating to Anisua it is to teach that a husband cannot annul premarriage vows Talmud Mas be but does that not follow in any case alternatively I might say to be implies condition but perhaps the father himself can annul if so, what is the need of and bind himself by bond being in the father's house if her father disallow not any of her vows shall stand because her father disallowed her if the father can annul them alone even when there is an arus surely he can do so when there is no arus but perhaps the father needs the arus but the arus can annul alone and should you reply if so why does scripture mention the father it is to shoot that if he confirmed the confirmation is valid if so why write and if she vowed in her husband's house since it follows a she if the arus can annul alone even where there is a father is it necessary to state it when she is no longer under her father's control but perhaps and if she vowed in her husband's house teaches that he cannot annul premarriage vows from that fact itself it is proved that an arus can annul premarriage vows surely that is only because of his partnership with the father Talmud Mas Netarim of the school of Ishmael taught. These are the statutes which the Lord commanded Moses between a man and his wife, between the father and his daughter, being yet in her youth in her father's house. This teaches that in the case of a betrothed maiden, both her father and her husband annul her vows. Now, according to the Tana of the school of Ishmael, what is the purpose of and if she be to an husband, he utilizes it for Rabbah's other dictum. Now, how does Rabbah utilize the verse? It is by the Tana of the school of Ishmael. It is necessary to teach that the husband can annul vows which concern himself and his wife. The scholars propounded, does the husband cut the vow or weaken it? How does this problem arise? E.g., if she, the betrothed maiden, vowed not to eat the size of two olives of anything, and the Arus heard of it and annulled the vow, and she ate them. Now, if we say that he cuts the vow, apart, she is flagellated, but if he weakens it, it is merely forbidden. What is the law come and here? When was it said that if it Husband died, his authority passes over to the father in the case where the husband did not hear the vow before he died or heard and annulled it or heard it and was silent and died on the same day. This is what we learned if the husband died, his authority passes over to the father Talmud, Mas Netarim B. But if he heard and confirmed it or heard it and was silent and died on the following day, he the father cannot annul it if the father heard and annulled it and died before the husband managed to hear of it. This is what we learned if the father died, his authority does not pass over to the husband if the husband heard and annulled it and died before the father managed to hear of it. In this case, we learned if the husband died, his authority passes over to the father if the husband heard and annulled it and the father died before he managed to hear of it. The husband cannot annul it because the husband can annul only in partnership Talmud, Mas Netarim if the father heard and annulled. It and the husband died before he managed to hear of it. The father can again annul the husband's portion. Our Nathan said that is the view of Beth Shammai, but Beth Hillel maintained he cannot annul it a second time. This proves that according to Beth Shammai, he cuts it apart. Whilst in the view of Beth Hillel, he weakens it. This proves it. Rabbah propounded can absolution be sought from confirmation or not? Should you say no absolution can be sought from confirmation? Is there absolution from annulment or not? Come and hear for our Yohanan said one can seek absolution from confirmation but not from annulment. Rabbah propounded what if he said it is confirmed to thee? It is confirmed to thee and then sought absolution of his first confirmation. Come and hear for Rabbah said if he obtained absolution from the first, the second becomes binding upon him. Rabbah propounded what if he declares it be confirmed unto thee and annulled unto thee, but the confirmation be not valid unless the annulment had. Operated Talmud, Mas Netarim become and here a solution from the controversy of Armeir and our Jose for we learned if one declares this animal be a substitute for a burnt offering a substitute for a peace offering it is a substitute for a burnt offering only this is Armeir's view but our Jose ruled if that was his original intention since it is impossible to pronounce both designations simultaneously his declarations are valid now even Armeir asserted that the second statement is disregarded only because he did not say let the first not be valid unless the second take effect but here that he declared but the confirmation be not valid unless the annulment has operated even Armeir admits that the annulment is valid Rabbah propounded what if he declares it be confirmed unto the end and to the simultaneously come and here for Rabbah said whatever is not valid consecutively is not valid even simultaneously Rabbah propounded what if he declares it be confirmed to thee today do we rule it is as though he had said to her but it be annulled unto thee tomorrow by implication or perhaps he in fact did not declare thus Talmud, Mas Netarim and now if you say he did not in fact declare thus what if he declares it be confirmed unto thee tomorrow do we rule he is unable to annul it for tomorrow since by implication he confirmed it for today or perhaps since he did not state it be confirmed unto thee today by declaring it be annulled unto thee tomorrow. He really meant from today now should you say that even so since he implicitly confirmed it today it is as though enforced tomorrow too what if he declares it be confirmed unto thee for an hour do we say it is as though he declared it be annulled unto thee thereafter or perhaps he in fact did not say thus to her should you rule he did not in fact declare thus what if he did explicitly annul it do we say since he confirmed it he confirmed it for good or perhaps as he is empowered to. Confirm and annul it the whole day if he says it be annulled unto the after an hour his statement is efficacious come and here if a woman vows behold I will be a Nazi right and her husband on hearing it exclaimed and he cannot subsequently annul it but why so let us say that his exclamation and I refer to himself only is that he would be a Nazi right but as for her vow behold I will be a Nazi right he confirmed it but for one hour whilst thereafter if he wishes to annul it why cannot he do so surely it is because having confirmed it he confirmed it for good no he the ten of that mission holds that every and I is as though one declares it be permanently confirmed unto the mission if the father dies his authority does not pass over to the husband but if the husband dies his authority passes over to the father in this respect the father's power is greater than the husband's but in another the husband's power is greater than that of the father for the husband can annul. Her vows as Bogareth, but the father cannot annul her vows as Bogareth tomorrow. What is the reason? Because the writ saith in her youth, she is in her father's house. If the husband dies, his authority passes over to her father. Whence do we know the said rabble? Because it is written, and if she be at all to an husband, and her vows be upon her Talmud, Mas Netarim be hence the vows made by her previously to her second betrothal are assimilated to those made previously to her first betrothal. Just as those made before the first betrothal, the father can annul alone, so also those made before the second betrothal, the father can annul alone. But perhaps this is only in the case of vows which were unknown to the Arus, but those which were known to the Arus, the father is not able to annul as to vows unknown to the Arus. These follow from in her youth, she is in her father's house. In this respect, the father's power is greater than the husband's, etc. How is this meant? Shall we say that he? Betrothed her whilst NAR and then she became a Bogareth, but consider her father's death frees her from her father's authority and the Bogareth stage frees her from her father's authority. Then just as at death his authority does not pass over
It is written, and if she be at all to an husband, and her vows are upon her, this implies the vows that were already upon her, but perhaps that is only where the SC her vows were not known to her first arus, but those which were known to her first arus, the last arus cannot annul upon her is a superfluous word. It was taught in accordance with Samuel, a betrothed maiden, her father and her husband annul her vows. How so if her father heard and disallowed her, and the husband died before he managed to? Here and she became betrothed again on the same day, even a hundred times her father and her last husband can annul her vows if her husband heard and disallowed her, and before the father heard it, the husband died, the father must again annul the husband's portion. Our Nathan said that is the view of Beth Shammai, but Beth Hillel maintained he cannot re or undo the different Talmud. Moss Netarim be Beth Shammai maintained that even in respect to vows known to the arus is the husband's. Authority passes over to the father also he the husband cuts the vow apart whilst Beth Hillel maintained her father and second husband together must annul her vow and the husband does not cut it apart the scholars propounded his divorce as silence or as confirmation what is the practical difference e.g. if she vowed her husband heard it divorced and remarried her on the same day now if you say it is as silence he can now disallow her but should you rule that it is as confirmation he cannot. Talmud, Moss Netarim come and hear when was it said that if the husband dies his authority passes over to the father if the husband did not hear the vow or heard and annulled it or heard it was silent and died on the same day now should you say that divorce is as silence let him attend also teach or heard it and divorced her since it is not taught as it follows that divorce is as confirmation and consider the second clause but if he heard and confirmed it or heard it was silent. And died on the following day he the father cannot annul it but if you maintain that divorce who is as confirmation let him also state or if he heard it and divorced her but since this is omitted it proves that divorce is tantamount to silence hence no deductions can be made from this if the first clause is exact the second clause is stated in that form on account of the first if the second is exact the first is so taught on account of the second come and here if she vowed as an arusa was divorced on that day and betrothed again on the same day even a hundred times her father and her last husband can annul her vows this proves that divorce is the equivalent of silence for if it is as confirmation can the second arus annul vows which the first arus confirmed no this refers to a case where the first arus did not hear thereof if so what particularly state on the same day the same holds good even after a hundred days this refers to a case where the arus did not hear thereof but her father did so that he can annul only on the same day but not afterwards come and hear if she vowed on one day and he divorced her on the same day and took her back on the same day he cannot annul it this proves that divorce is as confirmation I will tell you this refers to Anisua and the reason that he cannot annul is because a husband cannot annul pre-marriage vows Talmud, Mas Netarim be Mishnah it is the practice of scholars before the daughter of one of them departs from him for Nisuin to declare to her all the vows which thou didst vow in my house are annulled likewise the husband before she enters into his control for Nisuin would say to her all vows which thou didst vow before thou enters into my control are annulled because once she enters into his control he cannot annul them Gemara Rami Biham a propounded can a husband annul a vow without hearing it is and her husband heard it expressly stated or not said Rabba come and hear it is the practice of Scholars before the daughter of one of them departs from him to declare to her all the vows which thou didst vow in my house are annulled but he did not hear them only when he hears them does he annul them if so why make a declaration before he hears he the tana informs us this that it is the practice of scholars to go over such matters come and hear from the second clause likewise the husband before she enters into his control would say to her etc here too it means that he said what I hear them come and hear if one says to his wife all vows which thou mayest vow until I return from such and such a place are confirmed his statement is valueless if he said behold they are annulled our lies are ruled they are annulled but he has not heard them here too it means that he said what I hear them why then stated now let him disallow her when he hears it he fears I may then be busily occupied come and hear if one says to a guardian annul all the vows which my wife may make. Between now and my return from such and such a place and he does so I might think that they are void therefore scripture teaches her husband may establish it or her husband may make it void this is the view of our Josiah said our Jonathan to him but we find in the whole Torah that a man's agent is as himself now even our Josiah ruled thus only because it is a scriptural decree her husband may establish it or her husband may make it void but both agree that a man's agent is as himself but he did. Husband did not hear the vows Talmud, Mas Netarim here too it means that he said when I hear of it annul it but when he hears it let him annul it himself he fears I may then be busily occupied Rami Biham a propounded can a deaf man disallow the vows of his wife now should you rule that a husband can annul without hearing that is because he is capable of hearing but a deaf man who is incapable of hearing falls within our Zeristic that which is eligible for mixing the lack of. Mixing does not hinder its validity whilst that which is not eligible for mixing the lack of mixing hinders its validity or perhaps and her husband heard it is not indispensable said Rabbi come and here and her husband heard this excludes the wife of a deaf man this proves it the scholars propounded can a husband disallow the vows of his two wives simultaneously is the word her particularly stated or not said Rabbi to come and here two suspected wives are not made to drink simultaneously. Because each is emboldened by her companion Arjuna said it is not forbidden on that score but because it is written and he shall make her drink implying her alone Talmud, Mas Netarim Bimisha in the case of a Bogareth who tarried twelve months and a widow who tarried thirty days are Eliezer said since her betrothed husband is responsible for her maintenance he may annul her vows but the sages say the husband cannot annul until she enters into his control Gemara Rabbi said Arlizer. And the early mission taught the same thing for we learned a virgin is given 12 months to provide for herself when the 12 months expire she must be supported by him i.e. her arus and may eat terima but the yabam does not authorize her to eat terima if she spent 6 months in the lifetime of her husband the arus and 6 months in that of the yabam or even the whole period less one day in the lifetime of her husband or the whole period less one day in that of the yabam she may not eat. Terima this is the early mission but a subsequent Beth Din rules no woman can partake of terima until she enters the said Abbe to him perhaps it is not so the early mission informs us in respect of her eating terima which is forbidden merely by rabbinical enactment but as for vows which are biblically binding I may say that it is not so and you know our Eliezer's view only in respect to vows for the reason which our Fineha said in Rabba's name is every woman who vows vows. Conditionally upon her husband's assent, but as for Terima, it may well be that though forbidden only by rabbinical precept, she may not eat thereof. Talmud, Mas Netarim, a Mishnah, if a woman waits for a Yabam, whether for one or for two, our Eliza ruled he the Yabam can annul her vows. Our Joshua said only if she waits for one, but not for two, our Akiva said neither for one nor for two, our Eliza argued if a man can annul the vows of a woman whom he acquired himself, how much the more can he? And all those of a woman given to him by God said our Akiva to him, it is not so if you speak of a woman whom he acquires himself, that is because others have no rights in her, will you say the same of a woman granted to him by God in whom others too have rights? Our Joshua said to him, Akiva, your words apply to two Yabamim, but what will you answer if there is only one Yabam? You replied, the Yabamah is not as completely united to the Yabam as an Uruza is to her betrothed husband Kamara, it is well. According to our Akiva for he maintains that the bond wherewith she is bound to the Yabam involves no legal consequences also according to our Joshua who maintains that the tie is a real one but what is our Eliza's reason even if the tie is a real one selection is not retrospective our MI answered the circumstances are e.g. that he the Yabam made a betrothal declaration our Eliza ruling with Beth Shammai that a declaration completely acquires but our Joshua says thus that applies only to one Yabam but not to two Yabam for can there be such a case that though when his brother comes he can prohibit her to him by cohabitation or divorce and yet he the first can and whilst our Akiva maintains that the bond carries with it no legal consequences now according to our Eliezer who maintained that in the opinion of Beth Shammai a declaration is binding only in that it renders her co-wife ineligible what can be said the reference here is to one who had come before court and been ordered to Support her and the law is in accordance with the dictum of our Phineas in Rabba's name every woman who vows vows conditionally upon her husband's assent Talmud,
Case of a woman whom he acquires himself that is because just as he has no portion in her before marriage so have others no portion in her will you say the same of a woman gifted to him by God in whom just as he has a portion so have others to a portion in her thereupon our Joshua said to him Akiba your words apply to Tuyabamim what will you answer in respect of one Yabam you replied have we then drawn a distinction in other respects between one Yabam and Tuyabamim whether he makes her a declaration or not and just as it is in reference to other matters so it is in reference to vows thus did Ben Aze lament woe to thee Ben Aze that thou didst not study under our Akiba how Talmud Mas Nederima does this bury the support RMI because it states whether he made her a declaration or not alternately it follows from the first clause which states then when she does come under his authority she is surely completely his but if he did not betroth her how is she completely his Hence it follows that he had made a declaration to her what is meant by and just as it is in reference to other matters so it is in reference to vows said Rabbah it means this do you not admit that one is not stoned for violating her as in the case of a betrothed maiden or as she said the Mishnah 2 supports this interpretation the Yabamah is not as completely united to her betrothed husband as an Aruza to her betrothed husband Mishnah if a man says to his wife all vows which you may vow from now until I return from such and such a place are confirmed the statement is valueless if he said behold they are annulled our Eliza rules they are annulled the sages maintained they are not annulled said our Eliza if he can annul vows which have already had the force of prohibition surely he can annul those which have not had the force of prohibition they said to him behold it is said her husband may establish it and her husband may annul it that which has entered the category of Confirmation has entered the category of annulment, but that which has not entered the category of confirmation has not entered the category of annulment. Gemara, the scholars propounded in our Eliezer's view, do they take effect and then become annulled, or do they take no effect at all? What is the practical difference? Talmud, Mas Nederim, Beg. If another man makes a vow dependent on this, now if you say that the wife's vows take effect, the dependence is a real one. But if you say that they take no effect, there is no substantial idea in it. What is the law? Come and here, said our Eliezer, if he can annul vows which have already had the force of a prohibition, surely he can annul vows which have not had the force of prohibition. This proves that they take no effect at all. No, is it then stated which do not have the force, etc. Which have not had the force of prohibition is taught, meaning which have not yet had the force of prohibition. Come and here, our Eliezer said to them, if we're a man. Cannot annul his own vows once he has vowed, he can nevertheless annul his own vows before making them. Then, where he can annul his wife's vows after she vowed, how much the more should he be able to annul them before she vows? Now, surely this means that his wife's vows are like his, just as his vows take no effect at all, so his wife's vows too would take no effect at all. No, each is governed by its own laws. Come and hear the answer, Arlizer, if Amiqui, though it raises the unclean front there. Uncleanness cannot nevertheless save the clean from becoming unclean, then a man who cannot raise the unclean from their uncleanness, how much the more can he not save the clean from becoming unclean? This proves that they take no effect at all. Talmud, Mas Nederima, then consider the second clause that the rabbi said to Arlizer, if an unclean utensil is immersed in order to purify it, shall a clean utensil be immersed so that on subsequently becoming defiled it shall simultaneously become. Clean this proves that they do take effect. I will tell you the rabbis were not clear as to our Eliezer's standpoint. Hence they said thus to him, What is your opinion? If you maintain that they the vows take effect but are annulled, you are refuted by the analogy of a utensil. Whilst if you do not hold that they take effect, the meekway is your refutation. Come and hear our Eliezer said to them, If defiled seeds are rendered clean by being sown in the soil, how much more so if already sown and rooted? In the soil, this proves that they do not take effect at all. Now do not the rabbis admit the validity of such an admage's conclusion. Surely it was taught I might think that a man can sell his daughter when NAR, but you can argue a minority if she who was already sold goes free. Is it not logical that if not sold yet she cannot be sold now? Talmud, Mas Nedarim, BS elsewhere, they do draw an admage's conclusion, but here it is different because scripture writes her husband may confirm it. And her husband may annul it, teaching that which has entered the category of confirmation has entered the category of annulment, but that which has not entered the category of confirmation has not entered the category of annulment. Mission of the period allowed for the annulment of vows is the whole day. This may result in greater stringency or greater leniency. Thus, if she vowed on the night of the Sabbath, he can annul on the night of the Sabbath, and on the Sabbath day until nightfall. If she vowed just before nightfall, he can annul only until nightfall. For if night fell and he had not annulled it, he can no longer annul it. Gemara, it was taught the period allowed for the annulment of vows is the whole day. Our Jose, son of Arjuna, and our Eliezer, son of our Simeon, maintained twenty-four hours. What is the reason of the first ten scripture set? But if her husband disallowed her on the day that he heard it, and what is the reason of the rabbis because it is written? But if her husband Altogether holds his peace at her from day to day, but on the view of the first ten, surely it is written from day to day that is necessary for were only on the day that he heard it written. I would say only by day, but not by night. Therefore, it is written from day to day. Now, according to him who cites from day to day, is it not written on the day that he heard it that is necessary for were only from day to day written? I would think that he can annul her vows from e.g. the first day of one week to the first day of the following. Therefore, it is written on the day that he heard it. Our Simon because he said in the name of our Joshua, Belie by the Halachah is not in accordance with that pair. Levi wished to give a practical decision in accordance with these ten. Aim, whereupon Rab said to him, Thus said, My dear relative, the Halachah is not in accordance with that pair. Hi, Rab used to shoot arrows and at the same time examine the person desirous of absolution. Rabbi Bar would repeatedly. Sit down and stand up, Talmud. Mas Nederima, we learned elsewhere, vows may be annulled on the Sabbath, and absolution from vows may be sought where it is necessary for the Sabbath. The scholars propounded may vows be annulled on the Sabbath only if it is needed for the Sabbath, or perhaps even if it is unnecessary. Come and hear for our Zudi of the school of our poppy learned vows may be annulled on the Sabbath only if necessary for the Sabbath, said Arashi, but we did not learn thus if she vowed just before nightfall, he can annul only until nightfall, but if you rule that he can annul only when it is necessary for the Sabbath, but not otherwise, why say until nightfall he cannot annul even by day since it is unnecessary for the Sabbath? It is a controversy of Tanaim. The period allowed for the annulment of vows is the whole day. Our Jose, son of Arjuna, and our Eliezer, son of our Simeon, maintain 24 hours now on the view that they can be annulled only the whole of that day, but not. Thereafter it follows that he can annul them even if unnecessary for the Sabbath but on the view that he has 24 hours he can annul only if it is necessary for the Sabbath but not otherwise and absolution from vows may be sought where it is necessary for the Sabbath the scholars propounded is that only if one had no time to seek absolution before the Sabbath or perhaps even if he had time come and here for the rabbis gave a hearing to the son of our Zitra son of our Zeira to grant him absolution even for vows for which there was time before the Sabbath now our Joseph thought to rule that absolution may be granted on the Sabbath only by a single ordained scholar but not by three laymen because it would look like a lawsuit said Abbe to him since we hold that those who grant it may stand be relatives and absolve even at night it does not look like a lawsuit our Abba said in the name of our who not in the name of Rab the Halachat is that vows may be annulled on it. Sabbath, but this is explicitly taught in our Mishnah. If she vowed on the night of the Sabbath, etc. But say thus the Halachah is that absolution may be sought at night. Our Abba said to Arhuna, Did Rab really say thus? Said he, he was silent. Do you say he was silent, or he was drinking? Asked here, I gave Abba said Rab gave a hearing to Rab to grant him absolution. Talmud, Mas Nederim, be in a chamber of the college whilst standing alone. And at night, Rab said in our name, the Halachah is that absolution from vows may be granted standing alone. And at night on the Sabbath by relatives, and even if there was time before the Sabbath to seek absolution standing. But it was taught our Gamaliel descended from the ash, wrapped himself in his robe, sat down and absolved him. Our Gamaliel held that the Rabbi must give an opening for regret, so that the vow may be revoked. Abinishio, this requires deep thought. Therefore he sat down. But in our Naman's opinion, no opening for regret
hath commanded this teaches only a sage may absolve but a husband cannot absolve for I might think if a sage who cannot annul can absolve surely a husband who may annul can also absolve therefore it is stated Talmud, Mas Nederim but this is the thing implying only a sage can absolve but a husband cannot absolve another very the taught this is the thing teaches only a husband may annul but a sage cannot annul for I might think if a husband who cannot absolve can annul surely a sage who May absolve can also annul therefore it is stated this is the thing implying a husband can annul but a sage cannot annul further it is here stated this is the thing whilst elsewhere in connection with sacrifices slaughtered without the temple court it is also written this is the thing which the Lord hath commanded just as in the latter case Aaron his sons and all Israel are included in the law so does the chapter on vows relate to Aaron his sons and all Israel and just as here the heads of the tribes are particularly addressed so there too the references to the heads of the tribes in respect of what law is this deduced in the chapter of vows said are Ahabi Jacob to teach that three laymen are qualified to grant absolution but is not the heads of the tribes stated are his daughters state are Yohan and answered that intimates that a single ordained scholar can absolve for what purpose are the heads of the tribes related to sacrifices slaughtered without our She's hate said to teach that the law of revocation applies to Hittish, but according to Beth Shammai who maintained that Hittish cannot be revoked for what purpose are the heads of the tribes related to sacrifices slaughtered without Beth Shammai do not admit the validity of this Hizurish one now for what purpose is this is the thing written in the chapter on vows to teach that only a sage may absolve but a husband cannot absolve and that only a husband can annul but a sage cannot annul. Why is this is the thing related to sacrifices slaughtered without to teach that one incurs guilt only for slaughtering without the prescribed place but not for wringing a bird's neck outside then on the view of Beth Shammai once do we know that three women are valid they deduce it from the teaching reported by R.C.B. Nathan for it is written and Moses declared unto the children of Israel the set feast of the Lord whereon it was taught our Jose the Galilean said the festivals were Stated but not the Sabbath of the creation with them. Ben Isa said the festivals were stated but not the chapter on vows with them. Now this Beritha was unintelligible to R.C.B. Nathan so he went to Nehardia before Arshis hate not finding him there he followed him to Mahus and said to him the festivals were stated but not the Sabbath of the creation with them but the Sabbath is written together with them. Furthermore the festivals were stated but not the chapter on vows with them but that is written alongside thereof said he to him it means this Talmud, Mos Nederim be only the festivals of the Lord need sanctification by Beth Din but not the Sabbath of the creation. Further the festivals of the Lord require an ordained scholar but absolution of vows requires no ordained scholar for even a Beth Din of Laman may grant it but in the chapter on vows the heads of the tribes is stated are his to other state are Yohanan said that refers to a single ordained scholar Arhanan said he who Keep silence when his wife vows in order to provoke her can and even after ten days Rob objected when was it said that if the husband dies his authority is transferred to the father if the husband did not hear the vow or heard it and was silent or heard and annulled it and died on the same day but if he heard and confirmed it or heard it was silent and died on the following day he the father cannot annul now surely it means that he kept his silence in order to vex her no it means that he was silent in order to confirm it if so it is tantamount to or if he heard and confirmed it but it means that he kept silent without specifying his intentions are his to objected confirmation is more stringent than annulment and annulment is more stringent than confirmation thus confirmation is more stringent Talmud, Mos Nederimus in silence confirms but does not annul and if he confirms in his heart he has confirmed it whereas if he annuls in his heart it is not annulled. Moreover, if he confirmed, he cannot annul, and if he annulled, he cannot confirm. Now, this teaches that silence confirms. Surely, it means silence in order to provoke. No, it means that he was silent in order to confirm. If so, it is identical with if he confirms in his heart, but it means that he was silent with no specified intention. Now, we have seen that confirmation is more stringent than annulment. Where do we find that annulment is more stringent than confirmation? Said Aryohan, and one may seek absolution from confirmation, but not from annulment. Arkahana objected, but if her husband altogether hold his peace at her from day to day, scripture refers to silence in order to vex. You say in order to vex. Perhaps this is not so. The reference being to silence with intention to confirm. Now, when it is said because he held his peace at her, scripture already refers to silence in order to confirm. Hence, to what can I apply the phrase? But if the husband altogether hold his peace at her, to silence in. Order to vex that is indeed a refutation, but let one verse be applied to silence in order to confirm and the other to silence without specified intentions. Additional verses are written. Rob objected if she vowed just before nightfall, he can annul only until nightfall, for if nightfall and he had not annulled it, he can no longer do so. But why let it at least be counted as though he were silent in order to provoke her? This is a refutation. Rashi objected if the husband declares, I know that there were vows, but did not know that they could be annulled. He may annul them now. I knew that they could be annulled, but did not know that this is a vow. Our mayor ruled he cannot annul now, whilst the sages maintain he can annul. But why not? According to our mayor, let it at least be as though he were silent in order to provoke. This is a refutation. Chapterx. I mission now. These are the vows which he can annul. Vows which involve self denial. E.g. If I bathe or if I do not bathe, if I adorn. Myself or if I do not adorn myself Talmud, Mas Nederim B.R. Jose said these are not vows of self-denial but the following are vows of self-denial is if she says Konam be the produce of the whole world to me he can annul Konam be the produce of this country to me he can bring her that of a different country Konam be the fruits of this shopkeeper to me he cannot annul but if he can obtain his sustenance only from him he can annul this is our Jose's opinion Gemara he can annul only vows of self-denial but not if they involve no self-denial but it was taught between a man and his wife between the father and his daughter this teaches that a husband can annul vows which affect the relationship between himself and his wife I will tell you he can annul both but vows of self-denial he can permanently annul but if they involve no self-denial annulment is valid only so long as she is under him but if he divorces her the vow becomes effective this refers however to matters affecting their mutual relationship but involving no self-denial but if they involve self-denial the vow does not become effective now do vows involving no self-denial become effective if he divorces her but we learned our Yohan and Binary said he must annul it lest he divorce her and she thereby be forbidden to him this proves that if he divorces her after first having annulled the vow the annulment remains valid I will tell you in both cases the annulment stands but vows of self-denial he can annul in respect of both himself and strangers whereas if they involve no self-denial he can annul in respect of himself only not of others and it is thus meant these are the vows which he can annul in respect of both himself and others his vows that involve self-denial if I bathe what does this mean shall we say that she declared Conan be the fruit of the world to me if I bathe then why annul it let her not bathe and so the fruit of the world will not be prohibited to her moreover could our Jose maintain in this case that these are not vows of self-denial perhaps she bathes and the fruit of the world become forbidden to her Talmud, Mas Nederim again if she said Konam be the pleasure of bathing to me forever if I bathe once and the reason he can annul is because what can she do if she bathes once the pleasure of subsequent bathing is forbidden her if not she becomes repulsive whilst our Jose maintains that she need not bathe her repulsiveness being of no concern to us but if so it should be taught us our Jose said this condition involves no self-denial hence she must have vowed Konam be the pleasure of bathing to me forever if I bathe today our Jose maintaining that the disfigurement of one day's neglect of bathing is not disfigurement Talmud, Mas Nederim be you have explained if I bathe how is if I do not bathe meant shall we say that she vowed the pleasure of bathing be forbidden me forever if I do not bathe today why does she need an omen let her bathe said Rab Judah. It means that she said the pleasure of bathing be forbidden me forever if I do not bathe in the water of steeping then by analogy if I do not adorn myself means if I do not adorn myself with naphtha but that renders her filthy said Rab Judah she vowed the pleasure of bathing be forbidden me forever if I bathe today and I swear not to bathe today the pleasure of adornment be forbidden me forever if I adorn myself today and I swear not to adorn myself today Rabbana said to Arashi if so the Mishnah should state these are the vows and oaths he replied learn these are the vows and oaths
precedence over that of strangers but if the choice lies between the lives of strangers and their own laundering the lives of the strangers take precedence over their own laundering our Jose ruled their laundering takes precedence over the lives of strangers now if to refrain merely from washing one's garment is a hardship in our Jose's view Talmud, Mas Netarim how much more so with respect to the body I will tell you in our Jose's opinion laundering is indeed of greater importance than bathing. For Samuel said scabs of the head caused by not washing lead to blindness scabs arising through the wearing of unclean garments cause madness scabs due to neglect of the body cause boils and ulcers they sent word from their SC Palestine be on guard against scabs take good care to study in company and be heedful not to neglect the children of the poor for from them Torah goeth forth as it is written the water shall flow out of his buckets meet Elia meaning from the Dalim poor. Amongst them goeth forth Torah and why is it not usual for scholars to give birth to sons who are scholars said our Joseph that it might not be maintained the Torah is their legacy our Shisha the son of Aridi said that they should not be arrogant towards the community Marzitra said because they act high handedly against the community our Ashi said because they call people asses Rabbana said because they do not first utter a blessing over the Torah for Rab Judah said in Rab's name what is meant by who is a wise man that he may understand this for what is the land destroyed etc. Now this question was put to the sages prophets and ministering angels but they could not answer it until the Almighty himself did so as it is written and the Lord said because they have forsaken my law which I set before them and have not obeyed my voice neither walk therein but is not have not obeyed my voice identical with neither walk therein Rab Judah said in Rab's name it means that they did not First recite a benediction over the Torah ISIB Judah did not come for three days to the college of Arhose Wardimus the son of Arhose met him and asked why have you sir not been for these last three days at my father's school he replied seeing that I do not know your father's grounds for his rulings why should I attend please repeat sir what he told you he urged perhaps I may know the reason said he as to what was taught Arhose said their laundering takes precedence over the lives of Strangers, whence do we know a verse to support the seti? Because it is written, and the suburbs of them shall be for their cattle and for their goods and for all their beasts. Hey, Yatham, now what is meant by Hey, shall we say beasts, but beasts are included in cattle. But if Hey, means literally their lives, is it not obvious? Hence, it must surely refer to laundering, since neglect of one's clothes causes the pains of scabs. Or Joe said, These are not vows of self denial. The scholars propounded in the view of our Jose can he the husband and all them as matters affecting their mutual relationship come and hear our Jose said, These are not vows of self denial, implying, however, that they are matters affecting their mutual relationship. No, perhaps he argues to them on their view, thus, in my opinion, they are not even matters affecting their mutual relationship. But you who maintain that they are vows of self denial should at least concede to me that these are not vows of self. Denial what is our decision on the matter Adabi Ahaba said he can annul them Arhuna said he cannot annul Talmud, Mas Netarim be because no fox dies in the earth of its own lair it was taught in accordance with our Adabi Ahaba vows involving self-denial he the husband can annul in respect of both himself and herself and in respect to herself and strangers but if they involve no self-denial he can annul in respect of himself and herself but not in respect to herself and strangers e.g. if she vows conum be fruit unto me he can annul conum that I prepare not for my father for your brother for your father for my brother or that I place no straw before your cattle or water before your herds he cannot annul conum that I may not paint or rouge or cohabit he can annul as a matter affecting their mutual relationship that I do not make your bed or prepare you drink or wash your hands or feet he need not annul Argamaliel said he must annul them as it is written he shall not break his Word alternatively he shall not break his word teaches that a sage cannot absolve himself from his own vows now whom do we know to regard a vow that I paint not nor rouge as matters affecting their mutual relationship and not of self denial our Jose yet it is stated that he can annul them as matters affecting their mutual relationship the master said or cohabit he can annul as a matter affecting their mutual relationship how so if she vows the pleasure of cohabitation with me be forbidden to you why annul it seeing that she is bound to afford it to him but it means that she vowed the pleasure of cohabitation with you be forbidden me and it accords with our Kahanist dictum if she vows the pleasure of cohabitation with me be forbidden to you she is compelled to grant it but if she vows the pleasure of cohabitation with you be forbidden to me he must annul it because no person may be fed with what is forbidden to him who is the author of what was taught things that are in themselves permissible and yet are treated by others as forbidden you may not treat them as permitted in order to nullify them who is the author Argamaliel for it was taught Argamaliel said he must annul them as it is written he shall not break his word alternatively he shall not break his word teaches that a sage cannot absolve himself from his own vows Rabbah asked Arnaman in the rabbi's view is about to refrain from cohabitation a vow of self-denial or a matter affecting their mutual relationship he replied we have learned this if she vows may I be removed from all Jews Talmud Mas Netarim he must annul his own part and she shall minister to him whilst remaining removed from all Jews but if you say that this is a vow of self-denial why does she remain forbidden to all Jews this proves that it is only a matter affecting their mutual relationship no this is asked according to the rabbis whereas may I be removed from the Jews is the teaching of our Jose only for Arhuna said this entire chapter states the ruling of Arhuse whence is this deduced since the Mishnah teaches Arhuse said these are not vows of self-denial why state again he can annul this is Arhuse's opinion it therefore follows that from this onward the author is Arhuse Samuel said on Levi's authority all vows the husband can annul to his wife except my benefit be forbidden to so and so which he cannot annul but he can annul the vow the benefit of so and so be forbidden to me we learn Konam be the fruit of this country to me he can bring her that of a different country said Arjoseph it means that she vowed Konam be the fruit of this country to me which you may bring come and your Konam be the fruit of this shopkeeper to me he cannot annul here too it means that she said which you may bring but does it not state but if he can obtain sustenance only from this shopkeeper he can annul now if you maintain that she vowed which you may bring why can he annul it? And since the second clause must mean even those not brought by the husband, the first clause too must refer to even what she herself brings. But in the first clause, he cannot annul over vow forbade even what she herself brings. Talmud, Mas Netarim B. And our Mishnah states our Jose's view for Arhuna said this entire chapter states the ruling of our Jose and what is meant by he cannot annul on the score of self denial, but he can annul it as a vow affecting their mutual relationship. Rab. Judah said in Rab's name if she vows to abstain from two loaves, abstention from one of which is self denial, but not from the other, since he the husband can annul in respect of that which causes self denial, he can also annul in respect of the other. R.C. said in Aryohanan's name he can annul only in respect of that which causes self denial, but not in respect of the other. Others say R.C. asked Aryohanan what if she vows to abstain from two loaves, abstention from one of which is self. Denial but not from the other he answered he can annul in respect of that which causes self-denial but not in respect of the other he objected if a woman made a vow of a Nazi right and drank wine or defiled herself through the dead Talmud, Mas Netarim she received forty lashes if her husband disallowed her and she did not know that he disallowed her and she drank wine and defiled herself through the dead she does not receive forty lashes but if you maintain he can annul only in respect of that which causes self-denial but not in respect of that which does not perhaps he annulled her vow only in respect of wine since abstention therefrom is a deprivation but not of the kernels or husks of grapes abstention from which is no deprivation hence let her receive forty R. Joseph replied there is no state of semi Nezareth said Abbe to him does that imply that there is a sacrifice for semi Nezareth but said Abbe there is no semi Nezareth nor is there a sacrifice for semi Nezareth an objection is raised if a woman made a vow of Nezareth set aside an animal and then her husband disallowed her she must bring the sin offering of a bird but not burnt offering of a bird but if you say a sacrifice is not incurred for half the period of Nezareth why must she bring the sin offering of a bird what then a sacrifice is incurred for half the period of Nezareth then she should bring three animals visit sin offering a burnt offering and a peace offering but after all no sacrifice is incurred for half Nezareth whilst as for the sin offering of a bird which she must bring that is because such is due even in case
Included in mankind in the sense of her vow, then consider the second clause, and she can benefit from the gleanings forgotten sheep's NPEO, but she may not eat of her husband's, which proves that he is included in mankind. Senula, after all, the husband is not included, and the Mishnah teaches us, moreover, he cannot annul because she can benefit from the gleanings forgotten sheep's NPEO. Rabbi said, in truth, the husband is included in mankind, and the second clause states a reason thus. Why cannot he annul because she can benefit from the gleanings forgotten sheep's NPEO? Rabbi said, in truth, the husband is not included in mankind, and the Mishnah teaches us, if she was divorced, she can benefit from the gleanings forgotten sheep's NPEO. Talmud, Mas Nedarim, Rabbi objected before Arnaman, now is the husband not included in the term mankind, but we learned if she vows, may I be removed from all Jews, he must annul his own portion therein, and she shall minister unto him. Whilst remaining removed from all Jews, but if you say that the husband is not included in mankind, it is a vow of self denial which he should permanently annul. Here it is different because it is obvious that she forbids to herself primarily what is normally permitted. She can benefit from the gleanings forgotten sheep's and PEO. Now the poor tithe is not included, but it was taught in the Beritha, and she can benefit from the poor tithe, said our Joseph. That is no difficulty. One teaching agrees with our Eliezer, the other with the rabbis, for we learned our Eliezer said one need not designate the poor tithe of Dime Talmud, Mas Nedarim B. Whilst the sages say he must designate it, but need not separate it. Now surely he who maintains that the doubt renders it evil also holds that he the owner possesses the goodwill thereof, and that being so he may not benefit her, whilst he who maintains that no designation is necessary is of the view that the doubt does not render it evil and Wherever the doubt does not render it evil, he the owner enjoys no goodwill therein, and therefore she may benefit therefrom. Said Abbe to him, No, all agree that the doubt renders it evil, but our Eliezer and the rabbis differ in this. Our Eliezer maintains that the Amhirez are not suspected of withholding the poor tithe, since should he renounce the title to his property and thus become a poor man, he may take the tithe himself, hence he suffers no loss, but the rabbis hold that no one will renounce ownership of his property, for he fears that another may acquire it, therefore they are suspected. Rabbi said here the mission refers to the poor tithe distributed in the owner's house in connection wherewith giving is mentioned, viz, and thou shalt give it unto the Levite, the stranger, etc. Therefore one who vows not to benefit from mankind may not benefit therefrom, whilst there in the buried the reference is to the poor tithe distributed in the threshing floor, since it is written. Thereof and thou shalt leave it at thy gates one may benefit therefrom Konam be the benefit priests and levites have from me they can seize etc. Thus we see that good will benefit has no monetary value then consider the last clause but if he vows Konam be the benefit these priests and levites have from me others take the dues but not these thus proving that good will benefit has monetary value said our Hashai there is no difficulty the one clause accords with Rabbi the other with our Jose son of our Judah for it was taught if one steals his neighbor's table and consumes it he must pay him the value of the table that is Rabbi's ruling our Jose son of our Judah said he must pay him only for the value of its hull and now presumably they differ in this Talmud Mas Nedarim Rabbi holds that good will benefit has money value whilst our Jose son of our Judah holds that good will benefit has no money value no all agree that good will benefit has no monetary value but here they disagree over Unseparated priestly dues, but since goodwill benefit has no monetary value, what does it matter whether they have been separated or not? But this is Rabbi's reason. The Rabbi's penal is the thief that he may not steal. Whereas our Jose son of our Judah maintains that the Rabbi's penal is the owner that he should not delay with his steal. Rabbi said Teramah is different. This being the reason that they can take it against his will. For Teramah is fit only for priests, and since he came and forbade it to them, he rendered it just like dust. Mishnah, if she vows Konam that I do not offer my father, your father, my brother, or your brother, the husband cannot annul it. That I do not offer you, he need not annul our Akiba. Said he must annul it lest she exceed her obligations. Our Yohanan Binuri said he must annul it lest he divorce her and she thereby be forbidden to him. Gemara Samuel said the Halachah is as our Yohanan Binuri. Shall we say that in Samuel's opinion a man can consecrate that which is? Non existent, but the following contradicts it. If a man consecrates his wife's handiwork, which she will produce Talmud, Mas Nedarim B, she may work and provide for herself, and as for the surplus, our rules that it is Hippish, our Yohanan the sandal maker ruled that it is Hullin, whereon Samuel said the Halachah is as our Yohanan the sandal maker, thus proving that a man cannot consecrate the non existent, and should you reply that he ruled that the Halachah is as our Yohanan Binuri only in respect of the excess, then he should have said the Halachah is as our Yohanan Binuri in respect of the excess, or the Halachah is as the first tana, or the Halachah is not as our Akiba, but said our Joseph Konamoth are different, since a man can interdict his neighbor's fruit to himself, he can prohibit to himself the non existent, said Abbe to him, it is proper that one may prohibit his neighbor's fruit to himself, since he can forbid his own fruit to his neighbor, but shall he forbid the non existent to his? Neighbor seeing that he cannot interdict his neighbor's fruit to his neighbor but said Arhuna the son of our Joshua it means that she vowed my hands be consecrated in respect of what they may produce the vow is valid even after divorce because her hands are already in existence but if she vowed thus would they be consecrated and forbidden surely her hands are pledged to her husband she vowed when he divorces me but now at least she is not divorced how then do you know that such a declaration is valid Talmud, Mas Nedarim said Arle what if a man declares to his neighbor let this field which I am selling you be consecrated when I buy it back from you is it not consecrated our Jeremiah demurred to this how compare in the case of let this field which I sell you etc it is now in his possession but is it in a woman's power to consecrate the work of her hands this is rather to be compared only to a man who says to his neighbor let this field which I have sold to you be consecrated when I repurchase it from you. Is it consecrated? Our Papa demurred to this. How compare in the case of purchase? The matter is definitely closed, but as for a woman, is the matter definitely closed? This can only be compared to a man who declares to his neighbor, Let this field which I have mortgaged to you be consecrated when I redeem it from you. Is it not consecrated? Our Shisha, the son of our Edi, demurred to this. How compare as for the field it is in his power to redeem it, but does it lie with a woman to be divorced? This is rather to be compared to one who says to his neighbor, Let this field which I have mortgaged to you for ten years be consecrated on its redemption. Is it not consecrated? Our Ashi demurred to this. How compare there is a definite term for redemption has then a woman a definite term when she can encompass her divorce Talmud, Mas Nedarim B, but said our Ashi Konamoth are different since they have the force of intrinsic sanctity and it is in accordance. With Rabbi's dictum for Rabbi said Hippish the prohibition of leaven and manumission of a slave release from the burden of mortgage if so why state lest he divorce her learn moreover lest he divorce her mission if his wife vowed and he thought that his daughter had vowed or if his daughter vowed and he thought that his wife had vowed if she took the vow of a Nazi right and he thought that she had vowed to offer a sacrifice or if she vowed to offer a sacrifice and he thought that she vowed a Nazi right vow if she vowed to abstain from fix and he thought that she vowed from grapes or if she vowed to abstain from grapes and he thought that she vowed from fix he must annul the vow again Gemara shall we say that if her husband disallowed her is precisely meant Talmud Mas Nedarim but what of the rents for the dead concerning which for is written then David took hold on his clothes and rent them for Saul and for Jonathan his son yet it was taught if he was informed that his father had died and he rent his garments and then it was discovered that it was his son he has fulfilled the duty of renting I will tell you there is no difficulty the one teaching refers to an unspecified action the other to a specified one and it was taught likewise if he was informed that his father had died and he rent his garments and then it was discovered to be his son he did not fulfill the duty of renting if he was told that a relation of his had died and thinking that it was his father he rent his garments and then it was discovered to be his son he fulfilled the duty of renting our ashi said the one means that he realized his error within the period of an utterance the other that he realized it after the period of an utterance thus your ruling that his duty of renting is fulfilled holds good when it is discovered to be his son within the period of an utterance whilst your ruling that his obligation remains unful
or her husband may annul it Yifrin just as Yechamenu implies momentum part of it so Yifrin means part thereof and our Ishmael is it then written he shall annul part thereof and our Akiba annulment is assimilated to confirmation just as confirmation denotes a part thereof so annulment too denotes a part thereof our high B Abba said in our Yohanan's name these are the views of our Ishmael and our Akiba but the sages maintain confirmation is assimilated to annulment just as in the case of annulment that which he annulled is void so also in respect to confirmation that which he confirmed is confirmed if she vows conum if I taste fix and if I taste grapes etc Rabba said our mission agrees with our Simeon who ruled he must say I swear to each one separately mission if the husband declares I know that there were vows but did not know that they could be annulled he may annul them now but if he says I know that one can annul but did not know that this was a vow our mayor ruled he cannot annul it whilst the sages maintain he can annul tomorrow but the following contradicts this or if he smote him with any stone wherewith a man may die seeing him not then the congregation shall restore him to the city of his refuge this excludes a blind man that is our Judah's view our mayor said it is to include a blind person Talmud Mas Nedarim Rabba answered in each case the ruling follows from the context our Judah reasons concerning a murderer it is written as when a man goeth into a wood with his neighbor etc implying whoever can go into a wood and a blind person too can enter a wood now should you say that seeing him not teaches the inclusion of the blind that could be deduced from a wood hence seeing him not must exclude the blind but our mayor maintains it is written whoso killeth his neighbor without knowing which implies whoever that can know whereas a blind person cannot know now should you say that seeing him not excludes the blind that would follow from without knowing consequently seeing him not must teach the inclusion of the blind mission if a man is under a vow that his son-in-law shall not benefit from him and he desires to give money to his daughter he must say to her this money is given to you as a gift providing that your husband has no rights therein for only that is yours which you may put to your personal use Gamara Rab said we learned this only if he says to her which you may put to your personal use but if he says do what you Please the husband acquires it Samuel said even if he declares do what you please the husband has no rights therein our Zerah to this Talmud, Mas Nedarim be with whom does this ruling of Rab agree with our Meir who said the hand of a woman is as the hand of her husband but the following contradicts it how is a partnership formed in respect of an alleyway one of the residents places there a barrel of wine and declares this belongs to all the residents of the alleyway and he transfers ownership to them through his Hebrew slave male or female his adult son or daughter or his wife but if you say her husband acquires it the Arab has not left the husband's possession Rabba replied although our Meir said the hand of a woman is as the hand of her husband he agrees in respect to partnership that since his object is to transfer it to others she can acquire it from her husband Rabba objected before Arashi the following can acquire it on their behalf his adult son or daughter his Hebrew slave male or female but the following cannot acquire it on their behalf his son or daughter if minors his Canaanite slave male or female and his wife but said Arashi the Mishnah holds good only when she possesses a court in that alleyway so that since she can acquire part ownership in the Arab for herself she can also acquire it on behalf of others Mishnah but every vow of a widow and of her that is divorced shall stand against her house so if she declared behold I will be a Nazi right after 30 days even if she married within the 30 days he cannot annul it Talmud, Mas Nedarim if she vows while under her husband's authority he can disallow her house so if she declared behold I will be a Nazi right after 30 days and her husband annulled it even though she was widowed or divorced within the 30 days it is annulled if she vowed on one day and he divorced her on the same day and took her back on the same day he cannot annul it this is the general rule once. She has gone forth as her own mistress even for a single hour he cannot annul Gemara it was taught if a widow or a divorced woman declares behold I will be a Nazi right when I marry and she marries our Ishmael said he the husband can annul our Akiva rule he cannot annul and the mnemonic is yellowly if a married woman declares behold I will be a Nazi right when I am divorced and she is divorced our Ishmael rule he cannot annul our Akiva said he can annul our Ishmael argued behold it is said but every vow of a widow and of her that is divorced shall stand against her implying that the incidence of the vow must be in the period of widowhood or divorce but our Akiva maintains it is written with whatever she hath bound her soul implying that the binding of the vow must be created in the period of widowhood or divorce our Hista said our mission agrees with our Akiva Abbe said it may agree even with our Ishmael in the mission she made herself dependent upon the time factor the period may end without her being divorced or the period may end without her being married but in the very that she made the vow dependent upon marriage this is the general rule taught with respect to a betrothed maiden is to extend the law to where the father accompanied the betrothed husband's messengers or the father's messengers accompanied the betrothed husband's messengers that in the case of a betrothed maiden her vows are annulled by her father and husband this is the general rule taught in the chapter now. These are the vows is meant to extend the law to where the father delivered her to her betrothed husband's messengers or where the father's agents delivered her to the messengers of the betrothed husband and it teaches that the husband cannot annul vows made by her previously mission there are nine maidens whose vows stand I a bogareth who vowed and is an orphan to a maiden who vowed and then became a bogareth and is an orphan Talmud, Mas Nedarim B3 and A.R. who is not yet a Bogareth and is an orphan for a Bogareth who vowed and whose father died via Nara who vowed and is now a Bogareth and whose father died six Nara who is not yet a Bogareth and whose father died seven a maiden whose father died and after her father died she became a Bogareth eight a Bogareth whose father is alive nine a maiden turned Bogareth whose father is alive our Judah said also one who married his daughter whilst a minor and she was widowed or divorced and returned to him her father and is still Nara Gamara Rab Judah said in Rab's name these are the words of our Judah but the sages say the vows of three maidens stand I a Bogareth two an orphan and three an orphan during her father's lifetime mission if she vows Konam that I benefit not from my father or your father if I prepare out for you or Konam that I benefit not from you if I prepare out for my father or your father he can Gamara it was taught if she vows Konam that I benefit not from my father or your father if I prepare offer you or Nathan said he cannot annul the sages maintain he can annul may I be removed from Jews if I minister to you or Nathan said he cannot annul the sages rule he can annul a man once vowed not to benefit from the world if he should marry before having studied Halisha he ran with ladder and court yet did not succeed in his studies thereupon Araha son of Arhuna came and led him into error and caused him to marry Talmud, Mas Nedarime. Then dogged him with clay and brought him before Arhista said Rabbah who is so wise as to do such a thing if not Araha son of Arhuna who is indeed a great man for he maintains just as the rabbis and our Nathan disagree in reference to annulment so also with respect to absolution but our poppy said the disagreement is only in respect to annulment our Nathan holding that the husband cannot annul unless the vow has already become operative for it is written then the moon shall be confounded whilst it Rabbis maintain the husband can annul even before the vow takes effect as it is written he make void the intentions of the crafty but as for absolution all agree that a sage cannot permit anything until the vow is operated for it is written he shall not break his word shall we say that the following supports him if he vows conum that I benefit not from so and so and from anyone from whom I may obtain absolution for him he must obtain absolution in respect of the first and then obtain absolution in respect of the second but if you say absolution may be granted even before the vow takes effect surely he can be absolved in whatever order he pleases and who knows whether this one is first and that the other is the second shall we say that this supports him if he vows conum that I benefit not from so and so and behold I will be a Nazi right if I be absolved therefrom he must be absolved of his vow and then of his Nazi rightship but if you say absolution may be granted before the Thou takes effect if he wishes let him first be absolved of his vow and if he wishes let him first be absolved of being a Nazi right disagrees with our Nathan Rabbin said Mirmar told me thus did your father say in our poppy's name the controversy is only in reference to annulment but in respect to absolution all agree that he the sage may grant it even before the vow is operated because it is written he shall not break his word Talmud, Mas Nedarim be intimating that no act had yet taken place an objection is raised if he vows conum that I benefit not from so and so and from anyone from whom I obtain absolution for him
Said yet Arshis admits that if she was widowed she may not eat is his reason not but that she should not cast a stigma upon her children but if she was widowed or divorced and she ceases to eat of Karama it will be said it is only now that she was seduced our Papa said Rabbah tested us if the wife of a priest was forcibly ravished does she receive her kefubah or not since forcible seduction in respect to a priest is as voluntary infidelity in respect to an Israelite she does not receive her kefubah or perhaps she can plead I personally am fit Talmud, Mas Nederim it is only the man whose field has been ruined and we answered him it is taught in our Mishnah she who declares I am defiled to you receives her kefubah now to whom does this refer shall we say to the wife of an Israelite if of her own free will does she receive her kefubah whilst if by force is she forbidden to her husband hence it must refer to the wife of a priest now if of her own free will does she receive a kefubah is she of less account than the wife of an Israelite who sinned voluntarily hence it must surely mean by force and it is stated that she receives her kefubah the scholars propounded what if she declares to her husband you have divorced me or Hamnon has said come and here she who declares I am defiled to you now even according to the later Mishnah which teaches that she is not believed it is only there that she may lie in the knowledge that her husband does not know but with respect to you have divorced me of the truth of which he must know she is believed for there is a presumption that no woman is brazen in the presence of her husband said Robert to him on the contrary even according to the first mission that she is believed it is only there because she would not expose herself to shame but here it may happen that she is stronger in character than her husband and so indeed be brazen our measure she objected heaven is between me and you as ruled by the Early mission refutes Rabbah's view for here it involves no shame for her yet it is stated that she is believed Rabbah holds that there since she cannot avoid declaring whether the omission is forceful or not were it not as she said she would not make the charge but let heaven is between us as ruled by the later mission refute our Hamnon's view for here she knows that her husband knows yet it is taught that she is not believed our Hamnon maintains that here too she would argue to herself granted that he knows that cohabitation has taken place does he know whether the omission is forceful therefore she may be lying a certain woman was accustomed to rise in the morning and wash her husband's hands whenever intimacy had taken place one day she brought him water to wash but exclaimed he nothing has taken place today if so she rejoined it must have been one of the Gentile Talmud, Mos Nederim be perfume sellers who were here today if not you perhaps it was one of them said Arnaman she had conceived a passion for another and her declaration has no substance a certain woman shewed displeasure with her husband said he to her why this change now she replied you have never caused me so much pain through intimacy as today but there has been none today he exclaimed if so she returned it must have been the gentile nap the sellers who were here today if not you perhaps it was one of them said Arnaman disregard her she had conceived a passion for another a certain man was closeted in a house with a married woman hearing the master her husband entering the adulterer broke through a hedge and fled said Robert the wife is permitted had he committed wrong he would have hidden himself in the house a certain adulterer visited a woman her husband came whereupon the lover went and placed himself behind a curtain before the door now some cress was lying there and a snake came and ate thereof the master her husband was about to eat of the cress unknown to his wife do not eat it, warn the lover, because a snake has tasted it, said Robert. The wife is permitted, had he committed wrong, he would have been pleased that he should eat thereof and die, as it is written, for they have committed adultery, and blood is in their hands. Surely that is obvious, I might think that he had committed wrong, and as for his warning, that is because he prefers the husband not to die, so that his wife may be to him as stolen waters are sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. Therefore he teaches otherwise. 